Chapter 37, Dangerous Forest. Lumion paused for a moment and then said, So the body, mind, and spirit will approach the bestower because the power of the gift carries a corresponding brand? He made this inference from the beyonder characteristics left behind by the oldest one and the previous owners. Although the bestowment was pure strength and didn't contain any characteristics, it was also likely to have been tainted with all the previous owner's quirks. The lady held the tarot cards and nodded in agreement. Your logical ability is impressive. You should thank Aurora for giving you enough basic education. Lumion muttered inwardly, No need for your reminder. The lady continued, Even if the bestower doesn't wish to affect the bestowed, it's difficult to prevent the other party from approaching them physically, mentally, and spiritually. This is because, if the power bestowed doesn't contain the bestower's will, it will be challenging for the bestowed to control it, and it will quickly dissipate. Therefore, the blessings of the orthodox gods in this aspect are basically temporary and limited to a certain extent. And the evil gods don't care what happens to the bestowed? Lumion nodded thoughtfully and asked curiously. Beyonders, what I mean is, can people with beyonder characteristics still accept gifts? Will the two conflict and cause them to lose control? The lady smiled and shook her head. There may be some conflict, but not much. Think about it. The power of the gift will transform your body to match that of the bestower, but your body has already adapted to your beyonder characteristics, so there will be a conflict until you find a new balance. However, this conflict won't affect your mind or spirit, so you won't lose control unless you're on the brink of collapse. The only problem is that you might have to get used to seeing a third eye or a fourth hand growing on your body. Of course, the prerequisite is that the power bestowed on you will last for a long time. The corresponding level has to be very high as well, otherwise the little changes in your body can be ignored. Lumion acknowledged the information in a terse manner. What if the gift is from the same or a neighboring pathway, he asked. The lady nodded. It won't cause any conflict. She then chuckled. But that doesn't mean there won't be physical changes. What does this mean? Lumion was confused and was about to ask for clarification when the lady interrupted him with a chuckle. I thought you'd be more interested in the time loop after learning about circle inhabitants. It's surprising that you're paying attention to this knowledge that may not be useful to you in the future. That's not like you. Lumion revealed a self-deprecating smile. I wanted to ask if you could help us break the time loop, he said. But then I remembered what you said before. You claimed that the price for resolving the corresponding problem would be the complete destruction of Koryu. Everyone would die. If I wanted to achieve a better outcome, I could only rely on myself. I didn't understand it at the time, but now I can guess the reason. If you want to break the cycle and you're not a circle inhabitant, the only way is to destroy everything? The lady nodded in agreement. That's correct. Lumion was confused and asked, Then why didn't you make it clear before? It's not like it's something that would lead to destruction. Or was this lady used to speaking in a half-concealed manner? The lady immediately laughed. Would you have believed me if I had told you that the whole village was caught up in a time loop? Lumion thought about it for a moment and replied, Probably not. It was difficult to believe such an absurd story without experiencing it firsthand. The lady smiled and said, That's why I didn't make it clear. I didn't want to spend a lot of time explaining it to you. Lumion fell silent for a moment before seizing the opportunity to ask, Do you know what the key is to breaking this cycle? In what direction should I focus my efforts? The lady shook her head. Divination on certain matters is very dangerous here. Huh? Lumion was confused. The woman could only add, If I knew the key, I would tell you, the lady said. The sooner I solve this, the sooner I can end this journey, she sighed. When can I have a work-free vacation? Work? Lumion couldn't obtain any inspiration from the mysterious lady, so he probed. If the Padre isn't killed, will time stop repeating itself? No, the lady replied accurately. There are many trigger points in the loop, including time reaching the twelfth night. You can figure out the rest yourself. Twelfth night. There's still quite a bit of time to investigate. Lumion thought for a moment and said, because I triggered the specialness of my body, I can maintain my memories and beyond her characteristics every time I loop, right? Seeing the lady nod, he further asked, 
So as long as I'm alive and continue to investigate, I'll be able to find the key to end everything sooner or later. This was an application of the exhaustive method that Aurore had mentioned. In theory, that's right. The woman's emotive eyes, which puzzled Lumion couldn't put his finger on, surfaced again. But you should have realized that only Cordu and the surrounding area are in a time loop. Time is passing normally in the outside world, and the date is completely different from Cordu's. The three investigators will send telegrams to describe their situation and the village, and the officials will sense the abnormality here once they mention the date. Even if the investigators fail to send a telegram before the cycle restarts, or they don't mention the date as time passes, the officials will discover the problem. What do you think they will do to resolve the time loop in Cordu? Lumian fell silent for a moment before replying. They'll destroy it directly, just like your alternative choice. The lady nodded with mixed emotions. That can effectively prevent the abnormality from spreading and affecting others, she said. If you have the chance to go to the Sonya Sea in the future, you can ask about Bansi Harbor. It was destroyed by the Church of Storms due to some kind of corruption. No one escaped. Lumian felt a renewed determination to find the key point of the loop on his own. He mocked himself, saying, Looks like I don't have much time left. He knew he only had three or four more cycles, and he couldn't have it looped to the twelfth night every time. The lady stood up and calmly said, At least you still have a chance. Some people don't even have that. After leaving Old Tavern, Lumian stood on the road and looked at the few pedestrians and houses around him. Everything in Cordu Village seemed normal on the surface. The villagers had the same emotions as people everywhere. Joy and anger, desire and longing. However, beneath the peaceful and noisy facade, this village hid an unimaginable horror. Everyone here had fallen into a loop and lived the same few days over and over again. Aside from a few people like Padre Guilhum Bennett, Shepherd Pierre Barry, Pons Bennett, and Ava Lazier, Lumian was temporarily unable to determine who was innocent. He wasn't even 100% sure that Raymond Gregg, who was usually rather dim and unscheming, was fine. The Padre's superpower may have influenced the lad's strange behavior at the end of Lent, instead of them having issues beforehand. For a moment, Lumian felt that Cordu was like a primitive forest rife with unseen dangers. He couldn't tell who was the prey and who was the hunter. Caution and patience were most important to survive in such an environment. Ability, courage, wisdom, and experience had to take a backseat. This was somewhat similar to his vagrant days, yet clearly different. As these thoughts surfaced, he felt the hunter potions showing signs of digestion. This is the first step of the acting method? That's pretty fast. I thought it would take a month or two to start. He became excited at the possibility of digesting the hunter potion. Can I digest the hunter potion in one or two cycles? With the help of Dream Ruins hunting, he might quickly become a sequence 8 provoker and increase his chances of solving the time loop problem. Lumian pondered as he walked forward. Soon he arrived at the village square. His current plan was to chat with the Padre to test him for abnormalities and obtain any clues. As he looked around, he saw a figure walking towards the cathedral. The figure was wearing a dark brown long coat with a hood, a rope tied around his waist, and a pair of brand new soft leather shoes. It was Shepherd Pierre Barry. It's him. Lumin quickly approached Pierre and deliberately asked, Pierre, why are you back? Pierre's black curly hair was greasy, and he hadn't shaved for a long time. He happily replied, Isn't Lent almost here? I haven't celebrated it in years. I can't miss it this year, no matter what. His blue eyes were filled with a gentle smile, and he seemed completely different from the shepherd who had traumatized Lumion before. Uh, the answer will be somewhat different from the previous cycle in a different place with a different questioner. Although the essence doesn't change, certain words will be different. Lumion listened carefully and looked at Pierre's new shoes before asking, Did you make it rich? Not really. I can only say that my current boss is not too shabby. He gave me quite a bit of things. Drinks are on me tonight. Pierre's joy was evident. All right. Lumion agreed and pointed at the cathedral. Are you going to pray? Pierre sighed and said, Yes, it's been too long since I prayed to God in a cathedral. Although the sentence didn't seem significant, the more Lumion listened, the more he sensed that something was off. 
Shepherds weren't entirely isolated from human settlements. Numerous villages were scattered around the plains and pastures. High mountain meadows might be desolate, but shepherds would occasionally descend a mountain to resupply. How could he not find a cathedral? Indeed, if Pierre Barry had ventured to Fainapotter or Lemberg, locating the cathedral of the eternal blazing sun would be a fruitless endeavor. However, Lumian couldn't shake the feeling that there was something amiss in every word Pierre Barry uttered. Instead, Pierre Barry inquired, Are you headed to the cathedral as well? No, Lumian replied, shaking his head. I thought there'd be people chatting in the square, but it was empty. He then waved his hand. I'm going home. See you tonight, Pierre Barry responded, waving back. After watching the shepherd head towards the cathedral, Lumian made his way back to the village. He decided against having a chat with the Padre. His next destination? The home of Shepherd Pierre Barry. House without adhering to the funeral customs. Could he have gone to take away Naroka's hair and nails? Dory House. Lumian seemed unfazed by the open door and carefully maneuvered around it to the vacant area enclosed by wooden fences at the back. Piles of hay and firewood were scattered near the eaves of the clearing, and three filthy white sheep, muddied with dirt, were lingering there. Lumian remembered Aurore mentioning that the sheep Pierre had hurried back with seemed peculiar, but she couldn't quite pinpoint what was unusual about them. That's why Lumian had taken advantage of the shepherd's absence during prayer at the cathedral to inspect the sheep. Although he had never herded sheep himself, he had lived near the highland pastures in Koru, so he had at least encountered 70 to 80 sheep. He was by no means unfamiliar with them. After observing closely for some time, Lumian couldn't discern any differences between the three sheep before him and others of their kind. All he could do was mutter under his breath, Can't see any issues with my naked eye. Do I need some superpower? Sadly, hunters didn't possess such abilities. Lumian had already utilized his enhanced vision, sense of smell, and understanding of various clues, but he still couldn't identify any problems. The only oddity he noticed was that the sheep's droppings were piled in one corner, rather than scattered everywhere. Of course, there was a high probability that the Berry family regularly cleaned the area to use the feces more efficiently. After several more seconds of observation, Lumian murmured softly, Looks like just looking and sniffing isn't enough. Do I need to get hands on? Without any hesitation, he placed his hand on the fence and flipped over it, as if he was right at home. The three sheep turned their heads simultaneously to look at Lumian, who greeted them with a grin. Come on, time for a checkup. He wasn't concerned that their owner would discover his actions, since he had done similar things more than once. Every family in the village knew that this guy enjoyed playing pranks in various ways. Using sheep as props was just part of his antics. In Lumian's own words, when your reputation is already tarnished, there are some perks to being infamous. With the title of Prankster King, anything he did in Cordu Village wouldn't arouse too much suspicion. Even if those who were clearly abnormal caught him red-handed, they wouldn't be able to confirm that something was amiss with him. Of course, under such circumstances, Padre Guillaume and Shepherd Pierre might try to silence him as a precautionary measure. As such, he needed to exercise caution when necessary. Ba, ba, ba. As if sensing Lumian's ill intentions, the three sheep hid behind the haystack, their cries barely audible. But how could they escape a hunter? Lumian grabbed the sheep and patted its side while forcefully examining its teeth. No issues here either, he whispered. Seeing the sheep look at him, he added with a wicked grin, You're in excellent health. You'd probably make a delicious mutton stew with peas. He deliberately said this to test the intelligence of the three sheep. When there were no problems with the target's body, he could only start from this angle. The sheep's eyes glazed over momentarily. Lumian chuckled. Pretty smart, huh? Do you understand what I'm saying? The sheep's eyes returned to normal as it turned its head and began eating hay. Ignoring me? Lumian stroked his chin. I'll buy you from Pierre Barry later and have you for dinner tonight. The sheep remained unresponsive. It bit off a piece of hay and yanked it out. The haystack suddenly collapsed, 
and Lumion's sharp hunter's eyes caught a glimpse of something. His expression darkened as he walked over and squatted down for a closer inspection. It was a bundle of black hair containing a few severed fingernails. Why would this be outside the house? Lumion muttered in surprise. As a native of Cordu, he was well aware of the burial customs of the Dariej region. When someone died at home, their hair and nails had to be cut and hidden somewhere inside the house to maintain their horoscope and good fortune. How could such an item appear in an outdoor haystack? Lumion picked up the bundle of hair and nails, weighing it as he examined it. It looks quite fresh, as if it had been cut only recently. He quickly made a judgment. However, no one had died in Kordu village lately. Lumion could only suspect that this was some form of witchcraft, similar to the funeral customs. He planned to consult his sister about it later. To avoid arousing suspicion, he stuffed the nails and black hair back into the haystack and restored the messy scene. Having completed that task, he walked towards the wooden fence. As Lumion took a few steps forward, he turned to look back at the three sheep. With a hopeful attitude, he muttered to himself, Pierre Barry seems off. He's back in the village before May. Did he commit a crime outside? As a good citizen of Intis and a devout believer of God, should I visit Dariej and inquire around? The three sheep just stared at him, unresponsive and unchanged. Lumian sighed inwardly, feeling disappointed. These sheep aren't particularly intelligent, he thought. He then raised his hands, thumbs pointing up, index fingers pointing down, making a gesture of disdain. What's wrong with mocking the sheep when I'm in a bad mood? Suddenly, the sheep that Lumion had examined took a few steps forward, looking hopeful. It raised its hoof and started drawing on the mud. Lumion was momentarily stunned, but soon approached the sheep to see what it was drawing. The sheep seemed to be drawing letters on the ground. Lumion found them familiar but didn't recognize them. He frowned and speculated. This language should have the same origin as the Intis language. But I only know Intis and some ancient Faisak languages. At that moment, Lumion realized the significance of Aurore's words. Knowledge equals power. The sheep finished drawing and took a step back, looking at Lumion with sincerity in its eyes. The other two sheep also had a similar emotional change and bleated softly. Lumion looked at the word on the ground and fell into deep thought, wondering what it meant and how he should respond. In just a second or two, he had an idea and nodded solemnly at the three sheep. He stretched out his right foot and wiped away the word on the soil. He may not understand, but he could pretend to understand it. He would trick the sheep for now and ask his sister for guidance later. Without waiting for the sheep to respond, he nodded slowly with a heavy and thoughtful expression as he walked towards the fence, as if saying, Be patient. I'll figure something out. After leaving the sheep pen, Lumion didn't waste any time and went straight home. He found Aurore reading on a recliner in the study. Grand Sor, he called out anxiously, there's something. Immedi Aurore immediately raised her guard, calling me Grand Sor. What kind of trouble did you get into this time? Lumion took a deep breath and organized his thoughts. Remember when you said there was something off about Shepherd Pierre Barry's three sheep? Well, I went to the back of his house to take a look while he was praying in the cathedral, and guess what I found? Aurora's expression turned serious. If you're going to do something like that, you need to tell me in advance. It's dangerous now and no one will protect you. Lumion felt touched by his sister's concern but complained. If I told you in advance, you probably wouldn't have let me go. I'll keep it in mind for next time, he promised sincerely. He had said similar words dozens of times. Aurore understood the urgency of the situation and nodded, indicating that Lumion could tell her what he had discovered. Lumion quickly recounted his experience in the sheep pen. The more Aurore listened, the more serious she became. Write down that word, she said, getting up from the recliner and finding a pen and paper to hand to Lumion. Lumion had memorized the word, so he quickly wrote it down on the paper. Aurore took a quick glance and said solemnly, This is a big problem. I know, Lumion responded inwardly. Moreover, he believed the problem was even bigger than his sister had imagined. What's the problem, he asked. Aurora pointed at the word and said, This is Highlander, the official language of the Fainapotter Kingdom. 
Like Intus, it comes from ancient Faisak. It means... Aurora paused for a moment, then spoke in a deep voice. Help? Lumion blurted out in surprise. The sheep are asking us for help? Aurora tersely acknowledged. I suspect they're not really sheep. They were probably humans. Humans? Lumion asked in shock. This was beyond the scope of what he knew. Before, Lumion had only thought that the three sheep were intelligent and had human-like emotions. They also seemed to have mastered some human language, but he had never thought of them as actual humans. To him, turning into a sheep only happened in imaginative stories. Just as he said that, Lumion was no longer shocked. He realized that a time loop had already happened. What was so strange about people turning into sheep? In the world of mysticism, there are plenty of bizarre and absurd things. Aurora solemnly nodded at her brother's confusion and said, I'm not sure if there's a secret art that can turn a person into a sheep, but all the details now point to that possibility. Indeed, Lumion echoed. The more he thought about it, the more he felt that the three sheep were probably humans. Did this mean that the shepherd Pierre Barry was actually grazing humans? Lumion then asked, why were those nails and hair hidden outside the house? Aurora pursed her lips and said, This is one of the funerary customs of the Dariaj region. However, it's not used under normal circumstances. Many people have forgotten about it. As a warlock, I've studied this aspect to see if I could obtain some useful knowledge. She then explained, When a family member commits suicide or is murdered by a relative, or if they had a bad character while alive, and exerted a negative influence on the entire family. The hair and nails that are cut after death have to be hidden outside the house to prevent the family's horoscope from being affected and bringing them bad luck. Suicide or a murder by a relative? Lumian suddenly thought of something. During the last cycle, Pons Bennett entered Naroko's house without adhering to the funeral customs. Could he have gone to take away Naroko's hair and nails? Chapter 39 Sick If Pons Bennett had really entered Naroka's house to take away her hair and nails, there's a high chance that Naroka had been murdered by a relative. After all, Naroka had a good reputation and was the pillar of the entire family. Furthermore, she was relatively healthy, both physically and mentally, so it was unlikely that she had committed suicide. Lumian quickly came up with a series of speculations. But if Naroka had really been murdered by a relative, what was the reason? Seeing that her brother was deep in thought and hadn't spoken for a long time, Aurora thought that he was frightened by the idea of humans turning into sheep and someone from the Barry family dying from murder, so she comforted him gently. Although the matter is serious, it doesn't affect us yet. I need to reflect on such matters. It's easy for you to panic when you encounter something similar if you're always prohibited from coming into contact with real mysticism. Hmm. The frequency of supernatural events has been increasing in recent years, and I can't be by your side at all times. You'll grow up and have your own life. Lumion inwardly retorted that he had never heard of someone having to leave the family when they grew up. He could feel that Aurora's attitude toward him coming into contact with mysticism had loosened up due to the matter of humans turning into sheep. If I work harder, I can directly tell her that I've become a beyonder, Lumion thought. But before he could speak, Aurore had already made her decision. Go pack your bags now. We'll leave Cordu immediately using Novel Weekly's invitation. We're really lucky. They sent us a telegram at the critical moment so that we can leave openly without being suspected. When we're on our journey, I'll teach you some true mysticism. But don't even think about becoming a beyonder. It's too dangerous. Lumian silently muttered to himself, We're not lucky. I sent the telegram because I discovered the problem. We only received the reply in this cycle. But he was pleased that his sister was still the same decisive person. Although he didn't think they could successfully leave Cordu village or escape the loop, he had to try. Uh, aren't we going to save those three sheep three people? Lumian asked. Aurora shook her head. This could trigger a conflict between us and Pierre Barry, and I'm not sure how strong he is or how many helpers he has. It's too dangerous to save others without knowing anything. It's better to let the officials do it. This is their duty. When we reach Dariage and buy steam locomotive tickets, 
we'll send an anonymous letter to the officials and let them handle it. But what if they don't believe us? Lumion deliberately pressed. Aurora smiled. In terms of mysticism, you are indeed illiterate. In the letter, we'll describe the matter of turning people into sheep clearly. They will naturally find professionals to perform divination. Even if they don't obtain any detailed revelations, they will discover that there's something abnormal about Cordu. Got it, Lumian said, and he went upstairs to pack his bags. Not long after, the siblings each came down with a brown suitcase. Aurore looked out the door and said, Let's go to Madame Poilis and borrow her carriage to reach Dariage as quickly as possible. An ordinary person had to walk an entire afternoon from Cordu village to Dariage. As a hunter, Lumian didn't need to, but in Aurore's eyes, he wasn't a beyonder yet. After hesitating whether he should take the opportunity to confess to his sister, he realized that it was impossible for him to escape from Cordu. He might as well take the opportunity to search Madame Poilis' house for clues. Lumian tersely acknowledged, will do, and reached out to take his sister's suitcase. With two pieces of luggage in hand, he headed for the door. Aurore nodded in satisfaction and relief, but then she said in puzzlement, Your strength has increased. You're carrying it so easily. She subconsciously wanted to raise her right hand and rub the sides of her eyes, but Lumian had already left. She could only give up and quickly follow. On the way to the administrator's residence, many villagers saw Aurore leaving with her luggage and asked about the situation curiously. Aurore, who had a valid reason, was very calm about this. On the other hand, Lumian came up with seven or eight stories to deal with the different villagers. Something about Aurora getting the Intus Legion of Honor Medal and going to Treyar to be honored. Something about him being specially recruited by Treyar Normal College and being able to be matriculated. Or something about Aurora going bankrupt from investing in stocks with her creditors about to come knocking on her door, leaving her with no choice but to flee to other places. The ignorant villagers were stunned when they heard this, but thanks to Lumian's reputation, they chose not to believe him after coming back to their senses. Not long after, the siblings arrived in front of the black building that had been transformed from an ancient castle. Looking up at the two tall towers, Lumian smiled and said, I wonder what's inside. Aurore, have you ever been inside? Why would I wander around someone else's house? Aurore rolled her eyes at her brother. Lumian muttered softly, I thought Madame Poilis would invite you to tour the castle. Don't people like them like to show their guests their big houses and precious collections? What's there to see? Aurora's voice became softer and softer as she thought about how this would be of great help to her description of a castle and her works. So, <sighs> let's talk about it in the future. I wonder if we can still return to Cordu. She then led Lumian through the colorful garden towards the castle door. After taking a few steps, Aurora slowed down and looked around. She remarked in puzzlement, the flowers in this garden bloomed very early. Cordu village was in the mountains, and there was a highlander pasture nearby. Normally, the first wave of spring flowers would only appear in mid to late April. Perhaps Madame Poilis' garden has a special method, Lumian said. He recalled that Madame Poilis was a beyonder of an abnormal pathway, and suspected that this was related to some supernatural phenomenon, but he couldn't say it out loud. Aurora was just making an offhand remark, so she didn't think too deeply about it. They arrived at the castle and received a warm welcome from Madame Poilis. The lady was wearing a blue corset dress today, and there was still a diamond necklace inlaid with gold hanging over her chest. Her long brown hair was half tied up, the rest cascading down, making her look even younger than usual. She sat on an armchair in the small living room and quietly listened to Aurora's request. She smiled and said, You don't have to be so polite. We're friends. Heh. <laughs> Lumion mocked in his heart. Who would introduce crappy marriage partners to a friend? But he quickly saw Madame Poilis looking at him with a smile in her bright brown eyes. He suddenly recalled their previous conversation and felt uncomfortable. All right, Aurore said helplessly. Every time she borrowed a carriage, she would offer to pay for it. But Madame Poilis would always refuse so she would usually bring some gifts for the lady on the way back, which were neither expensive nor cheap, and also give the carriage driver a tip. 
While waiting for the carriage driver to prepare, Madame Poilis invited the siblings to taste some desserts made by her own chef. Lumion tasted a muffin and looked around. Where's Mr. Lund? Louis Lund was Administrator Beos's butler. He had followed him from Dariage to Cordu village. Lumion had evidence that he had an affair with the woman in the village and had sold some of the castle's items secretly. This was how he got the news that Madame Poilis was the mistress of the Padre. Chancing upon the Padre and Madame Poilis having an affair in the cathedral? That was a lie for the foreigners. At this moment, Lumion was looking for Louis Lund to curse him, saying, You son of a bitch. Why didn't you tell me that Madame Poilis was a warlock? Madame Poilis sighed. Louis is sick. He's resting in his room. Sick? For some reason, Lumion felt that there might be a problem. While his sister was chatting with Madame Poilis, he excused himself to go to the washroom, walked out of the living room, and went straight to the stairs. This castle was huge, and the couple didn't bring many servants with them. It looked empty everywhere, and one could even hear echoes when walking in certain places. This gave Lumion better conditions to infiltrate. Relying on his powerful senses, he easily dodged a valet and a maid. With light footsteps, he arrived at the second floor and found Louis Lund's room. He was in no hurry to knock. He turned his head and pressed his ear to the wood. Ah! Ah! Sounds of a man screaming in pain came from the room. Is he really sick? It sounds quite serious. Lumion thought for a moment and walked to the side. He opened the door of the other servants. Administrator Beost and Madame Poilis lived on the third floor. After darting into the room, he gently closed the wooden door, took a few steps to the other side, and pushed open the glass window. Lumion looked down and saw that no one was around. He immediately propped himself up with both hands and nimbly flipped over, hanging on the outer wall of the castle. Then, he leapt lightly like a wild cat and silently landed on Butler Louis Lund's windowsill. Lumion stood at the edge of the glass window, turned his body and secretly looked into the room. He saw Louis Lund lying naked on the bed, his belly bulging, giving the impression that he might burst at any moment. Seeing that the butler's black hair was drenched in sweat and his face was grimacing with pain, Lumion couldn't help but frown when he heard his tragic cries from time to time. What kind of illness is this? It looks scary. A stomach can actually grow so big? At this moment, a woman in her forties stood beside Louis Lund's bed. She had brown hair and brown eyes. She was pretty and didn't have many wrinkles. She wore a grayish white dress and was shouting excitedly at Louis Lund. Soon, soon. What's happening soon? Just as this thought flashed through Lumion's mind, he heard a scream and saw something holding up Louis Lund's stomach. In the blink of an eye, that spot had burst open. Louis Lund's stomach had burst. A small bloody hand reached out. It's born! It's born! The woman shouted happily. She then leaned down and took out a wrinkled, dirty, and bloody baby from Louis Lund's stomach. Lumion was stunned. Chapter 40 On the Carriage Compared to the time loop and humans becoming sheep, the scene in front of him was no less shocking. It made Lumion feel as though his eyes, mind, and spirit had been severely tainted. If he had known beforehand that he would witness such a thing, he would definitely have abandoned his actions. What the fuck is going on? Louis Lund is clearly still a man. Whose child is he carrying? The administrators or Madame Poilis? Is this the world of mysticism? Aurore didn't let me come into contact with this for my own good. For a moment, Lumion's thoughts were disordered and his mind was in a state of chaos. He wished he could dig out his eyes and forcefully forget what he had seen. Wah! 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 The baby that Louis Lund had given birth to cried out, making the filthy delivery room instantly have a holy aura. This was the beauty of a new life. Lumion, who was hiding outside the window, directly experienced the joy of human origins. Of course, besides that, the strange, absurd, dirty, and disharmonious feeling became even more obvious. Lumion finally came back to his senses and subconsciously looked into the room again. The baby had already been placed on a white silk cloth beside Louis Lund by the woman in the grayish-white dress. The baby was a boy, and there was more blood than milky-white fat, but other than that, there was nothing abnormal. 
He looked like an ordinary newborn. Lumian observed for another two seconds and realized that the baby boy's ten fingers were bent. His nails were very long, like the claws of a bird. Just now, he had used these hands to rip open Louis Lund's stomach. Louis Lund, on the other hand, lay in a semi-conscious state. The wound on Louis Lund's stomach had yet to be stitched up, and blood kept seeping out. One could vaguely see the intestines pressed to the side, and a strange bird's nest-like thing covered in a flesh-colored membrane. As the woman wrapped the baby in silk, she picked up a sewing needle and catgut, and began chanting as she sewed the groaning Louis Lund's wound. This was quite easy for you. The last time I gave birth to quadruplets, that was considered painful. Lumian's facial muscles twitched slightly. He felt that after his eyes, brain, mind, and spirit were affected, his ears were also tainted. He retracted his gaze. He had to get out of there. Fast. He left back to the window he had come from and flipped into the room. After closing the window, he rushed out the door and headed straight for the stairs. After dodging a male servant, Lumian tiptoed and quickly returned to the hall. Where did you go? Suddenly, a slightly magnetic and gentle voice sounded in his ears. Even with Lumian's hunter senses, he didn't sense that someone was standing beside the staircase entrance. He turned around to see Madame Poilis in a blue corset, her hair half-tied and her bright brown eyes reflecting his figure. The madame no longer had a smile on her face. Her eyes reflected Lumian's figure with a piercing intensity. Lumian's mind tensed up. He was terrified, but prepared to fight if necessary. Aurore appeared from a side room and asked, Where did you go? The carriage has been waiting at the entrance. Having been in a similar situation, the experienced Lumian said half-truthfully, Didn't Madame Poilis say that Mr. Lund is sick? I had drinks with Mr. Lund and wanted to visit him, but this castle is too big. I couldn't find his room. Aurore nodded and said, You could have asked Madame Poilis directly. You don't have to hide it from us. It's not a bad thing. My bad, I'm sorry. Lumian looked at Madame Poilis sincerely. After seeing the scene upstairs, Lumian was more afraid of this lady than disgusted. He was relieved when she finally smiled, no longer as serious as before. Let me thank you on behalf of Lund for your kindness. But he isn't in the best of health. He isn't willing to appear in front of others in that unseemly manner. It's indeed unseemly, Lumian silently echoed her thoughts. Shall we board the carriage? Thank you so much, Aurore said to Madame Poilis. Lumian watched Madame Poilis closely, afraid she would find a way to make them stay longer. If she did... It could mean that she sensed something had happened with Louis Lund. Although Lumian felt that their combined forces could fight against Madame Poilis after he rendezvoused with his sister, this was her castle after all, surrounded by her servants. It was the worst hunting environment for a hunter. Madame Poilis nodded and smiled at Aurore. I look forward to the gifts you bring back from Treyar. I always yearn for what's trending there. I hope I can give you a surprise, Aurore replied though she wasn't sure she'd ever be able to return to Cordu village. She just needed to keep up appearances. Madame Poilis walked the siblings to the door with her lady's maid, Kathy, and watched them get into the four-seater carriage. The burly, brown-bearded carriage driver wore dark red clothes, yellow pants, and a waxed hat. He looked almost like a professional coachman in the city, except that he didn't wear a tie. This was a mandatory request from Administrator Bayos. Aurore apologized to the driver. Sorry to trouble you, she said politely before closing the door. The driver's name was Sewell, and he had the most common blue eyes in the Intish Republic. He was delighted by Aurore's politeness and looked forward to the tip he'd receive when they arrived in Dariage. Madame, Monsieur, sit tight. He raised his whip and the horses started to speed up. As the carriage passed through Cordu village, it suddenly stopped. Lumian's heart skipped a beat knowing that their journey wouldn't be smooth and easy. What's wrong? He asked the driver, Sewell. Sewell explained. Madame promised to send Naroka to Junak village yesterday. I'm worried I won't be able to return in time after going to Dariaj, so I thought of picking her up on the way. Don't worry, it won't cause any delays. Junak village was closer to Dariaj than Kordu village. Going there first really didn't affect the estimated time of arrival for Aurore and Lumian. 
Aurora had no right to object since this wasn't her carriage, so she didn't. Lumin was more concerned about Naroka's safety. In the previous cycle, she had died under suspicious circumstances, possibly at the hands of a relative. It was related to the Padres' group. Siwa went into Naroka's house before helping her out. Naroka was different from usual. She was dressed in a long black dress with exquisite patterns and a dark bonnet. Her sparse pale hair was carefully combed. Hey, my little cabbages, where are you going? Naroka asked happily as she got into the carriage. Her pockmarked and wrinkled face was filled with unconcealable joy, and her previously slightly turbid eyes were much more energetic. Aurore told her the truth. I'm going to Treyar to attend an author salon, and also bring Lumion to check out the universities there. Aurore asked Naroka, did you receive some invitation? While it was normal for Naroka to wear black clothes as a widow, she only wore this dress during festivals, banquets, and the anniversary of her late husband's death. Naroka looked expectant. Yeah, to meet some people. Lumion quietly observed Naroka, trying to see if he could detect anything from her. The carriage started moving again, leaving Kordu village behind. Aurore chatted with Naroka intermittently, keeping an eye on the outside of the carriage. Aurore worried that their sudden departure might arouse suspicion. As they continued on, Lumion sensed a change in Naroka's demeanor. She looked much paler than before and her eyes lacked their usual liveliness. She only spoke when spoken to. This was very similar to the Naroka Lumion had seen in the middle of the night during the previous cycle. Lumion discreetly tugged on Aurore's hand to get her attention. Aurore turned to him, silently asking what was wrong. Lumion discreetly pointed at Naroka and drew a cross on her palm, a symbol Aurore often used to indicate an error in her scripts. He used it to refer to Naroka's concerning state. Aurora was momentarily stunned, but quickly understood what Lumion meant. She turned her attention to Naroka, sensing that something was wrong. Aurora raised her hand to massage her temples, causing her light blue eyes to darken and become deeper. With just a glance, Aurora's golden brows furrowed and she leaned back slightly as if she had been hit by something. She closed her eyes and rubbed her temples, as if she was feeling tired and in pain. When she opened her eyes again, Aurore turned to Lumion and said, When we reach Dariej, you must stay close to me. No matter what happens, don't leave my side. Her tone was serious, and Lumion understood immediately. He knew that if something happened, he had to follow his sister closely. She would take care of it. He nodded solemnly and decided to tell Aurore about his recent beyond her powers later. Aurore turned her attention back to Naroka and asked, are you really going to Junak or somewhere else? She was worried that an unexpected stop might make things more complicated. It was better to anticipate any developments and not fight in an environment the other party was expecting. Naroka's gaze was vacant as she replied in a deep voice. No, I'm not going to Junak. I want to go to Paramita. As she spoke, Lumia noticed the outside of the carriage window darkening abnormally. Chapter 41 Undead What's Paramita? Lumion was alarmed as he quickly turned to look out the window, but what he saw outside was not what he expected. Instead of mountains, pastures, and trees, he was greeted by a desolate wilderness. The pale white clouds in the sky blocked out all the sunlight, casting everything in shadow. In the wilderness, strange figures roamed about. Most of them wore white linen clothes with pale blue faces, empty eyes, and agape mouths, looking anything but normal. Lumion watched in horror as some of the figures ran crazily towards the edge of the wilderness, while others stumbled towards them from the other side. It was as if they would never stop, doomed to wander aimlessly forever. At the edge of the wilderness, near a cliff, he could make out dark monsters with long horns and humanoid bodies grabbing the white-clad figures and throwing them over the edge. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, right into Lumion's and Aurora's ears. The sound of hooves echoed through the wilderness as a tall figure in full black armor rode a white horse. The horse was so thin that it looked like it had only skin and bones left. The rider moved slowly at times and galloped back and forth at others, as if shepherding sheep. 
Lumion's eyesight was sharp, and he could see the rider clearly from afar. Inside the helmet that shone with a metallic luster, two deep red rays of light flickered like flames. A hideous wound on the rider's neck extended all the way to their navel, almost splitting them in half and dragging out their pale white intestines. Without any need for further evidence, Lumia knew who it was. A death knight. It was a creature that often appeared in Intision folklore. Suddenly, the carriage they were in came to a stop. Naroka silently opened the door and stepped out. Her pale face, empty eyes, and numb expression were starting to resemble the figures in white linen clothes that Lumin had seen earlier. Aurora turned to him and said in a deep voice, This place is filled with undead. You must stay by my side at all times. As she spoke, she took out a gold brooch and fastened it to her clothing. Aurora took out a handful of grayish-black powder from her pocket with her other hand. Lumion leaned forward to look at the carriage driver and realized that Sewell had become like Naroka, pale-faced and empty-eyed, slowly walking deeper into the wilderness as if he had been dead for a long time. He said quickly to Aurora, Grand Sor, I'm already a beyonder. You deal with these undead. I'll drive the carriage and get us out of here as soon as possible. He knew he couldn't fight the undead, so he could only be a temporary carriage driver. But if the Death Knight showed up, he would do his best to block it. Aurora was taken aback by Lumion's sudden transformation, but quickly regained her composure. She reminded him, check the horse's condition. Lumion looked ahead and saw that the horses were motionless, with their flesh and blood seemingly extracted, leaving only withered fur and skin wrapped around their bones. The horses are dead, he reported back to Aurora. Suddenly, the undead caught a whiff of the living, and rushed towards the carriage, trying to enter. XXX. Aurora uttered a word in a language Lumion didn't understand. As soon as Aurora spoke the word, the golden brooch in front of her lit up with a violent, but not stimulating, golden light. The grayish black powder in her left hand burned, emitting a flow of light that resembled water, spreading in all directions. The undead screamed as soon as they came into contact with the light and sigh and smoke rose from their bodies. They wanted to retreat, but more undead surged forward, squeezing around the carriage, evaporating and disappearing. Lumion watched enviously and solemnly, wishing he could do something to help. He yearned to advance in sequence and gain more abilities. But the powder in Aurora's hand was about to run out, and the undead were still coming. Ignoring the ones that had already been destroyed, Lumion knew they couldn't stay there forever. We can't stay here. Let's make a run for it. No matter how many materials his sister had prepared, she couldn't deal with so many undead. The Death Knight and the creatures that looked like demons were still out there. Their best chance was to use what resources they had left to escape from the wilderness known as Paramita. Aurora nodded and said simply, Follow me. The moment she finished speaking, the grayish black powder in her palm vanished into thin air, and the desolate surroundings were engulfed by the undead. Aurora wasted no time and retrieved another handful of materials, igniting them with the golden brooch before her. The materials combusted, creating a dazzling golden light that decimated the approaching undead. Their agonizing shrieks echoed through the wilderness before they disintegrated into nothingness. Aurora leapt off the carriage with Lumion hot on her heels, sprinting towards the nearest edge of the wilderness. Suddenly, a hand jutted out from the golden blaze, snatching Lumion's arm. Lumion's instincts kicked in, alerting him of the imminent threat. He pivoted his forearm and delivered a swift blow to the hand. Pa! It felt like he had punched a block of solid ice. A shiver ran through his body, rendering him immobile for a moment. Lumion's teeth clattered as he caught sight of the hand's owner. It was another undead clad in white linen, but it donned a mask made of white paper over its face. The figure disintegrated slowly under the golden light. The peculiar undead lunged towards Lumion, but before it could make contact, a beam of pure holy light descended upon it. The masked undead halted in its tracks, burning fiercely before dissolving into black vapor. Keep moving, Aurora shouted, withdrawing her hand from the golden brooch and darting forward. Lumion shook off the code and picked up his pace to follow his sister. The duel relied on the grayish black powder and warlock spells to traverse the wilderness. The golden light eradicated countless undead garbed in white linen. 
Unfortunately, Aurori couldn't simply rely on one material to stuff every bag. As a warlock, she had to anticipate various scenarios. Before long, the bag containing the sunflower powder was empty, and they were still hundreds of meters away from the wilderness's edge. The undead horde seemed never-ending. What frightened them even more was the Death Knight's approach. The horse-mounted knight had sensed the turmoil and was galloping towards them. Aurori's expression changed several times in the golden light. She slowed down, gritted her teeth, and spoke urgently to Lumion. When I shout three, run towards the edge of the wilderness and don't look back. Lumion opened his mouth to protest, but Aurori cut him off. Don't worry, I'll follow you. If you stay, you'll only interfere with my use of a powerful spell and slow us down when we try to escape. As she spoke, Aurora removed the golden brooch from her chest and handed it to Lumion, giving him instructions. Focus your spirituality and extend it to this brooch. Repeat this word when you're running. Excess. Lumion didn't understand the word, but he committed the pronunciation to memory. As soon as he took hold of the golden brooch, he felt a warm light envelop his body, banishing his dark thoughts and slowing down his racing mind. Instinctively donning the brooch, Lumion concentrated his thoughts according to his sister's directions, extending his spiritual energy. Seeing that the grayish black powder in her hand was running low, Aurora retrieved another material and shouted out, One, two, three. In order to avoid slowing down his sister, Lumion sprinted wildly towards the edge of the wilderness, shouting the word Aurora had given him with all his might. Exactly. The golden brooch emitted a golden radiant glow illuminating Lumion as though a miniature sun was hanging on his chest. The undead in his path instinctively avoided him. Thud, thud, thud. As he ran, Lumion couldn't shake his worry for his sister. He cast a glance back at Aurora, who remained in her spot surrounded by a cloud of black gas. The undead were drawn to the gas, abandoning Lumion to swarm towards her. Lumion wasn't a fool. When he saw the scene, he understood that his sister was lying when she said that she would follow him. Aurore! He shouted, halting abruptly and spun around, running back toward his sister. Aurore looked back and saw that he had stopped. She hurriedly shouted, Are you stupid? Run! Lumin didn't say anything and ran toward his Aurore. The undead parted before him, clearing a path under the golden light of the brooch. Seeing this, Aurore lowered her head and cursed softly. What an idiot. She then took out another iron black substance and sprinkled it on Lumion, causing him to be pushed to the edge of the wilderness by an invisible force. He struggled to break free, but he was in midair with no point of leverage. My stupid brother, live well. Aurora whispered with a melancholic smile before the black aura consumed her completely. She was directly exposed to countless figures and a death knight. Aurora! Lumion's eyes bulged with terror his skin and eyes turning red with blood vessels. However, he was still pushed to the edge of the wilderness. But suddenly, all the undead stopped in their tracks. Something was happening in the distance. Aurora sensed the shift and looked up in shock. She saw an open carriage passing by, pulled not by horses, but by two demonic creatures with goat horns. The carriage was a deep red color, resembling a conch or a cradle and a woman resembling Madame Poilise wearing a flower crown and green dress sat inside. But unlike Madame Poilise, she was very dignified. The Death Knight abandoned his target and turned his horse towards the carriage. All the undead followed suit, clustering around the carriage as it headed towards the hazy mountain range beyond the wilderness. Chapter 42 Madame Knight Lumion was stunned by the carriage pulled by the demon and the undead's reactions. He forgot to struggle and got pushed by the invisible palm for over 10 seconds before coming to a stop. Although the carriage was getting farther away, he could still see the woman's face clearly with his eagle-like vision. Her long brown hair was tied up high, and her brown eyes were beautiful and bright. She had light eyebrows and wore a fresh green dress and a laurel crown made of flowers. She had an elegant and dignified aura. Madame Poilis! Lumion's first thought was that the woman on the carriage was Madame Poilis, the administrator's wife and the Padre's mistress. However, on closer inspection, he noticed an obvious difference between the two. Not only was there a vast disparity in their aura, but there was also a distinct difference in their looks. The lady in the car had softer and more mature facial features. If Lumion had to make a comparison, 
He would describe the lady in the car as Madame Poilus' older sister by seven or eight years. At the moment, the lady sat in an open carriage pulled by the demon. Surrounded by countless undead and the death knight, she traveled towards the distant forest as if she was on some kind of magical patrol. Aurora retracted her gaze and ran towards Lumin. As she ran, she shouted, Take this opportunity to escape from here. Lumion snapped out of his daze and waited for his sister to catch up before taking large strides and fleeing to the edge of the nearest wilderness. Before long, they felt as though they had passed through an illusory curtain or a thick layer of water. The scene before them changed. The wilderness dissipated like bubbles. The clear river, new grass on both sides, and green trees all entered their view at once. To Lumion and Aurora, the scene was so familiar that they didn't need to identify it to make a judgment. They were still near Cordu village. This was where Ava Lazier used to tend her geese. We're back. Lumian wasn't surprised or disappointed. Instead, he looked around, having confirmed his suspicion. Aurore panted and said, Whether Madame Poilis made a mistake on purpose or not, we can't go back to the village now. Let's head to Dariej, Lumian suggested immediately. Then let's go to the nearest pasture. There's a dangerous path down the hill. With our abilities, we'll be fine, Lumian added. Okay, Aurore turned around and started running. Having borrowed the pony from Madame Poilis from time to time, she was familiar with the highland pastures around Cordu. Lumian followed his sister closely, both glad and terrified at what had just happened. He didn't expect Madame Poilis to be so powerful that she could have so many undead, the demon, and the death knight chase after her. Of course... It might not be Madame Poilis. As she ran, Aurore slowed down. Her breathing became heavier and her gasping became more and more pronounced. What's wrong? Lumian still had plenty of energy. This was one of the benefits of being a hunter. Aurore stopped and panted heavily. I'm exhausted. The spell casting took up a lot of my energy. Lumian said without hesitation. Then I'll carry you. I'm not tired yet. They were in a dire situation and time was of the essence. Aurore nodded, went behind the squatting Lumion, and leaned on him. Lumion first took off the brooch in front of him and returned it to his sister. Then he strained his body and ran again. Is this a mystical item? Lumion still had the energy to ask. Aurora was taken aback for a moment before she chuckled. Looks like you know quite a bit. This is indeed a mystical item. I call it the integrity brooch. It can create a holy sunlight or help me ignite materials to help me use a mystic technique to deal with ghost-type creatures. However, wearing it for too long will cause people to become fanatical, and as long as you wear it, you will lose some thoughts. As you know, immoral methods in battle might be more useful, but you get limited by it. Aurora paused and asked in a deep voice, Where did you get the Beyonder characteristic? As Lumin ran, he replied intermittently, didn't that wand card allow me to stay awake in the dream? What wand card? Aurora was confused. Oh, this was something from the previous cycle. Lumion reorganized his words. I was at Old Tavern and met a mysterious lady. She gave me a wand card. With that card, I stayed lucid in my dream and entered a strange space. There, I encountered some monsters and obtained a hunter beyond her characteristic. Hunter. Aurora was familiar with the sequence commonly seen in Intus. As she muttered to herself, she suddenly chuckled, seeming to have thought of something. What are you laughing at? Lumion was baffled. Aurora asked again, Then who gave you the formula? That mysterious lady? Yeah. Lumion nodded as he ran. Aurora sighed and said, My stupid brother has his own secrets now. I can't confirm if what you said is true or not. I'll just take it at face value. Lumin couldn't bear to see his sister disappointed, so he quickly changed the topic. Was that Madame Poilis on the carriage? They look alike, but they're not the same, Aurora said, contradicting herself. After a few seconds of deliberation, she said, Since you're already a beyonder, I'll tell you directly. My companions, uh, my pen pals, once mentioned something. They said that in the past few years, there have been many strange phenomena similar to what happened just now, in the southern parts of Loen, the southern parts of Intus, and the Faena Potter Kingdom. Women ride carriages pulled by demons, patrol the wilderness, and have hordes of undead following them. 
Some beyonders who have grasped the corresponding mystic arts will let their spirits leave their bodies and follow the carriage for a period of time to experience something wonderful and obtain mystic knowledge. One of my companions obtained one of the Beyonder's notebooks. It mentioned that the lady's name is Madame Knight. The owner of the notebook obtained a secret medicine production method from his experience following a carriage, which can create an invisibility potion from a baby's corpse. According to the investigation, the women in different places exhibit similar phenomena, but things happen at night. Lumion said in surprise. But it's daytime now. Could the anomaly in Cordu village have brought about a change? That's why I'm not sure, Aurori said after thinking for a moment. Perhaps sending Naroka to Paramita made a difference. Perhaps that wilderness is Paramita, where Madame Knights patrol in the day and appear in the human world at night. Yes. Combined with the fact that the lady resembles Poilise, I'm inclined to the previous guess. Lumi didn't know much about mysticism but he instinctively felt that his sister's suspicion was right. He ran in silence for a distance before finally asking, Why did you sacrifice yourself to save me? I wish you were more selfish. I'm very selfish, Aurora said with a smile. I considered abandoning you and escaping on my own. Then I would avenge you when I became stronger. However, after careful consideration, I realized that even if I gave you the integrity brooch and taught you how to use it, you wouldn't be able to help me attract most of the undead to give me a chance to escape. Only a warlock like me could do it. It was a choice between us dying together, or at least you being able to live. I don't have to tell you the choice I made, right? Making such a choice isn't as easy as how you make it sound. Lumion could accept it rationally, but not emotionally. He said gloomily, We might as well die together. You can't die? Who'll bring me back if you're gone? Anything's possible in the world of mysticism, lectured Aurora to her brother. That's why I said all those sappy lines, so you'll remember to work hard and bring me back. That's true, Lumion gradually agreed with his sister's choice. After running for a while, they saw the nearest highland pasture. Lumion, who had been carrying Aurora, clearly felt tired, but he didn't stop to rest. He mustered his remaining strength and rushed to the hill covered in green grass. There were many livestock pens and shacks here. The former was surrounded by rocks and tree branches. The ground was compacted soil and flattened feces. There was a long and narrow exit at one end that could only allow one sheep to pass through. The latter was similar to a primitive tent. Stones were first used to build a circle of low walls, leaving a door and a smoke vent. Then, a row of grates were built against the low walls. The bottom half of the grates was buried in the soil, and the upper end supported a wooden structure. On the wooden structure was a roof made of grass and mud. This was where the shepherds lived. The environment was very harsh. Lumion no longer carried Aurora and led her all the way to the other side of the hill. The dangerous path was hidden below. Looking at the path that required her to jump seven to eight meters off a cliff, Aurora said to Lumion, Although you can climb this now, don't waste time. I'll fly you down. All right. Lumion wanted to see what kind of changes would happen if he left Cordu. Aurora grabbed Lumion's arm with one hand and sprinkled silver dust with the other. The two of them floated up at the same time and slowly flew down the cliff. In midair, Lumion suddenly felt a pain in his head, as if someone had hit him heavily. Aurora had a similar reaction. Lumion's vision quickly turned black as he felt everything shatter. Lumion jolted awake and saw the familiar sights of the table, chair, bookshelf, and wardrobe. Back to square one. He got off the bed thoughtfully and went downstairs. As expected, he found Aurora in a light blue dress preparing dinner. Aurora, what's the date today? Lumion asked. Aurora glared at him. Call me Grand Sir. Are you still not fully awake? It's the 29th today. Chapter 43, Frank. As expected, the loop has repeated. Lumion wasn't surprised to hear Aurora's answer. This was the third cycle he could recall. Combined with his own experience and the mysterious lady's pointers, he had a preliminary conclusion. The time limit for the loop is until the twelfth night. The spatial range of the loop is Cordu Village and its surroundings. Characters in the loop are restricted from killing the Padre. These are the three key points of the loop. 
At this thought, Lumin looked at Aurora and asked thoughtfully, Grand Sora, if you wrote a novel about a time loop, where would you put the key to undoing it? Aurora looked Lumian up and down in confusion. You suddenly asked such a question and even called me Grand Sora obediently. Did you come up with a new story to deceive others? I guess so, Lumian replied sincerely. Aurora frowned and thought for a while before saying, From a novelist's perspective, or rather, from the perspective of normal logic, the most critical part of the cycle is definitely the final scene. This is because it is both the end of the cycle and the beginning of the next cycle. It is the button that connects the end and the beginning. Without it, there is no way to turn the flow of time in a straight line into a closed circle. Think about it. The loop reverses, so there will always be a first time. Something must have happened at the last moment to cause time to restart. Twelfth night? Lumian agreed with his sister's guess about the twelfth night. He nodded and asked, then why can't the most critical part be the first day of the loop? Shouldn't we ask why the loop starts at this moment? Aurori chuckled and said, Making a short story to deceive a few people temporarily is your forte, but when it involves this kind of content that requires strict logic and rich knowledge, you aren't capable of it. The reason why the first day of the loop is the first day is perhaps due to the power or energy that causes the loop. Proceeding past the last day will end up overlapping this day. This is like why a loop probably doesn't cover the entire world, but some localized area. It's not that it doesn't want to, but it's incapable of doing so. Lumian had actually considered this possibility. He just hoped that his knowledgeable sister would come up with a different answer. Aurori thought for a moment and added, If the loop is not a completely closed circle, where there is still interaction between those inside and outside the loop, for example, information inside can be transmitted, and people outside can enter but not leave. The first day of the loop might start from the day the outsiders happen to enter, so that when the loop is repeated, they don't have a position. Of course, it can also compel the outsiders to do something they will do subsequently on the originally eventless first day. There are too many ways to make up similar stories. Lumian's eyes lit up when he heard that. He wanted to praise his sister loudly. He suspected that the entry of Leia, Ryan, and Valentine caused the cycle to start on the afternoon of March 29th. If that was the case, the 12th night might have already turned into the 10th or 9th night. Of course, it might also have originally been the 13th night that turned into the 12th night due to the intrusion of the outsiders. These were all possibilities that Lumian needed to verify himself. He completely agreed with his sister's deduction. He believed that something must have happened on the twelfth night to cause the loop to happen. Only by figuring out what happened at that time could he find the key to undoing the loop. Therefore, Lumian decided not to trigger any abnormalities in this cycle. He also found an excuse not to join the procession and stay until the twelfth night. But he couldn't do nothing. Time wouldn't allow it. Unless Lumian broke out of the cycle after experiencing the twelfth night, he would have to make the best use of time for the next cycle. A complete cycle lasted 12 days. After that, the probability of the outside world discovering any abnormalities in Kordu would increase exponentially. Lumian had, at best, one complete cycle or less to resolve the problem. If he wanted to stop the abnormality in one cycle, he needed to have enough information and a sufficient understanding of the entire village. Lumian couldn't help but mock himself. Not only do I have to avoid triggering the abnormality, but I also have to investigate the problem. What was the difference between this and a clown walking on a tightrope at the edge of a cliff? Wanting both wasn't something good. Aurori saw that he didn't speak for a few seconds and seemed to be making up a story. She waved her hand and said, I almost forgot to make dinner. Wait a minute, Lumian said with a solemn expression. Aurori immediately clicked her tongue. I smell mischief. Lumian said bluntly, Aurori, uh, Grand Sora. Actually... We've already fallen into a loop. <laughs> You've just learned a trick and you're already using it on me? Aurori was both angry and amused. I guess people need to be trustworthy at times. Lumian sighed silently. Can you at least listen to the story I made up first? Why don't you score me while we're at it? Aurori looked outside at the bright sky. That works too. Lumian began from the time he met Leia and the other outsiders. 
He spoke as if he had a general outline, claiming that he had maintained his consciousness in the dream and entered a unique ruin. Through hunting monsters, he obtained a Beyonder characteristic and became a hunter. He didn't hide the matter about the thorn ring pattern that sealed his chest because it might involve the key to the time loop. He had seen the same symbol on the Padre, and killing the Padre had caused time to restart. At first, Aurora was still smiling, thinking that her brother had come up with a creative story. But as she listened, her expression turned serious. There was a lot of knowledge that Lumian shouldn't have known. When Lumian said that he had become a Beyonder, Aurora raised her right hand and massaged her temples. Her light blue eyes instantly became deep, but there was no figure reflected in them. She looked at Lumian for a while and nodded slightly. Your ether body has undergone a huge change. Your life force and physical state are much stronger than ordinary people. Your astral projection has changed to a certain extent, but not much. As expected of a hunter who's better at hand-to-hand -hand combat than spellcasting. I can't see the symbol and the related changes, and I don't dare to look deeper. Aurori pouted and asked in confusion. Don't tell me you deliberately made up such a ridiculous story to make me accept your becoming a Beyonder. This was a typical Lumian modus operandi. Lumian didn't explain and directly talked about the mysticism knowledge that the lady had imparted to him. Of course, he only briefly mentioned the name and did not elaborate. This was not because he was very moral and principled about not telling his sister before obtaining the lady's permission. Instead, the other party was clearly very powerful. If he leaked precious knowledge and angered her, the time loop might be resolved, but they would die. Indestructible law. A law of convergence. Acting method. Aurora was dumbfounded. Aurora was stunned that her illiterate brother in the field of mysticism had grasped such incomparably precious knowledge. It had been more than five years since she became a Beyonder. At first she had relied on Emperor Roselle's diary to join that organization. Her pathway was a symbol of knowledge in the field of mysticism. From time to time she would be pursued by knowledge, allowing her to master the acting method, the law of Beyonder characteristics indestructibility, and the law of Beyonder characteristics conservation, the three cornerstones of the Beyonder world. Therefore, she thought of herself as a Beyonder with insufficient experience, but sufficient knowledge, miles ahead of most of her peers. Now, her brother, who had never come into contact with mysticism, could actually mention such terms. Furthermore, he knew about a law of convergence of Beyonder characteristics that she didn't know about. This eliminated the possibility that Lumian had peeked at her witchcraft notebook. As a Beyonder of the Mystery Prior Pathway, Aurora suppressed her desire to know the specifics of the Law of Convergence as she looked at her brother. She asked in puzzlement, surprise and worry. What did you pay for that lady to teach you this knowledge? The potion formula was even free of charge. She sized up Lumian again from top to bottom, then from bottom to top, trying to find out what was missing from him. Nothing. Lumian laughed self-deprecatingly. That's why it's terrifying. I don't even know what price I'll have to pay in the future. Yes, I suspect that has something to do with the symbol on my chest and the dream ruin. That lady probably wants me to unravel the corresponding secret. Aurora tersely acknowledged. Continue. She waited for the rest of the story with a serious attitude. Lumian talked about the owl, the anomaly during Lent, and the siblings' experiences during the second cycle. He also talked about how the cycle would restart the moment they attempted to leave Cordu. Aurora listened carefully and muttered to herself in disbelief. Either I've been hypnotized by you and told you everything, or time has really entered a loop. She began to believe Lumian because she had named her integrity brooch herself, and there was no record anywhere. Unless she told her brother herself, it was impossible for Lumian to know and she had no impression of it. Lumian struck while the iron was hot. I can also prophesize that the three foreigners will appear at the old tavern at night. I can also prophesize that the Padre is having an affair with Madame Poilis tonight. I can also prophesize that the shepherd, Pierre Barry, has returned to the village. There is something wrong with the three sheep he brought with him. The more Rory listened, the more serious she became. After a while, she said, the three foreigners entered the village in the afternoon while we were practicing combat. After that, we rested and didn't go out at all. 
Yes, in the combat class in the afternoon, you were still an ordinary person. She accepted Lumian's time loop theory. If it were anyone else, Lumian would have laughed and said, You believed it! Ha! You believed such a ridiculous story. But in front of Aurora, he was very restrained. He then suggested, I'll go around the village now and see if I can gather more information. Aurora nodded. I'll also use my eyes to look around. But there are huge restrictions and it's very dangerous. I'm not sure I'll gain anything. Lumian waved his hand, indicating that he understood and walked out the door. As Lumian took a few steps, he looked back at Aurora's figure standing in the kitchen. He immediately thought of the scene of Aurora pushing him to safety among the countless undead, and felt an inexplicable pain of separation. He subconsciously asked, Grand Sur, why did you adopt me in the first place? Aurora grumpily replied, I didn't want to either. I was just kind enough to give you some food, but you kept following me. I couldn't shake you off, and you even obediently helped me do all kinds of things. My heart softened for a moment, and... Who knew that you would grow into this? Do you know how hard it was for a young girl to raise a child like you? Lumian wanted to thank and praise her, but the words were stuck in his mouth, as if they wanted to rush to his eyes and nose. He turned his head and walked back into the village. Chapter 44 Eavesdropping Lumian had to investigate, but he couldn't activate any abnormalities, causing the psycho to restart ahead of time. He had to consider starting from the peripheral problems and edge in one step at a time. His initial idea was to find the Padre's mistresses this afternoon and use eavesdropping and other methods to see if they knew anything. If he didn't gain anything or lack the opportunity for the time being, he would go to the cathedral to see if he could meet the Padre and chat with him about daily life in the village. Lumian's first target was Cybul Berry, the mistress of the Padre Guilum Benet and the sister of the shepherd, Pierre Berry. She had a close relationship with the two abnormal figures, so perhaps she knew something. Lumian's friend Guilum Jr., Guilum Barry, was a distant cousin of Pierre Barry. Even his hair color was different, and they didn't live together. Cybul Barry was 24 years old and married to John Murray, a middle-aged man in his late 40s. He had been single for more than 30 years. The reason why he could marry Cybul Barry was because he did not have any requirements for dowry. Lumian suspected that the reason why she married him using only a small amount of assets was that she had already become the Padre's mistress at that time and needed a husband to be her illegitimate son's father. The Padre had secretly promised something. Although Intus was open-minded and illegitimate children were common, many husbands or wives were still willing to take their spouse's illegitimate children under their wing, despite being angry when they found out. After all, this was equivalent to having an additional free manservant or maid in the future. Furthermore, they didn't have the right to inherit any of the assets, but clergymen of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church weren't allowed to get married and have children. They often found fathers for their illegitimate children. Lumian arrived at John Mari's house, a grayish-white short house at the edge of Cordu with only one floor. Behind the kitchen was the bedroom, and the other side was connected to the basement, serving as a living room and dining room. There was no washroom. They only built a shed at the back of the house. Lumian entered without knocking, quietly coming to the side of the house and squatting under the bedroom window. At that moment, someone was sitting inside. Lumian could hear their breathing and determine their corresponding height. Not long after, light footsteps came from the kitchen to the bedroom. There was no need to calculate. As a hunter, Lumian naturally had the approximate weight of the owner of the footsteps in his mind. It was likely a woman, probably Cybul Berry. Lumian's impression of Cybul Berry was a woman with soft and smooth black hair who didn't like to tie it up like other women. She left it flowing down or tied it into a ponytail giving off the feeling that she was still a young, unmarried girl. Her facial features were not outstanding, but they were soft and round, very fleshy. At this moment, Jean Marie, who had been sitting silently in the bedroom, spoke gloomily. The Padre came this afternoon. His voice was just like him, rather stuffy. He was the kind of person who usually chatted under the elm tree in the village square, replying one in every four or five sentences. In addition, he was often too lazy to comb his black hair. His brown eyes were lifeless, and his beard was not shaven clean. He looked gloomy. 
He was here. Cybo Berry's voice was still a little girlish. She was born like this. John Maury fell silent for a moment before asking, Did you do it? We did, Cybo answered frankly. John Maury fell silent again. When Cybo walked to the kitchen, he said, I don't have much to say about the Padre, but you watch out for other men, especially Pato Russell. Pato Russell was Madonna Bennett's husband. His wife was also the Padre's mistress. Lumian, who was outside the window, was secretly speechless. This relationship was really messed up. He gained a higher opinion of the Padre. He had come to Cyberberry in the afternoon, and he was having a date with Madame Poilis at night. He could be said to be a model worker in the field of cheating. If he could allocate more energy in this area to the church's matters and combine it with his scheming and machinations, he could have long advanced in clerical rank and became a beyonder. The clerical rank was the rank of a clergyman of the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun. Starting from the first rank, it was ossuary, reader, chanter, acolyte, subdeacon, deacon, also known as a priest or padre, bishop, archbishop, and cardinal. The pope was not in the ranks of the clergy. Among them, the sixth rank and above made them senior clergymen. In Aurori's words, it was possible that they possessed superpowers. As for the lowest three ranks, they mainly handled cathedral chores and ritual support. In the past few centuries, they were only glorified titles and were not treated as true clergymen. The fourth rank acolytes were usually students who had just graduated from the seminary. The fifth rank subdeacon could represent a true priest to preside over a cathedral in a rural area. The situation in Koru was the same. A fifth rank subdeacon was the padre, a fourth rank acolyte was the deputy padre and they were staffed with a few servants. Gilun Bennett only needed to advance one more rank to become a true priest. I understand, Cybele Berry simply responded to her husband's exhortations. Jean Maury changed the topic. Is your brother Pierre back from herding? Yes, there's an important ritual that requires his help, Cybele casually explained. A ritual? Lumian's eyelids twitched when he heard that. Jean Maury asked, the land festival? No, it's a ritual of God, Saibo impatiently replied. Don't ask too much. You'll know when the time comes. John Maury tersely acknowledged and said, Praise the sun. Saibo didn't respond and left the bedroom to walk into the kitchen. Lumian instantly made a judgment. Saibo had a certain understanding of the secret dealings between the Padre and Shepherd Pierre Barry, but her husband, John Maury, was completely unaware. The ritual she was talking about wasn't the sacrificial ceremony at the feast. It was likely related to Twelfth Night. Having gained something, Lumian left Maury's house and rushed to the two-story building where Pato Russell and Madonna Bennett lived. Unlike Cybele, Madonna Bennett was married off with her share of the inheritance. Pato Russell also received his share from his original home, so they could build a decent house and entrust more than 20 sheep to the shepherds for grazing. Lumian didn't know when Madonna became the Padre's mistress. He only knew that in the past year, before he hooked up with Madame Poilis, the Padre often visited Madonna. Perhaps the taboo from his identity sparked some kind of flame. At this moment, Pato Russell, who had a gentleman's beard, was pacing in the kitchen. He asked Madonna, who was busy commanding the lady's maid, when will you invite the Padre over as a guest again? He had a fervent expression, hoping to cling to the person with real power in Cordu. Madonna glanced at Pato's father's illegitimate daughter, who was also the servant, cooking, and said in a subtle tone, I don't know. It depends on his mood. And his physical condition, I suppose. Lumian, who was eavesdropping outside, silently muttered. Don't you often go to the cathedral to pray recently? You can ask him while you're at it. Pato Russell refused to give up. Often go to the cathedral? Lumian frowned. The Padre's group is planning something in secret in the cathedral. He really doesn't give a damn about the eternal blazing sun and St. Sith. After listening for a while, Lumian walked from Russell's house to the cathedral at the edge of the village square, hoping to have a face-to-face -face chat with the Padre. However, when he arrived at the cathedral, Guillaume Bennett was no longer there, only the deputy Padre, Mikhail Garrigue stood in front of the altar. This foreigner from Dariesh had graduated from Bigor Theological Seminary, 
Last year, he was sent to Cordoue on the bishop's orders to be Guillaume Benet's deputy. He was usually ostracized and was only in charge of the registration of funerals, marriages, and newborns. During the last cycle, Lumine had arrived at the cathedral and happened to encounter the Padre leaving. The latter had asked him to pray the next day, not giving Mikhail a chance to listen to the prayers and confessions of the believers. Mikhail was taller than Lumian. Lumian felt that he had grown two to three centimeters taller after consuming the hunter potion. He was almost 1.8 meters tall. He was a young lad with curly brown hair. Looking at Mikhail Garug, who was wearing a white robe with golden threads, Lumian spread his arms. Praise the sun! After bowing, he stared at Mikhail, wanting to see how this deputy padre would react to the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun's etiquette. If there was a certain amount of hesitation, Lumian would be able to determine that he had been implicated by the padre's group. But Mikhail Garug immediately returned with the same posture. Praise the sun! He did not hesitate at all. His brown eyes were filled with joy and anticipation. From Madonna Bennett's words, the Padre's group often discussed matters here. As a deputy Padre, Mikhail should have noticed something, right? Lumian didn't ask directly. He looked around and asked, The Padre isn't here? He's been gone for a while, Mikhail replied. Three foreigners came here about 15 minutes ago to no avail. The deputy padre's eyes were passionate, as if he was asking if Lumin would make a confession while here. Considering that the padre might have taken a detour and hid back in the cathedral, waiting for Madame Poilis to bring dinner over, and was eavesdropping on his conversation with Mikel, Lumin deliberately sighed. Then forget it. I'll pray again tomorrow. Mikel's eyes lost their luster. Lumian turned around and left the cathedral. He planned on sneaking to Mikhail's residence when the night deepened to see if he could get any useful information. Seeing that the sun was about to set, he returned home and asked Aurore, Did you find anything? Aurore nodded slightly. In addition to the abnormalities you mentioned, I also discovered that there's something wrong with the deputy padre, Mikhail Garug. Huh? Lumian didn't hide his surprise. Chapter 45 Makeup Lesson Lumian had just confirmed that Mikhail Garug should not have been implicated by Guillaume Bennett and the others. He planned to visit the deputy padre late at night, but when he returned home, he heard his sister say that there was something amiss about him. Aurori glanced at Lumian and smiled. My clueless brother was standing right in front of him when I realized that something was off about him. Seems like he didn't notice. She appeared quite delighted, to the point that she had to raise her right hand to cover her mouth. After all, her younger brother, who was clearly ignorant of mysticism, had suddenly become a beyonder. He had grasped a wealth of advanced knowledge and discovered that Cordu was stuck in a time loop. Not only had she been useless as his sister, but she also found herself outmatched in mysticism knowledge. This made her a tad unhappy. Now, she had finally regained her dignity as an elder sister. Lumian looked at his sister's smile and nodded. I didn't see anything unusual in his behavior. Aurore tersely acknowledged, his astral projection, how can I put it? Simply put, it's brighter than a normal person's, and he's not a beyonder. He hasn't been training his body systematically for a long time. Maybe he was born with a good physique? Lumian guessed before asking in puzzlement. What's an astral projection? Aurore asked in surprise. You don't know? No, Lumian shook his head. Aurore grinned again and said with a hint of disbelief. That woman taught you divine paths, the law of beyond her characteristics indestructibility, and the acting method, but she didn't tell you basic concepts like astral projection? She was in a hurry, so she only focused on the main point. Lumian defended the mysterious woman. Aurora smiled even more happily. Perhaps this basic mysticism knowledge is useless to unofficial hunters. You just need to track, set traps, and fight. She struggled to describe her brother's current state. To say he was ignorant of mysticism wasn't entirely accurate since he knew a great deal. The things he had learned were all formidable. To say that his knowledge surpassed most beyonders wasn't right either. He didn't even know what an astral projection was. Aurora sighed and said seriously, I can only complete your mysticism education. Remember, in mysticism, the external parts of the human body are divided into four levels. 
The innermost layer, which is also the core, is the soul body. It's almost equivalent to the concept of a spirit. It's the spirituality of everything. What gets strengthened. You could say, it's the essence of building a soul. To a mystery prior, the potion mainly upgrades the soul body. The astral projection is located outside the soul body. It's the latter's manifestation in the real and spirit worlds. Moreover, it's closely related to your will and current emotions. So, do you understand? When I said the Deputy Padre's astral projection was brighter than a normal person's, I meant that his soul body or spirit had an issue. This is reflected in his astral projection. It has nothing to do with his natural physique. Of course, it could be because his spirituality is naturally strong. Through the astral projection, we can still grasp the target's true emotions. For example, red signifies passion and excitement. Orange represents warmth and satisfaction. Yellow indicates happiness and extroversion. Green conveys calmness and peace. Blue suggests coldness and introspection. White denotes brightness and eagerness to improve. Dark colors symbolize worry, sorrow, and silence. Purple implies that spirituality is taking control, coldness, and estrangement. It's very difficult to fake these colors, but they're relatively generic. It's impossible for us to distinguish subtle emotions and delicate feelings. Lumian listened attentively, as if he wanted to take out a fountain pen and jot everything down. Just listen. Aurori felt a little worn out from talking. She sat down at the dining table. I'll give you my first witchcraft notebook later. It's filled with such basic knowledge. All right, all right. Lumian sat down and nodded obediently. What's outside the astral projection? Aurora picked up her carved glass cup and took a sip. Beyond that is the body of heart and mind. From this point on, spirit and flesh emerge. The body of heart and mind involves the mind. It relates to one's reasoning, thinking, insight, and ability to understand things. Some potions mainly improve this, but there are also many spells targeting it. The outermost layer is the ether body. It's a manifestation of life force and physical state. So I can tell at a glance that your body has improved greatly. Yes, through the thickness, brightness, and color of different parts of the ether body, I can also determine the target's health. As a sequence seven mystery prior, I can even determine the target's lifespan from the specific situation of the ether body. As for how to differentiate them, read the notebook later. Lumian was enlightened. The hunter potion mainly targets the ether body? You're wrong. It targets the body and life force, and ether body is the straightforward manifestation of both. Lumian nodded as he revised, gaining a preliminary understanding of such mysticism knowledge. He recalled his sister's words and asked curiously, Aurori, how did you observe the deputy padre? Why didn't I sense you nearby? Aurori smiled. Actually, I've been staying at home all this while, using the Mystery Prior Pathways special trait. What's special? Lumin asked with the mentality that it didn't matter if his sister didn't answer. Aurori pointed at her eyes. The most unique ability of a Mystery Prior is called the Eyes of Mystery Prying. Although I need to reach a higher sequence before I can activate the complete Eyes of Mystery Prying, allowing it to not only be of use to me, but it can also be placed on the surface of other objects to help me monitor matters remotely. This doesn't mean that Mystery Prior's eyes aren't special before this. From Sequence 9 onwards, a Mystery Prior has seen more than most sequence beyonders of the same pathway. The simplest example is that a hunter can only see an ether body before they undergo a qualitative change in their godhood. Furthermore, it's in a less detailed manner. And now, I can examine the various details of the astral projection. In addition, I can also see things around me that aren't normally visible. Aurora glanced at the kitchen. This made Lumian inexplicably shocked. There was clearly nothing in that direction, but he felt that there might be something invisible that he could not see. Aurora continued, Of course, this might not be a good thing. It's very easy for something to happen when you see something you shouldn't see. Therefore, I've been restraining myself. I don't look at things I shouldn't see, but as my sequence increases, it's not up to you not to look. Lumian thought for a moment and asked in confusion, Didn't you say that only higher sequences can project out the eyes of mystery prying? Why can you observe the people in the cathedral from home? 
Aurora raised her right hand and pointed with her index finger. I've always told you that knowledge equals power, but you didn't believe me. Under normal circumstances, it's true that I can't observe things hundreds of meters away from home. But humans can use tools, and I have two assistants. As she spoke, she took out two items from a hidden pocket in her blue dress. One was a brass telescope that could shrink and lengthen, and the other was a miniature version of a dark ink bottle. This was more like a child's toy. Look, the telescope can help me see people a hundred meters away clearly. Once the visual range is closed, I can observe the target's astral body, ether body, and body of heart and mind state, Aurora introduced with a smile. This is suitable for open spaces without obstacles. Lumion was a little dumbfounded. That works too? They were clearly discussing mysticism. Why did his sister take out a telescope? What about this? He pointed at the pocket ink bottle. Aurora didn't answer. She massaged her temples and opened the bottle cap. Lumion suddenly felt a little cold. A cool breeze seemed to blow in through the window. It's a unique spirit world creature, Aurora introduced. Where is it? Lumion looked around. Aurora was rather surprised. You still don't know how to activate spirit vision? But didn't you say you saw a lot of undead in the wilderness? Lumion had read about the term spirit vision in Psychic and knew what it meant. However, he was completely at a loss as to how to activate spirit vision. He looked at his sister and slowly shook his head. I don't know. Then he guessed. Maybe ordinary people can see ghosts and undead directly when entering the so-called Paramita. Aurora thought seriously and asked. So you don't know Hermes, Ancient Hermes, Elvish, Dragonese, or Jotun? What are those? Lumion fully displayed what it meant to be illiterate in the field of mysticism. Aurora couldn't help but facepalm. What exactly did that lady teach you? Law of beyond her characteristics indestructibility, law of convergence, acting method, paths of the divine, sequence zero, sealed artifacts. Lumion answered honestly. Aurora felt like he was flaunting. I think you want a beating. She sighed for a few seconds before regaining her composure. Then I'll combine it with my contracted creature to teach you how to activate spirit vision, how to carry out ritualistic magic and how to use language with supernatural powers. This is only a rough explanation. If you really want to completely master it, especially those few languages, it will take at least a year or two. Of course, this is also a problem with your sequence pathway. Hunters probably don't have their learning abilities improved, nor do they have any enhancements in mysticism. Back then, I relied on diligence and indoctrination to master all of them in less than half a year. Her right hand gently stroked the void in front of her, as if she was stroking a transparent kitten. It's very simple for Beyonders to activate their spirit vision, but it's not completely dark yet. Let's talk about something else first. I call it White Paper. It's a very weak spirit world creature. As long as you have an accurate description, you can hold the ritual and summon it in your name. Other than the fact that spirit world creatures are difficult to see, it only has one use. That is, to carry a certain supernatural ability of the contractor, but it can't be too complicated or too powerful. Chapter 46 Ritualistic Magic Lumion gazed at the invisible spirit world creature and contemplated for a moment. How complicated can it get? How strong can it be? Heh, <laughs> I thought you'd ask how to summon or perform ritualistic magic, but you just want to know how to use it, Aurora teased. That might be a characteristic of the hunter pathway. You don't need to fully understand the principles, only consider how to apply them. Not waiting for Lumion's response, she pondered and said, I've tried. Not too complicated means it can only perform one action. Not too powerful means it can't surpass a Mystery Prior Sequence 7 Warlock spell. It's nice discussing this with Aurora. She has a habit of analyzing things both qualitatively and quantitatively unlike someone who prefers vague descriptions. Lumion felt emotional hearing that. As he melded over, he stood up and helped his sister bring the food to the dining table. As they ate, he asked, But I remember your spells often require materials. You can't carry white paper, right? Yes, that's inconvenient. Aurora grabbed a piece of fried trout and stuffed it into her mouth. After chewing and swallowing, she said, 
Moreover, a warlock's spells can't be completed in one move. Even the simplest has three steps. First is concentrating spirituality. The second is outlining the symbol of the corresponding spell in the mind. This can also be replaced by reciting the incantation aloud. The third is using materials to cast the spell. The materials serve either as a medium or part of the spell. This does sound a little complicated. It isn't something the single-celled white paper can do. Lumion knew he couldn't do it anytime soon. He'd need extensive training before he could cast spells proficiently. Aurora glanced at him. Don't even think about it. It's impossible for you to be like me. First, you're limited by your sequence, and your spirituality is insufficient. Second, using materials to help cast spells is a unique ability only warlocks have. Yes, perhaps certain sequences of certain pathways can do it. I don't know enough to make a definite judgment. However, once a hunter reaches sequence 7 and becomes a pyromaniac, they can use many fire-related spells. Furthermore, they don't need materials, nor do they need to outline symbols or recite incantations in their minds. In terms of actual combat, it's faster, more convenient, and might even be stronger. As for warlocks, their main advantage lies in their versatility. The more knowledge they acquire, the more comprehensive and powerful they become. Lumion said with anticipation, I don't know when I can become a pyromaniac. He planned to explore the dream runes again tonight. Firstly, he wanted to use hunting to help digest the potion, and secondly, he wanted to find clues about the main ingredient of Sequence 8 Provoker. As for the corresponding monsters of the pyromaniac, he didn't dare think about them yet. He believed it would be like serving himself on a platter. After all, those creatures could definitely launch long-range attacks, rendering his special abilities useless. He then asked, can white paper withstand the pyromaniac's one-movement spells? Theoretically, yes, but I'm not sure if Pyromaniac's spells exceed a certain level. Aurora's reference standard was Warlock. Upon hearing this, Lumion became excited. If I could, wouldn't I be able to simulate the funnels you mentioned? Huh? Aurora was puzzled. Lumion explained his idea in detail. I can summon a group of white papers and form a contract with them. Then I can have each white paper carry a fireball. They'll float in the air and attack the target together. Isn't that similar to the description of the funnels? Unfortunately, you can't have a group of white papers at the same time, Aurora laughed. After you form a contract with a white paper, the next time you use the initial summoning description, the same white paper will appear. Can I summon one first and hold off on the contract? Then I'll summon another until I have a satisfactory number before forming a contract. Lumion hadn't received a traditional education, but instead a custom one that included Aurora's ideas. Combined with the refinement of years of pranks, he always had creative ideas. Aurora admitted she wasn't that cunning. She considered and said, I've never tried it before, so I don't know if it'll work. You can try it yourself when you're at sequence 7. However, I think having a white paper beside you while summoning others might cause a conflict. It's unlikely to succeed. The only hope is to directly summon multiple white papers, but there's a high chance that only sequences skilled at summoning can do it. Lumion decided to give it a try when the time came. After all, he had nothing to lose. Aurora scooped up some mashed potatoes. Now, let's talk about how to summon creatures from the spirit world. This is an application of ritualistic magic. Ritualistic magic is magic cast by selecting the date and time, preparing the corresponding materials, and strictly following the format and process. It's often used in prayers and summonings. Lumion nodded. It's to achieve a certain supernatural effect through a ritual. He thought of the various rituals of the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun, as well as the process of the Lent celebration. Yes, Aurora was very satisfied with her brother's comprehension ability. To put it simply, ritualistic magic needs a target to pray to. It can be the seven orthodox gods, other hidden beings, or even evil gods or devils. It can even be you. When you pray to the orthodox gods, you need to check or choose the date and time they rule over. For example, Tuesday symbolizes the eternal blazing sun, and there is a corresponding sun hour every day. During these times, the probability of success will be greatly increased if you perform the ritualistic magic that targets the eternal blazing sun. However, 
This isn't very useful. Those who aren't official beyonders have a very low chance of successfully praying to the corresponding orthodox god. Even if you receive a response, don't be happy. This might mean that you have been noticed by that entity. Of course, we also have ways to bypass restrictions. For example, obtaining an item closely related to the target deity. There's no need to pick a date or time to pray to a hidden being or an evil god or devil. But I don't need to tell you how dangerous it is, right? 99% of people who do this don't end up well. Therefore, for wild beyonders, the most commonly used ritualistic magic is to pray to themselves to mobilize their spirituality to complete some relatively complicated task. Create charms and beyonder weapons? Lumin recalled a point of knowledge that the lady had mentioned. Aurora nodded. That's right. Some mystical medicines also require ritualistic magic. You also missed something. Summoning a creature from the spirit world. She ate some more food before saying, The second step of ritualistic magic is to prepare the corresponding ingredients. If you wish to pray to an existence, prepare herbs, essential oils, powders, extracts, and so on from their domain to please them. Let's use the eternal blazing sun as an example. If you pray to him, you can use sun essential oil, rosemary powder, Buddha's hand, and all kinds of sunflowers. As for praying to yourself, it won't be too troublesome. Although it's best to use the ingredients in your domain, someone like you can even put a cup of absinthe. It's fine even if you don't do so. The third step is to set up an altar. This can be determined by the environment. There's no need for a special holy solemnity. It's mainly because there can't be any miscellaneous items. The most important thing about the altar is the candles. Aurora picked up her knife and fork as she spoke. She stretched out the two items and said, Pretend that they are candles. If you pray to a deity, make them with the corresponding symbolic materials. As an example, the eternal blazing sun has the inextinguishable light and the embodiment of order in his name. Out of caution, Aurora paused for a few seconds before continuing. God of deeds and guardian of businesses. There should be the honorific name father of all life, right? Lumian asked, familiar with the preaching. Aurora shook her head. That's just a title used by the Eternal Blazing Sun Church when proselytizing. It's beyond him in mysticism. If it was really part of his name, it would mean something big had happened. She didn't give any more details, unsure herself. She brought the conversation back on track. Anyway, if you want to exorcise the undead, you have to pray to the symbol of inextinguishable light. So you need to make candles out of different sunflowers. For contracts, Use the honorific title of the God of Deeds to make candles with Buddha's hand and other materials. Check my witchcraft notebook for more options. In ritualistic magic, we can only place two candles at the spot corresponding to the deity. This is because in mysticism, zero represents the unknown, or chaos. It symbolizes the state of the world before it was born. If we don't place the candles, it means that there won't be any effect. One represents a beginning, the first creator. It also accurately pinpoints a particular existence. Two represents the world and various divinities that were produced from the creator's body. Therefore, ritualistic magic can only have two candles to represent the deity. As for which candles to use, it depends on the desired effect. Three represent all things. So the third candle is for us. The two candles in the upper position represent the deity and the candle in front is for myself for a total of three candles. If you have an item related to a deity or a hidden existence, you can replace the two candles with that item for a dualistic ritual. If you pray to yourself, leave only the candle that represents yourself. Lumian listened attentively, realizing that as a wild hunter, he could only pray to himself in ritualistic magic before knowing the honorific name of the great existence. Where would he find items closely related to a deity? Let me show you the next few steps using summoning creatures from the spirit world, Aurora said, standing up as she saw her brother finish his dinner. They quickly cleared the dining table. Chapter 47 Truly Illiterate Aurora looked at the slightly stained white tablecloth and smiled at Lumion. If you're the target of ritualistic magic, it doesn't matter if the altar is dirty. 
but if you want to pray to a deity or a hidden existence, I suggest you change to a cleaner piece of cloth, or remove the cloth, and wipe the table. Anything works if I'm just praying to myself, right? Lumion teased. Aurora chuckled. That refers to the environment, materials, and equipment, but the ritual process and incantations must strictly follow the rules of mysticism. She pulled out an orange candle from her pocket. This is a candle mixed with citrus and lavender. It has nothing to do with their domain. I just like it. Aurora waved the candle above the altar. Remember, the candle representing the deity is placed in these two places. It can be empty now. Then she placed the candle close to her. Remember, this is the location of me. Next, Aurora brought a cup of water, a plate of coarse salt, and a small steel bowl from the kitchen. We need to create a clean and undisturbed ritual environment. Clean in the sense of spirituality. We have to construct it ourselves. Enter cogitation and focus your mind. You can guide the spiritual power out through supplementary items and build a wall of spirituality around the altar. Mystery priors and seers find this simple. Hunters need the help of other items before reaching sequence 7. For example, incense to calm your emotions and make you ethereal, or a crystal ball to help you focus on your spirituality. The meditation I taught you before is incomplete. It's only the first step. It can only gather your thoughts and calm you down. I'll teach you the rest later. Lumion was surprised. Why can I activate the dream specialness and make the two symbols appear if the meditation method is incomplete? Aurora pulled out a silver dagger. Watch carefully how I build the wall of spirituality. Lumion was stunned and blurted out. Why do you have so many things on you? First, there were various casting materials, a retractable telescope, a miniature ink bottle that stored the spirit world creature, white paper, and candles for rituals. Now she had taken out a dagger. Aurora sighed in exasperation. Do you think I want to? It's just inconvenient for warlocks. It takes me a long time to alter each of my clothes. Sometimes I even feel like Doraemon. I can take out whatever I want. What? Amon? Lumion asked, not understanding the reference. Aurora hesitated for a moment before replying with a mixed expression. You don't need to know. Lumion suddenly felt a pang of sadness for his sister. Aurora composed herself and reached for the orange candle representing her. In ritualistic magic, candles can't simply be lit. Of course, there are times when ordinary methods can work, but that's not always the case, Aurora explained. The correct way is to extend your spirituality, rub it against the wick, and light it. As she spoke, she lit the candle with a spark of spirituality and it burned with an orange flame. The dining table transformed into an altar, and the surrounding area was bathed in a deep otherworldly light. Aurora's light blue eyes had darkened, and an invisible wind swirled around her as she plunged a silver dagger into the coarse salt and began chanting a mysterious incantation. XXX, XXX. Lumion was bewildered as he watched his sister complete the incantation and draw out the silver dagger. She stabbed it into the cup of water and raised it again. Aurora pointed the dagger outward and began to walk around the altar. With each step she took, Lumion sensed an invisible force emanating from the dagger. It was agile and lively, mingling with the air to create an impenetrable barrier. As Aurora completed the circle, Lumion felt as if she had been transported to a different realm. Did you understand the steps? Aurora's voice sounded distant. Lumion nodded truthfully. Yes, but I don't understand what you mean. Aurora could not help but laugh. You're completely illiterate when it comes to mysticism. Literally. That's Hermes. When translated, it's, I sanctify you, blade of pure silver. I cleanse and purify you, allowing you to serve me in this ritual. In the name of Warlock, Aurora Lee, you have been sanctified. Lumian scratched his head. It sounds ordinary. That's just the translation. The meaning of the incantation and the language used is what's important. Aurora explained, her eyes lighting up. In Intision, it might sound ordinary, but if you use Hermes, Ancient Hermes, Elvish, Dragonese, or Jotun, you can tap into supernatural powers. That's what sets them apart. Lumion asked curiously, are these the only languages that can communicate with the mysterious? No, there are many other languages in the field of mysticism, each with its own specialties. For example, some are specifically meant for the undead, 
but most beyonders won't be able to use them unless they want to study a unique and rare domain or perform the corresponding ritual, Aurora explained casually. She went on to explain the incantation. During the sanctification ritual, the penultimate sentence should be in the name of a certain deity or a hidden existence. But as wild beyonders, it's best not to use them to avoid unnecessary trouble. As a beyonder, it's enough to use your name to sanctify an ordinary item. Although it won't be as effective as the original version, it can still be used. Lumion nodded, then asked, You came up with my name. Can I use it in the ritual? Aurora replied confidently, Yes, a completely new name wouldn't work, but your name has been in use for several years, so there's a mystic connection. She paused for a moment before continuing. If you're in the wild and don't have many materials, you can complete the ritual with simple salt or clear water. With that, Aurora pulled out a small silver black metal bottle from her pocket. This is my own concoction of essential oil called Wizard of Oz. What sets it apart is that it smells good. Aurora explained that she dripped three drops of light green liquid on the candle representing her. The light of the candle flickered and sizzled, and a faint mist spread out, giving Aurora and the altar an air of mystique. Now for the important part, Aurora said, pulling out a small imitation goatskin from her pocket. If you're holding a ritualistic magic that prays to a deity, you need to draw the symbol of what you want on the paper and burn it during the ritual. The first part is a prayer for someone's power. This someone needs to be replaced by the symbol of a deity, an honorific name, or a domain ruled over by them. For example, I pray for the power of the sun or the power of order. Remember, there are always two sentences that correspond to the two candles that represent the deity. The second part is, I pray for the God's love and grace. Remember, don't call him by his name. Doing so in a ritual is sacrilegious. The eternal blazing sun can be referred to as God or Father. The third part is what you want to pray for. You must be brief and finish in one sentence. The fourth part is to give more power to the incantation. For example, sunflower, an herb that belongs to the sun. Please bestow your powers to my incantation. You can choose two to three types based on the materials used. After reciting the incantation, drip a drop of essential oil on each candle and burn the piece of paper that was used to draw the symbol. After the paper is burned, the ritual comes to an end. Then, thank the deity and extinguish the candles in the order of me, followed by God, right to left. Dispel the wall of spirituality. Oh, and remember to light the candles from left to right, beginning with God, followed by me. Lumion nodded twice in acknowledgement before asking, What about praying to yourself? Aurora chuckled before explaining, The incantation is even simpler. I'll use summoning spirit world creatures as an example. For the first part, there's only one word. I. Remember, you can't use modern Hermes here. It has to be ancient Hermes, Elvish, Dragonese, or Jotun. The second part is I summon in my name, which can be said in modern Hermes. The third part is the exact description of the summoned spirit world creature. Lumion was curious. What's an exact description? Aurora explained solemnly. It needs to be limited to three lines to help us lock onto the creature we want to summon. For instance, if someone said they were looking for the prankster of Cordu Village, Aurora Lee's idiot brother, and a regular customer of Old Tavern, we know exactly who they're looking for because of the specific characteristics given. I get it. Lumion was enlightened. So, if we don't know the target's name, appearance, or address, we can use their characteristics to help find them. Aurora said seriously, That's the principle, but there are many problems when put into practice. For example, when summoning creatures from the spirit world, the first sentence is often fixed. It's either the spirit that wanders about the unfounded, or spirit wandering above the world. Its function is to point to the spirit world and clearly state that we want to summon a spirit. The second sentence is also very universal. We don't summon spirit world creatures to harm ourselves, so we must restrict it to friendly creatures. Sometimes we also add the word weak. This is because some spirit world creatures may be very friendly, but their existence can bring great danger. Considering these circumstances, the description is fixed. The friendly creature that can be subordinated the friendly creature that can be consulted, the weak creature that can be subordinated, and so on. 
but based on these two descriptions, the direction is still very broad. It doesn't reflect our needs. Therefore, the third description is very important. You need to use a sentence to clearly explain what creature you want to summon. Sounds very difficult. Lumion felt a headache just thinking about it. Aurore nodded. Not only is it difficult, but it's also dangerous. When the direction is vague, it might summon a spirit you don't need, or a creature that brings danger. Remember, being weak doesn't mean it can't kill you. Just like being friendly doesn't mean it won't pose a threat to you. Chapter 48 Knowledge Pursuer Lumion deeply understood Aurora's words. As a vagrant, he knew better than to underestimate anyone. Some adult vagrants suffered massive losses, just because they looked down on him and assumed him to be weak. As for some almsgivers, they provided food out of kindness but forgot to consider the starving bodies of the vagrants, causing them to make the wrong decisions. After a moment of serious thought, Lumion said, It seems like the description of a creature that can be summoned with relative precision is very valuable. Aurore nodded solemnly. That's right. A notebook that records the corresponding summoning incantations is very precious. Every incantation and commentary on it is exchanged with life, blood, or pain. For example, when I summon white paper, the three lines described it as the spirit that wanders about the unfounded, the friendly creature that can be subordinated, the weak ball that can telepathically connect with you. You have to make countless attempts and experience countless failures before you can piece one together. And every failure implies a huge risk. Is this a description that a normal person can come up with? In particular, the words weak and ball? As Lumion criticized inwardly, he asked, So you bought this from someone else? No. Aurora shook her head and said with a bitter expression, The mystery prior pathway is different from other pathways. From time to time, it will be chased by a large amount of knowledge. It's impossible to ignore, and there's no way to reject it even if one can't handle it. And when one consumes a potion to advance, the situation of being chased by knowledge becomes even more serious. Although most of this knowledge is useless, there will always be some that are valuable. The incantation to summon white paper was one of them. Lumion understood. Indoctrination from the Hidden Sage? Aurore looked at him in surprise. You know that? Did that lady teach you? Yeah, Lumion nodded. Aurore pursed her lips, lost in thought. From my personal experience, Knowledge pursuit isn't limited to the hidden sage's indoctrination. My so-called ear-ringing does indeed hear his voice, where I gain knowledge, but it always puts me in pain. My head is close to exploding and I wish I could lose control. But occasionally, especially when I'm not in the best state and am about to lose control, I have an illusion that all the knowledge in the world has come to life. A small number of them will chase after me and rush towards me, but I can't dodge them. This is how the summoning incantation for white paper barged into my brain. When consuming the potion, 99% of the knowledge pursued comes from the hidden sage. 1% is related to revived knowledge. It's very magical and terrifying. It can scare everyone in the village. As Lumion sighed with emotion, he was thinking for his sister about whether there was a way to resolve the problem of knowledge pursuit or reduce its impact. Aurora replied with a bitter smile. It's precisely because I often suffer such torture that I don't want you to follow the path of Beyonders. But in our current situation, it's better to become a Beyonder than an ordinary person. To make her brother remember the madness and danger of the path to transcendence, she pointed at her head. After being pursued by knowledge and experiencing pain for a long time, I feel that my mind and personality have undergone a certain mutation. Don't I always tell you that I have a phobia for social interaction? But I am very talkative sometimes. I like to go out and chat with the old ladies in the village and tell stories to the children. Occasionally, I will go crazy and borrow Madame Poilis's pony to ride free into the mountains and shout. Being especially talkative is a kind of rebound from prolonged isolation and being unable to return to my true home. The path to transcendence is also a form of oppression and the occasional madness. At this point, Aurore chuckled and looked at Lumian. You don't think that's just an exaggerated adjective, do you? Lumion fell silent, feeling his sister's smile was self-deprecating, lost and filled with indescribable pain and struggle. Aurora sighed. 
During those times, I wouldn't even recognize myself. Lumion felt deeply helpless. There should be a solution. Hopefully. Let's continue. Aurora said, pointing at the altar. After we sign a contract with the summoned spirit war creature, it will be easy to summon it again. We can change the last description to contract a creature that belongs to Aurora Lee. That will be very accurate, right? Besides, before the contract is terminated, no one can summon it again. Lumion was concerned. Everyone can only have one contracted creature? Not really. I'm not sure how high the upper limit is, but it's definitely more than one, especially with some special sequences. When summoning, say the first contract creature, or second contract creature, of the person to differentiate, Aurora spoke the truth. In addition, summoning creatures from the spirit world will consume your spirituality. The more you summon, the greater the consumption. With a hunter's spirituality, I estimate that I can only withstand one contract creature at most. Knowing her brother's personality, she curbed any loopholes that Lumion might find. Every spirit world creature can only stay for a limited period of time after being summoned to reality. The weaker they are, the longer they can stay. You don't have to think about summoning one first. You can summon the next one after your spirituality recovers, unless you choose a very weak one, and only when your spirituality is significantly stronger than it is now. She used white paper as an example. If I didn't let white paper be a vessel for my powers, it could stay in reality for 12 hours. If I share the specialness of my eyes with it and let it do things for me, it can last at most three hours, and my spirituality would be constantly depleted. Lumion was disappointed. He had wanted to form an army of spirit world creatures. He thought for a moment and asked, Can I only summon creatures from the spirit world? Can I only summon spirits? No. Aurora shook her head. We can also summon creatures affiliated with the spirit world, the real world, and the astral world, as well as creatures from alternate worlds or other planets. Regardless of whether they are spirits or not, this is very dangerous. Most of the Beyonders who have attempted this have died tragically, and a small number have mysteriously disappeared. Only the corresponding notebooks were left behind to prove what they had done. Lumion asked curiously, can I summon something from the real world? Aurora pondered for a moment before responding. In theory, as long as the other party has a closer relationship with their spirit world or has reached a certain level, they should be able to hear the summoning and decide if they want to respond. However, such a target is either very special or very powerful. If you want to live well, don't try it. Furthermore, when the summoning target isn't a spirit, the requirements for the corresponding ritual will be even higher. It will require more spirituality, and it might even require a large number of sacrifices. Only then can we open the door of summoning that can be used by non-spiritual creatures. You can barely summon white paper with a hunter's spirituality. If you want to try something more powerful, you can only pray to a deity or a hidden existence. For this, you might have to prepare something filled with spirituality as a sacrifice. Lumion roughly understood the ritualistic magic of summoning. So next, you are going to recite an incantation and complete the summoning? How is that possible? Aurora scoffed. The ritual has been interrupted so many times. How can we continue? In fact, normally, as long as we follow the process, we can resume from any breaks. However, I was mainly explaining and didn't divert my attention to do the corresponding things. You probably forgot. Lumion muttered inwardly, but didn't dare say it out loud. Aurora then said, However, I do want to hold a summoning ritual. On the one hand, I want to give you a complete demonstration of the entire process. On the other hand, I want to seek help. Seek help? Lumion asked in puzzlement. Summoning powerful spirit world creatures to help? Aurora explained, Among the countless spirit world creatures, only a very small number of them can act as messengers. Private messengers. Uh, messengers can be summoned by others based on special contracts. For example, if I have a contracted messenger, someone in Treyarch can summon it and give it a written letter. It will immediately pass through the spirit world and deliver the letter to me. Due to the special connection between the spirit world and the contract, it only takes a second or two to complete the letter delivery. 
Lumion sighed from the bottom of his heart. Very impressive. It's as fast as sending a telegram. But the thought that crossed his mind was, I want one too. Don't even think about it, Aurora read his mind. It's very difficult to summon a messenger. Unless you obtain an exact incantation, it's unlikely that you can succeed trying yourself. And only a few special sequences can grasp an exact incantation. Even I don't have one. Lumion was disappointed and asked, Are you going to summon a messenger and write a letter to them for help? Yes, Aurora nodded. She's one of the few among us who have gone the furthest on the path to transcendence. She has her own messenger. I don't expect her to save me, but she should be able to give me some advice. I'm afraid it's very difficult. That mysterious lady said that we can only rely on ourselves. Lumion asked curiously. Us? You mean your pen pals? Aurora nodded and asked in confusion. When did I ever mention pen pals to you? Last cycle. No. Last, last cycle. Lumion answered honestly. All right. Aurora faced palm. Actually, it's a mutual support organization slowly established by those of us who can't return home. We rely on letters to communicate daily, share knowledge, and solve problems. There will be small-scale gatherings or communication through messengers. She's the vice president of our organization and one of the initiators. Her code name is Hila. Code name? Lumion was a little puzzled. Aurora tersely acknowledged. In the organization, everyone uses code names without exposing their real names. When they write letters, they emphasize that it's a pseudonym to avoid being discovered by the officials. What's your code name? Lumion was very curious. Aurora was silent for a moment before she replied with a sigh. Muggle. What does it mean? Lumin was puzzled. Aurora's eyes darkened as she replied, Ordinary person without superpowers. Lumion knew that his sister wanted to become an ordinary person living back home more, so he quickly changed the topic. What's the name of your organization? Aurora's expression became complicated. Originally, everyone wanted to give it a classy name, but considering that we would write letters every day, a name that was too conspicuous would attract the attention of certain forces. Therefore, in the end, we decided on a name that sounds like a group of animal lovers. What is it? Lumion pressed. Aurora replied in embarrassment. The Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. Chapter 49. True Cogitation. Lumion couldn't help but suppress his laughter at the name of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society but he managed to hold it in. But even if he held it in, he couldn't help but say, those who know will understand that you're studying curly-haired baboons. Those who don't know will think that a group of curly-haired baboons are doing research. Of course, he was only joking. Aurora rolled her eyes at him. We often tease ourselves as a group of curly-haired baboons being studied. Seeing that his sister was in a better mood, Lumion asked, are all the members of your research society beyonders? Not all of them, Aurora answered briefly, but some gatherings can't be attended by ordinary people. She didn't say why they couldn't participate. Who's the president? How many vice presidents are there? Lumion asked. Are you doing a census? Aurora snapped back. Huh? Lumion was confused and realized that Aurora didn't like him asking too many questions about the curly-haired baboons research society. Aurora pouted and exhaled. The president's code name is Gandalf. There are a total of five vice presidents. All right, I'm going to summon Hila's messenger. Lumion was puzzled and asked, Aurora, uh, Grand Sua, didn't you say that you only know the code name Hila and don't know her exact name? How are you going to summon her messenger? He remembered that his sister had just mentioned that by changing the last sentence of the summoning incantation to the messenger that belongs to so-and-so, he could very accurately pinpoint the target creature. However, she didn't know who so-and-so was. Excellent, Aurora praised him and said. To be able to discover the problem is an excellent learning quality. Let's put it this way. It doesn't matter what name you use when you sign a contract with a spirit world creature. The contract will automatically extract a bit of your true aura from you, allowing the two parties to be related. However, remember, you can only use the name written when you sign the contract in the future. 
changing it to your real name will be ineffective. Lumion pondered seriously and said, Got it. The key is the aura and connection. The name when signing the contract is only equivalent to the incantation used for the subsequent summoning. It doesn't matter what you write. Yes, Aurori nodded. Lumion suddenly laughed. Is there such a situation? Let me say, hypothetically. Grand Sur, you obtained an exact incantation and summoned a messenger. You signed a contract with it in the name of Aurore Lee. After that, you taught me that incantation because you loved your younger brother, which is me. As for me, I successfully summoned another messenger. However, when signing the contract, I used Aurore Lee's name to sign it for fun. Then the question is, which one will be summoned with the description of the messenger that belongs to Aurore Lee? Aurore's face turned livid. I don't have a messenger. How would I know? She exhaled and calmed herself down. This is actually a confusion caused by having the same name. Compared to ordinary contracted creatures that can only be summoned by oneself, it's indeed easy for a messenger that can be summoned by others to have such problems. However, because I don't have a messenger, I'm not sure if there's a special mechanism to avoid such mistakes. I can only use my knowledge to attempt an analysis. First, very few people have a messenger. The probability of having the same name is so low that it's almost negligible. Second, if there's an overlap in names, you can place an item with the messenger's owner's aura in the summoning ritual and use it to accurately lock onto them. Third, if you're really afraid of having the same name, you can make your name longer when signing a contract. For example, Lumian Torres Ari Lanos Arthur Germain Sparrow Lee. That way, you probably won't have the same name. But it's very likely that I'll forget this name after signing the contract. It's too difficult to remember. Lumian muttered, Also, why did you add the name of the pirate hunter and great adventurer? Because I like it. Madame Forrest Wall's adventurer series is a classic, Aurora said confidently. She turned around and tidied up the altar, preparing to officially hold the summoning ritual. At that moment, Lumian thought of something and shouted, Wait a minute. What's wrong? Aurori turned around, looking confused. Lumin asked seriously, Does the messenger count as an outsider? Aurori was confused at first, but quickly figured out the problem. She deliberated and asked, You mean that, as an outsider, the messenger will fall into a cycle after coming to Kordu and won't be able to leave? Without waiting for Lumin's reply, Aurori came up with a new theory. No, the situation will be worse. It's a contracted creature. After receiving the letter, it will immediately go to Gila. It's equivalent to leaving Kordu. That will cause a restart. After that, it will instinctively attempt to leave again and again, while we restart again and again. We won't have time to investigate the key to the loop. Lumian couldn't help but imagine the scene his sister had described. Just as he opened his eyes to see his familiar bedroom, he would open his eyes again to see the familiar bedroom only to open his eyes again to see the familiar bedroom. He would repeat this action countless times, and the root cause of this was that a certain messenger was in a hurry to go home. Aurori raised her hand to cover her forehead. I can't even imagine what kind of changes will happen then. After sighing, she analyzed seriously. From the current situation, the departure of living things from Kordu and the surrounding area will cause the loop to restart, and inanimate objects won't trigger the restrictions. The telegram and the letter that were sent are proof. If that's the case, spirits definitely won't do either. From the looks of it, I can't summon the messenger. Lumian suddenly figured out why the Levere Blue could maintain its state of having its words cut out. The pieced together notes had left Kordu, making it no longer affected. Since it couldn't return, it naturally couldn't return to its original state. He shared his speculation with his sister and asked, The problem with Levere Blue has been solved. But how did that letter get sent? There's definitely no way to send it out during the loop. The moment the messenger leaves Kordu, it will cause a reboot. And if it's before the loop, I have no impression of it. What about you? Neither do I. Aurori thought for a few seconds before jokingly scolding. You idiot. You almost led me astray. It's easy to send a letter in the loop. Lumin looked at his smart sister and asked, Huh? Aurori chuckled before explaining, there's no need for a postman to send a letter. 
nor is there a need to hire a messenger. When we discover an abnormality and don't want to alarm those who might be problematic, the best choice is to find a wooden box and place the distressed letter inside. After sealing it, we will throw the wooden box into the river outside the village and let it float downstream naturally. When the other villages and even the people of Dariaj pick it up, they will help us deliver it to the officials. You said that our last cycle confirmed that the loop contains a small portion of the river that can be reached. That's right, Lumin exclaimed, pressing his palms together. He thought of another question. Will the fish in the river cause a reboot? I don't think so, Aurora replied after thinking for a moment. These creatures without any intelligence are very sensitive to invisible restrictions. Or rather, they're more prone to invisible influences. There's a high chance that they'll instinctively stay away from places that might cause a reboot. What about your white paper? It has no choice but to leave the real world after 12 hours. Lumian felt that this would also restart the cycle. Aurora looked around and said thoughtfully, I suspect that the loop not only includes Kordu and the surrounding mountainous areas, but also the area that corresponds to everyone here in the spirit world. You probably don't know that there are actually more natural interactions between the spirit world and reality. If you don't include the corresponding spirit world, it might restart every now and then, but the current situation is clearly different. As my contracted creature, White Paper has a direct connection with Kordu. The spirit world it roams is most likely included. I still don't know enough about mysticism. Lumian didn't ask further. Aurora demonstrated the ritualistic magic process again and dispelled the wall of spirituality. In the formless wind that suddenly blew, she said to Lumian, It's already dark. I'll teach you true cogitation and the way to activate spirit vision. Okay, Lumian replied, showing that he had his sister's full attention. Aurora explained, You've long grasped the first half of cogitation. Let's start from the second half. When you imagine the sun, retract your spirit and enter a relatively calm state. Let your mind be slightly empty. Draw an outline of something that doesn't exist in reality to replace the sun. Keep drawing and repeating until your body and mind obtain peace. Your thoughts will have a feeling that they are floating. Lumian didn't quite understand. Something that doesn't exist in reality? Aurora took out a pen and paper and drew a few strokes. Look, is there anything like this in reality? The paper had something very abstract on it, like a ball with eyes and a cross on its face. Doesn't it exist once you draw it? This drawing is in reality. Lumian felt that his sister's explanation was wrong. Pictures and imaginations aren't real. Aurora rolled her eyes. As her younger brother's teacher, she had to suffer this kind of anger often. Lumian acknowledged her comment tersely. Then I'll try using this picture of yours. He pulled up a chair and sat down. He leaned back and focused. The crimson sun quickly outlined itself in his mind, gradually calming him down. After a while, because he was in reality, he did not hear the terrifying and mysterious voice. He could calmly use the pattern that his sister had casually drawn to replace the sun in cogitation. The ball with eyes and a cross quickly appeared in Lumian's mind. As Lumian repeatedly outlined it, his body and heart became more and more peaceful, and his thoughts gradually felt ethereal. He saw that there was a faint gray fog around him. There were many indescribable, non-existent things, and dense colored blocks mixed together. And high in the sky, perhaps deep in the depths, there was a clear light. There's no hurry. The probability of a hunter succeeding in cogitation on their first try is very low. Aurora consoled her brother. Just as Lumion was about to report to his sister that he had successfully entered a cogitation state, he suddenly felt something watching him from the depths of the gray fog and an infinite height. This seemed to be an illusion, but it made him break out in a cold sweat. He felt an inexplicable fear and immediately left the cogitation state. Chapter 50 Observation Aurora had intended to reassure him that non-spellcasting sequences usually took several attempts at cogitation to succeed. Some even had to practice for five or six days or even more than half a month. However, when she saw her brother open his eyes, she noticed that Lumian's forehead was drenched in cold sweat, and fear was evident in his eyes. What's wrong? Aurora asked, concerned. Lumian took a couple of deep breaths 
The more he thought about it, the more frightened he became. I successfully cogitated. My mind seemed to float, surrounded by a myriad of colors and an indescribable faint gray fog. There were a few particularly bright and pure beams of light up above. No, it might not have been the sky. It could have been far away, I can't be certain. From your description, it seems like you succeeded, Aurora explained. What your astral projection sees or senses is the spirit world. There, many concepts of reality either don't exist or are intertwined. That's why you feel like you're high in the sky yet far away at the same time. Those seven lights are the seven lights of the spirit world, mentioned in ancient texts. They're believed to be near deity level and omniscient. Moreover, they're considered relatively friendly hidden entities. If you can grasp their complete honorific names, you can pray to them. Unfortunately, I don't know them either. Those indescribable things that roam everywhere belong to the spirit world, but you don't seem to see much, nor did you perceive them clearly. This is likely a limitation of the hunter sequence. Your spirituality isn't high enough. Hmm. Activating spirit vision later will probably prove difficult. The final effect certainly won't be impressive. Still, it's better than nothing. She had been monitoring her brother's condition, ready to intervene in the system at any moment. Seeing Lumion gradually return to normal, she finished what she needed to say in one breath and asked, But what you saw shouldn't have scared you. Aren't you known as Bold Lumion? Lately, you've experienced a time loop. People turning into sheep, men giving birth, and Madame Knight's patrols. How can ordinary spirit world creatures frighten you? Lumion's forehead veins twitched at his sister's words. He didn't want to recall anything, especially anything related to Madame Poilis. He exhaled and said, I sense something deep within the spirit world, or rather extremely high up, observing me. Just being watched by it terrifies me. I couldn't help but exit the cogitation state. Aurora's eyelashes flickered as she thoughtfully said, I suspect it has something to do with the two strange symbols on your chest you mentioned. They involve some hidden entity. They might point to the source of Kordu's loop, or they might represent the special trait that allows you to maintain your clarity and strength in the dream and the loop. As a hunter, you succeeded in complete cogitation on your first attempt. It's highly likely that the two symbols influenced this. Lumian nodded as he listened, agreeing with his sister. This realization left him somewhat disheartened. In that case, I can't cogitate. As soon as I succeed, I'll be watched and forced to leave that state. Besides, I don't think being constantly monitored is a good thing. Do you think you aren't being watched now? Aurora couldn't help but laugh. It's just that you can't sense it without being in a state of cogitation. Since there's no way to evade it and you're bound to suffer damage, it's better to make more attempts to increase your resistance, allowing you to spend more time in cogitation. In the future, when facing certain situations, this might give you an edge. Of course, before becoming a Sequence 7 pyromaniac, hunters don't need deep cogitation. It's best to wait for your spirituality to improve before trying again. Why does that sound a bit depressing? Lumion had already composed himself and mocked his predicament. Since I can't resist, I might as well enjoy it. Aurora scoffed. In our current situation, I'd rather have a unique trait like yours. Even if it means facing numerous unknown dangers and challenges, at least I can retain my memory during the next cycle. I wouldn't need you to remind me, sparing many details. She then looked out the darkened window. It's time to teach you how to activate spirit vision. Keep sitting and attempt cogitation again. You don't have to enter a state where your thoughts are floating. Although that would be more conducive to activating your spirit vision. Aren't there hidden entities watching you? Yeah. Lumion leaned back in his chair, relaxing his body. He first envisioned the sun in his mind, then swapped it out for the ball his sister had sketched haphazardly. He didn't repeat the outlining process, stopping only when his body and mind were serene. Aurora monitored his condition, offering a soothing voice. Lift your hands in your current state and place them in front of your eyes. You can open your eyes now. Lumion kept his cool as he slowly opened his eyes. At some point, his sister had snuffed out the kerosene lamp, casting the first floor into darkness. The crimson moonlight outside the window was the only thing illuminating the outlines of objects. Once his eyes adjusted, he could barely see his hands. Point your index fingers at each other without touching. Then concentrate on the back of your hand, 
which can be the back of the opposite point, Aurora instructed. After completing this step, slowly move your fingers to keep them facing each other without touching. And remember, they can't leave your sight. Lumion followed her guidance, focusing his gaze on the empty space beyond his hands as he moved his fingers. Despite repeating the process countless times, he saw no changes. Soon after, he couldn't sustain the cogitation state and snapped out of it. See anything? Aurori asked. Lumion shook his head. It's harder for hunters. Don't stress. If it doesn't work now, it'll work later. If it doesn't happen today, it might happen tomorrow. Aurori consoled. Don't fret. Regular folks with high spirituality can achieve their spirit vision after professional training, let alone beyonders. But the results vary. If this loop fails, I can try again next time. But if that doesn't work, there may not be another chance, Lumian thought to himself. He was patient and resilient. After resting and regaining some strength, he tried again. After multiple attempts, he finally saw a fiery red dot emerge from the void between his index fingers. Success! Lumian was thrilled. He turned to his sister. But then he saw a red light radiating from Aurori's body, encompassing it entirely. Didn't you say you could see the different colors of the ether body? Lumian asked, confused. Aurori asked excitedly, Did it work? Lumian nodded and recounted his experience. It's a success. Aurori breathed out a sigh of relief. You're impressive. It's probably due to your special enhancement. Other hunters would need at least two weeks of practice, and some might have to reach sequence 8 before they can activate their spirit vision easily. You can only see a vague ether body. The red color means I'm healthy. You won't be able to see much else with your soul body's current strength as a hunter. She pulled out a tiny ink bottle and unscrewed the cap. Let's see if you can see white paper. Lumion focused and saw a transparent bubble emerge from the bottle. It was similar to the bubbles he made while blowing soapy water, about the size of a fist and tinted red by the moonlight. He could barely keep track of it and feared losing sight if he blinked. The bubble floated towards Aurori's palm, which she scratched with her thumb, causing it to contract and expand. Lumion composed himself and reported what he saw to his sister. It's blurry? Aurori shook her head. A hunter's spirit vision is limited. You can only perceive basic ether body concepts and creatures like white paper. Most things are invisible. It's better than nothing, Lumin replied with what his sister had just said. Having never experienced a stronger spirit vision, he was rather content with his current situation. Aurora instructed Lumian to use cogitation to stop his spirit vision from deactivating and to establish simple activation and deactivation triggers. Lumian practiced repeatedly until he mastered the method, but never succeeded in the express key Aurora mentioned. He only vaguely understood the concept. Take a break. We'll monitor the deputy padre later for any anomalies, Aurora advised. Noticing Lumian's pale face from depleted spirituality, she urged him to rest. They ascended to the second floor and lit the lamp in the study. Lumian dozed off in a recliner while Aurora read, waiting for night to deepen. Lumian quickly fell asleep in the recliner while Aurora casually read her book, waiting for the night to get deeper. Lumian eventually fell asleep and forced himself to remain sleeping instead of exploring the dream world. Aurora woke him up shortly after. We can observe the deputy padre now. Okay, Lumian sat up and faced his sister. Aurora opened a miniature ink bottle and stroked white paper with her right hand, her eyes darkening. With the aid of the contract she recited in Hermes, my contracted creature bear the uniqueness of my eyes. Lumian couldn't understand or see anything without his spirit vision. He waited patiently. In mere seconds, Aurora withdrew her hand and sat down. White paper is on its way to the deputy padre's house. Lumin inspected the scene and noticed that his sister's eyes reflected trees swaying in the dark, not the study or himself. The trees were left behind swiftly. That's what white paper sees? Lumian realized. Aurora took out a mirror coated in mercury and sprinkled it with light white powder. The powder quickly bloomed with light, covering the mirror with an aqueous layer. In the water, the deputy padre... Mikhail Garug appeared. White paper had reached the target's room and peered through a glass window. Mikhail Garug slept soundly, his eyes closed 
and breathing steady. Aurora and Lumian waited patiently, observing from all angles with white paper. Suddenly, Mikhail opened his mouth slightly, and a blurry, transparent figure emerged. It was a lizard-like thing. Chapter 51 Temporal Node The thing that slithered out of Deputy Padre Mikhail Garou's mouth was slender and covered in scaly brownish-green skin, like a diaphanous and fuzzy lizard. As soon as it left Mikhail's body, its dark green vertical eye darted left and right, vigilantly sizing up its surroundings. While doing so, it even peered out the window, but didn't detect white paper. Instead, Lumion and Aurore sensed the coldness and indifference in its eyes. What's this? Lumion asked. Aurore shook her head. I don't know. It looks like a special spirit. Lumion immediately judged. It sure doesn't look like something good. Even through white paper in the mirror, the lizard-like creature still made him feel uneasy, and his hair stood on end. Aurora glanced at him and reminded, This lizard seems to possess an ability that leads to a degree of mental corruption. Just looking at it from afar makes one feel uncomfortable. If you stare at it for too long, you might end up with mental problems. You must be careful. If the discomfort is serious, immediately close your eyes and try cogitation. Get your mind right before looking again. It's fine for now, Lumion tersely acknowledged. What about you? Don't you feel uncomfortable? Aurore smiled and replied, As a mystery prior, I've seen things more corrupting than this. My resistance is much higher than yours. Besides, don't I go crazy occasionally? It doesn't seem to matter even if I go crazier a little more intensely and frequently. I think it's necessary to check your mental state when you said that last sentence. Lumian said, half concerned and half joking. Aurore chuckled. That's called being self-deprecating. Sometimes, it's not as if I can stop looking just because I want to. The mystery prior's eyes are special and can't be completely sealed. I can only barely prevent it from affecting my daily life. As the siblings spoke, the blurry lizard-like creature crawled along the wall and floor at an extremely fast speed to the bottom floor of the house. A few animal skulls hung on the wall opposite the door on the first floor. They were from wolves, deer, and wild boars. The deputy padre, Mikhail Garug, was an Akordu native. He ought to have lived in the cathedral, but Gilum Bennett had prevented him from doing so using an excuse. He could only rent a place from the hunter, Sabate. The lizard burrowed into the wolf's skull and kept entering and exiting the socket. Not long after, it switched to the wild boar's skull and continued doing the same thing. After coming out of the deer's pale white skull, the lizard crawled out of the house at a speed several times faster than a galloping horse. White paper quietly floated in the night sky and followed it. The lizard crawled all the way out of the village and finally arrived at the square. It circled around the cathedral and arrived at the cemetery before plunging into a grave. Ten seconds later, it crawled out and entered another tomb with a tombstone. Just like that, the strange lizard-like creature moved through different graves. Lumion could even imagine the scene of it entering and exiting different human skulls in the coffins. That scene made Lumion's skin protrude with tiny goosebumps. He couldn't help but ask, What is this guy doing? Incomprehensible. Aurora slowly shook her head. It's a blind spot in my knowledge. After touring the cemetery, the lizard-like diaphanous creature returned the way it came and entered Mikhail Garug's room. It burrowed into Mikhail's mouth and disappeared. After 20 to 30 seconds, Mikhail Garug opened his eyes and sat up. He gulped down water from the cup on the bedside table, looking extremely parched. He put down the cup, wiped his mouth, and fell back to sleep. Aurora turned her head and looked at Lumion. How is it? There's indeed something wrong with him, right? How is this a problem? This is a huge problem. Lumion didn't hide his emotions in front of his sister. Pierre Berry, who grazes humans. The Padre, who's key to the time loop. Madame Poilis, who makes men give birth. Naroka, who went to Paramita. An owl, who has lived for countless years. And a deputy Padre, who has a lizard living in him. Aren't there too many extraordinary individuals in Cordu? During the loop... Lumion had griped about how little help Brian, Leia, and Valentine, the three official investigators, had been. 
In hindsight, how could he blame them? The abnormalities in Kordu were truly exceptional. They might have taken action, but the results were probably unsatisfactory. Aurora glanced at her brother, half warning and half teasing. You haven't mentioned the most remarkable person yet. The only one in the village who can remember the loop and possess a unique dream ruin. Lumion was speechless and felt a headache brewing. Aurora turned to the mirror on the table, contemplating. I don't expect any significant changes with the deputy padre. Although I could examine his astral projection more thoroughly, it could be hazardous. It's fine if it endangers me, because I'll be another living warlock in the next cycle. But we need more information. We should wait until we have enough before prying deeper. Starting the loop prematurely would waste time explaining and communicating. Lumion agreed, sharing her perspective. Aurora then suggested, I plan on having white paper monitor the Padre now. Lumion was taken aback. Didn't you just say we shouldn't pry deeper to avoid triggering the abnormality prematurely? The Padre was the linchpin to the mystery. Wasn't it reckless to rush in like that? Aurora smiled at Lumion. I'm sure what I'm doing is safe. Noticing Lumion's confusion and worry, she elaborated. You heard the Padre and Pons Bennett's private conversation on April 1st during the previous cycle. The Padre claimed to be an ordinary person, but he had a way to deal with me, a beyonder. Based on the corresponding scene and the fact that there was no reason to lie to an ordinary person like you, I believe the Padre was truly powerless before April 1st. Today is March 29th, and we haven't crossed midnight, so it's safe to spy on him. Lumion felt relieved. That makes sense. Aurori continued. From their conversation, I deduced that the Padre found a way to quickly gain Beyonder powers on April 1st. If he senses danger, he can become a Beyonder instantly. Maybe he has an item that can deal with me. Additionally, the Padre's strength at the Lent celebration didn't match that of a Sequence 9. I suspect he's taking a path beyond the divine paths the mysterious woman mentioned. He's probably praying to a certain entity for a blessing. Otherwise, he wouldn't have grown so powerful in just a few days without any noticeable inclination to losing control. Lumion listened quietly and suddenly recalled something. On the morning of Lent during that cycle, I had just become a hunter when I ran into Pons Bennett. I wanted to test myself by fighting him, but he ran away as if he knew I had become a beyonder beforehand. Maybe he had also received a blessing and could sense danger. Lumion added another crucial point. It was probably April 3rd when I saw Pons Bennett enter Naroka's house during her funeral. If he had already received the blessing, he wouldn't have failed to detect spying from an ordinary person like me, considering his keenness on the morning of Lent. Aurora nodded. In other words, it's highly likely that the Padre's group became beyonders between Naroka's funeral and Lent, between April 3rd and the morning of April 5th. Of course, we can't rule out the possibility of them receiving blessings in batches, Aurora added. The situation became clearer after this discussion. Lumion smacked his forehead and sighed. What's wrong? Aurora asked, confused. Lumion praised her. I should have discussed these things with you earlier. You're much better at analyzing than I am. Aurora chuckled. You sure know how to praise me in various ways. You're inexperienced and lack knowledge so you didn't think of it immediately. You would have discovered these details sooner or later. Although she dismissed her brother's praise, her pleased expression was evident. White paper flew towards the Bennett residence at Aurori's command. The Bennett residence was the tallest and most lavish in Cordu, aside from the cathedral and the castle's modified administrator's residence. It was a grayish-blue three-story house with a chimney on top. As the head of the Bennett family, the Padre lived in a room on the top floor's east wing. The dark gray curtains were tightly drawn, and the master of the house appeared to be asleep. This wasn't a problem for white paper. It slipped through the wall and blended into the darkness in the corner. In the room, Guillaume Bennett, who had finished his affair with Madame Poilice, was sitting in a recliner, staring at the curtain in front of the window, dressed in light blue pajamas. Aurore's eyes darkened, revealing Guillaume Bennett's aura, the red, green, purple, and blue colors made Lumion dizzy. Recalling his sister's teachings, he tried to differentiate between them and realized that the Padre's body was relatively healthy except for his overzealous desires. What's he thinking about? Which mistress to meet tomorrow? 
Lumion mocked him, even though the Padre couldn't hear him. At that moment, Guy Lumbinet stood up and punched the air in front of him. It's all your fault! Chapter 52 Entering the Ruins It's all your fault! It's all your fault! Damn it! Son of a bitch! Guy Lumbinet's fists continued to hit the air, his rage boiling over at a seemingly invisible creature. His expression was twisted with hatred and he didn't bother to suppress his emotions. Aurora narrowed her eyes and gestured for white paper to investigate the area. But there was nothing there, just empty air. Lumion clicked his tongue in annoyance. He's been itching for a fight for a while now. Who's he blaming? Aurora shook her head and casually replied, Maybe it's a bishop holding him back, stopping him from rising in rank and gaining extraordinary abilities. Or perhaps someone lured him into secretly worshipping a hidden entity hoping to receive blessings and grow stronger. She considered that, as the subdeacon of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church, a priest overseeing a rural cathedral, establishing contact with a concealed being wouldn't be easy on his own. When it came to matters of supernatural power, he'd undoubtedly turn to the Dariaj region's church. The associated occult artifacts and sorcery grimoires would be handed over to the Inquisition for safekeeping or even sealing. They wouldn't be left at Cordus Cathedral. More importantly, it was impressive enough that he could command ancient Faisak. Languages capable of summoning supernatural forces like Hermes and Elvish weren't something a subdeacon like him would encounter. And Aurore, through the Eye of Mystery Prime, had long determined he wasn't someone with innate spiritual prowess who would unintentionally attract malevolence. Thus, without a certain someone's guidance, how could the Padre come into contact with a hidden existence? Aurore considered the possibility that Guillaume Bennett had come into possession of a mysterious item without turning it over. Lumion laughed at the idea. Can't the Padre gripe over that hidden existence? He even dared to make Saint Sith feel aggrieved. It's not impossible for him to blame that hidden existence for enticing him. After mocking Guillaume Bennett, Lumion analyzed seriously. I've been thinking about why the Padre suddenly fell into corruption. There are two suspects. The first is Madame Poilis. She's obviously very powerful. Whether it's Louis Lund who gave birth in the castle, or the woman suspected to be her in the wilderness surrounded by the undead, it shows that she's not simple. She's involved in abnormal pathways and hidden existences. It's possible that she enticed the Padre. By the way, Lumian smacked his head. What's wrong? Aurori didn't know what her brother had realized. Lumion replied solemnly, Do you think the Padre has ever given birth to Madame Poilis' child? Aurori was filled with regret for believing her brother was on the brink of an important discovery. She snapped, Who told you that Louis Lund's child is Madame Poilis's? What if it's Administrator Beos? Or in hidden existences? No, no. If it was you, you would have exploded and turned into a monster when you saw that scene. I just find Madame Poilis to be more dominant in her relationship with the administrator. Before the loop began, Lumion felt that the administrator, Beost, was a little weak. He couldn't keep the butler in check, and couldn't keep an eye on his wife. When he appeared with Madame Poilis, he always tried to please the latter. Lumion originally thought that the administrator loved his wife very much, but now he had a new guess. Do you think the administrator is another fertility tool for Madame Poilis? Perhaps, Aurore held her forehead. The world of mysticism has really broadened my horizons. Many scenes that only exist in novels and imaginations have been realized. In some warped manner. After sighing, she muttered to himself, There seem to be more than one or two children born in the castle. Where are they? Lumion thought for a moment and expressed that he had no idea. Infiltrating the castle and conducting a search was out of the question, not after what happened to Louis Lund and the events in the wilderness. Whatever it took, he wasn't about to cross paths with Madame Poilis again. Aurore felt the same. After their run-in with Madame Poilis, the siblings wanted nothing more than to avoid her at all costs. The Padre grunted in frustration, downing a glass of red wine to take the edge off. He let out a long breath, put down the tall glass, and walked to the bed. It wasn't until the Padre's breathing eased and he seemed to be asleep that Lumion mocked. Look at him, crashing early. What, 
No late night rendezvous with his mistress? Oh, he doesn't smoke in private either. This was inferred from the absence of cigar cases, pipe, and other items in the bedroom. Aurore chuckled and said, He doesn't drink much alcohol either. Everyone says he's a pillar of propriety. She dispatched white paper to scout the bedroom. Finding nothing, it returned as instructed. Aurore turned to Lumian. You only mentioned one suspect. What about the other? That sneaky owl, always watching, never acting. Lumian voiced his guess. It might have led the Padre to the legendary warlock's legacy. Hmm. Aurore felt that the possibility was quite high. Lumian then suggested, If that owl pays me another visit, we capture it and interrogate it. You sure you can take down an owl that's lived for centuries? Aurora smirked. I've got you, haven't I? Lumion flattered his sister. Aurora scoffed. Our chances aren't great, even with both of us. But we can't just sit around and do nothing. We need to find out what's going on before it's too late. As long as we don't interfere with the advent of the Twelfth Night, we'll be fine. Lumion nodded heavily. Aurora noticed his exhaustion and reached for white paper, who had returned. You've been using your spirit vision too much today. Get some rest. We'll continue tomorrow. She paused for a moment before continuing. In the morning, I'll teach you the basics of the Hermes language. Then, in the afternoon, go see Pierre Barry and have a drink. I'll sneak into his sheep pen and see if I can get any useful information from his three sheep. She thought this was the easiest route to investigate. Isn't that too risky? Lumian asked, already on his feet. Aurore reassured him with a smile. Don't worry, I won't pick a fight. I just need to talk to them in Highlander. It shouldn't raise any alarms. They might know something useful. Lumian nodded. I'll head to Old Tavern tomorrow afternoon. I'll try to get to know the three foreigners. They could be valuable allies. Of course, you have to be careful not to reveal their identities as Beyonders. Okay, Aurore agreed with her brother's plan. Lumian woke up in his dream bedroom, shrouded in a faint gray fog. As he expected, all the gold, silver, and copper coins, as well as the axe and pitchfork he had collected, were gone. The cycle had reset the dream. I have to gather them again? Lumian muttered to himself as he left the bedroom and headed to the study. He picked up the Lever Blue from the table and flipped through it idly. Many of the words had been cut out. Indeed, I was the one to send the request for help. He no longer felt anything about being the one who had sent the request for help. He suspected that Aurore had guided him in sending the request. After all, he had no knowledge of mysticism back then, so he would have relied on a reliable messenger or a postman. Speaking of which, Lumion realized that the postman who came once a week wasn't in the loop. He figured that the officials probably prevented ordinary people from entering Cordu after receiving the letter. Lumion looked around for a box to store the letter, but he couldn't remember how many similar items Aurore had in her collection, so he gave up. He got dressed in a way that didn't affect his movements, grabbed his iron black axe, and headed out into the wilderness filled with crevices. He walked towards the ruins surrounding the dark red mountain peak. Lumion easily dispatched the two familiar monsters. He slung the shotgun, cloth bag of lead rounds, and assortment of coins. He moved forward cautiously, deliberately avoiding the path he had taken before, knowing that he was not prepared to face the three-faced monster. As he made his way through the collapsed buildings and thin gray fog, the constantly alert him took a sniff. He caught a whiff of blood. After some thought, Lumion sneaked into the shadows and hid in a hidden space on the top of a half-collapsed house, peering through a gap between a few rocks. In the distance, amidst the barren, rubble-filled wasteland, he saw a lump of flesh slowly wriggling towards a building. The flesh was mixed with yellow fat, as if a creature had been crushed by a falling boulder. Lumion pondered how to deal with such a monster. Should I behead it? But it doesn't even have a head. Suddenly, several dark black fleshy ropes appeared out of nowhere and bound the blob of flesh tightly. Chapter 53 Mark Tentacles? Lumion was momentarily dumbstruck before recognizing the appendages that ensnared the fleshy mass. He knew Aurore's novels well and had seen all the illustrations. Not only did he recall every melodramatic scene, 
but he also grasped concepts typically beyond his ken, such as monstrous tentacles. Seven or eight inky tendrils enveloped the fleshy lump, dragging it towards the crumbled building. A figure emerged from the chaos of strewn rubble. The creature bore a humanoid form, its upper body and feet bare, clad only in black pants, but it lacked a head, sporting only a remnant of a neck. A whirl of razor-sharp teeth filled the cross-section, and its crimson skin gleamed between them. Lumion couldn't help but imagine a human whose head and half their neck had been replaced by some bizarre, gaping orifice. He shook his head, unable to locate a weak point for attack. Seven or eight fleshy tentacles sprouted from the monster's maw, swiftly hauling the fleshy mass before it and hoisting it up. The creature's neck mouth blossomed open like a morning glory. Its pearly needle-like teeth clamped onto the flesh, swallowing it whole like a snake devouring its prey. Lumion scoffed silently. So you still need to eat. Thought you guys could survive without food? He then fell into deep thought. Monsters should be common in these ruins. Food must be scarce. So some monsters feed on others, like now. Or maybe everyone's both hunter and prey. Could I lure an unbeatable monster to others and exploit the chaos? Theoretically, yes, but it's risky. They might just team up to kill me first. As Lumion mulled it over, he noticed the monster's chest, heaving from the effort of digestion, was beginning to swell and contract, as though it was undergoing intense digestion. This attracted Lumion's attention and made him realize that the monster's chest was anything but ordinary. Three black seal-like marks adorned its pectorals and base of the neck. What? Lumion's pupils dilated instinctively, straining for a better look. He'd seen something similar on the Padre. At the end of the Lent celebration, the Padre's body had swelled, tearing his clothes to reveal a black mark. Upon closer inspection, Lumion confirmed that the three black seals on the monster matched the Padre's. Composed of cryptic words and symbols, they seemed to connect with an ineffable realm. The difference? The Padre bore at least 11 or 12 marks, whereas the monster had only three. What's the deal with these marks? Are they bestowed by a hidden power? And the more you have, the greater the boon? Lumion wondered, perplexed. He tried in vain to memorize the markings, but couldn't in such a short time. Without pen or paper, he couldn't reproduce them either. The monster finished digesting the fleshy mass. It swung its arm, shaking the fleshy tentacles beside its mouth orifice. The mark beneath its neck glimmered, and a low hum emanated from its chest. The sound swelled, evoking a maelstrom of air tearing through a beehive. Whistling in and out of countless tunnels, the trumpet-like orifice gaped wide, amplifying the maddening drone. The cacophony grated on Lumion's nerves, making him itch to pummel the beast. Your noise is unbearable, you know that? As rage coursed through his veins, Lumion acted on impulse, leaping from the partially collapsed rooftop, shotgun in hand. Bang! Lumion hit the ground hard, his eyes locking onto the monster's gaping maw, filled with razor-sharp teeth. He was about to rip the other party a new one for being a stubborn old pig, but serenity gripped him like a vice. He felt helpless, like a bystander who had been thrust onto the stage of a deadly play. The monster's blood-red mouth was trained on him, and it made no sound. Can I say that I'm sorry? That it's a misunderstanding? He muttered, his voice barely audible. He suspected that there was something wrong with the noise just now, causing him to lose his mind. He jumped out of his hiding spot and tried to attack, but it was too late for apologies. He had to make a choice. Fight or flee. With his experience, Lumion knew that running was not an option. The monster was unscathed and ready, its eight tentacles raised and poised for attack. Therefore, if he really wanted to escape, he had to fight before finding an opportunity. If he wanted to survive, he had to fight. Without hesitation, Lumion raised the shotgun in his hand, loaded with lead bullets. Bang! The monster was caught off guard by Lumion's speed and decisiveness. It had no idea what the shotgun was and didn't stand a chance as it was pelted with lead bullets. Ah! It howled in pain, its mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth opening instinctively. Its chest was a bloody mess, 
including the black mark on its right side. However, the black mark seemed to be engraved in its blood and flesh. It was still clearly visible and remained unharmed. Lumion didn't revel in the monster's screams. He quickly repositioned himself and pulled out a new round from his bag. But before he could take aim again, the black mark on the creature's left side glowed, and it vanished into thin air. Just like that, it disappeared in front of Lumion. Had it escaped or turned invisible? He racked his brain for answers from the various novels Aurora had written and the mysticism knowledge she had taught. Lumion searched frantically for any sign of it, but it was gone. This scene and difficulty that he had never faced before made Lumion panic. He wanted to take the opportunity to escape and subconsciously take a few steps back. Lumion's ankles were suddenly yanked, and he lost his balance, flipping over and hanging upside down. Dark, fleshy tentacles appeared out of nowhere, wrapping tightly around Lumion's legs and hoisting him up. The monster was right in front of him, its black mark glowing on its right side. The vortex-shaped mouth filled with white, razor-sharp teeth widened to reveal a blood-red interior. The stench was overwhelming, and Lumion felt dizzy as he hung upside down. He could see the blood-colored skin of the monster's mouth and countless teeth. Thinking quickly, he grabbed one of the tentacles and wrapped it tightly around his arm. In his hanging state, he aimed a shotgun at the monster's mouth and fired. Bang! The monster screamed as flesh and blood spewed from its mouth. It flung Lumion away, and its body turned transparent before vanishing once again. Lumion hit the ground and rolled before getting back up, determined to find his target. Suddenly, he caught a whiff of blood approaching him. Without hesitation, he leapt in the opposite direction. Dark tentacles emerged from the air where he had been standing, but they missed their mark. The monster reappeared three to four meters away, its vortex-shaped mouth wide open, ready to strike. Lumion loaded his shotgun with lead rounds, but the black mark on the monster's left side glowed and it vanished again. Invisibility. It's indeed invisibility. Lumion instantly made a judgment. Coupled with his previous encounter, he believed that this invisibility could not hide his scent and would lose its effect once he entered an attack state. After figuring it out, Lumion calmed down and mocked inwardly. How can you be invisible if you can't even hide your scent? Capturing traces was a hunter's forte. Lumion regained his composure and calmly surveyed his surroundings as he circled the area. Soon, he spotted the monster's footprints and caught the scent of blood in its unmistakable stench. Using these clues, he dodged the monster's attacks and fired his shotgun, but it seemed to have no vital points. The creature only grew weaker after being hit multiple times. With the lead rounds running low, Lumion quickly thought of a solution. In just a few seconds, he had an answer. He had scouted the area beforehand and found several natural traps that could be used, including one that would be perfect for this monster. As two faint footsteps appeared in the distance, Lumion turned and ran, narrowly avoiding the dark, fleshy tentacle that missed its target. He kept running, occasionally looking back to make sure the monster was still chasing him and to avoid any attacks. The monster's noise only fueled Lumion's anger making him want to turn around and attack with his axe, but he reminded himself that his goal was to kill the creature, not just vent his frustration. Fortunately, he remembered that his goal in running was to kill that guy. At the moment, he wasn't really running away. Anger and frustration didn't change his plan. It only made him more motivated. Thud, thud, thud. Finally, he spotted the half-collapsed building and rushed inside, stopping at the edge and pretending to lie in ambush. Soon, he heard the shallow footsteps of the monster approaching, along with its stench and blood. Lumin estimated the distance of the tentacle and took a couple of steps back. With a swing of his axe, he struck a stone pillar that was about to collapse and then kicked it hard, using the reaction force to roll back. The half-collapsed building couldn't withstand the impact and crumbled, a cascade of heavy rocks filling the passage. Boom! The monster, hiding and ready to attack let out a fierce scream that lasted only a second before it was silenced forever. Chapter 54 Interpretation Lumion rolled away before springing back to his feet. The sudden scream and its abrupt end brought him a sense of relief. Still, he remained vigilant. Shotgun slung and axe in hand, he cautiously approached the collapsed building. Dust swirled in the air where bricks and wooden beams once stood, lingering on. Outside, 
Lumion couldn't spot the monster's corpse. It must be buried beneath the rubble. His sense of smell was compromised in the dusty environment. He raised a hand to shield his nose from the irritants. Given the situation, Lumion retreated several steps, maintaining a safe distance as he patiently waited for the dust to settle. As he stood watch, he scrutinized his surroundings, on alert for any subtle signs of movement or scent. Finally, the air cleared and his vision returned. Lumion entered the wreckage once more, tracking the scent of blood to find the monster crushed beneath heavy stones. With no need to rush, he employed his hunter expertise to methodically remove the rocks, avoiding any secondary collapse. Simultaneously, he kept his guard up against the monster, which might still be alive and awaiting an opportunity to strike. He pulled away another massive stone, revealing the twisted creature, its head neck a mangled vortex, its maw faced the sky, crushed into a gory mess, its chest was flattened, and its sharp mouth impaled on a jagged stone pillar. Several dark, fleshy tentacles had snapped. If not for its distinct features, Lumion wouldn't have recognized the semi-solid mass as his target. The trap had worked better than he anticipated. After confirming the monster's demise, Lumion noticed the three black markings on its chest, still clearly visible despite the carnage. It's so odd. This can't be common, even in mysticism, right? Despite going through his sister's crash course, Lumion still had much to learn. He relied on his intuition for judgment. He had planned to use his knife to remove the skin with the black mark, but the creature's chest was too mangled to salvage anything. After pondering for a moment, he tore a piece of cloth from his linen shirt, using it as makeshift paper. Next, he wrapped another strip around his finger, staining it with the monster's blood. Whether it's sufficiently isolated potential contamination or poison, he couldn't be sure. If anything happened, he'd have to leave the dream quickly, minimizing any damage to reality. He should recover within hours or half a day. Using the blood as ink, Lumion copied the three black marks. As he drew, dizziness struck, and a swelling pain pulsed in his forehead. Lumion surmised from his sister's teachings that his spirituality was nearly depleted. Just copying these marks almost drained me entirely? He was astonished by the bizarre markings and the meager spiritual capacity of a hunter, which he suspected was only slightly greater than a spiritually gifted person. After resting briefly, Lumion continued copying. It took three intermittent attempts before completion, his head throbbing. In his current state, further exploration was impossible. He pocketed the cloth, hoisted his axe, and headed back across the wilderness towards home. Emerging from the ruins, he felt a sense of accomplishment, as if he had absorbed a significant portion of the hunter potion. Looks like it was a successful hunt, Lumion mused. His unsorted experiences bubbled to the surface. Staying calm is crucial. When faced with unexpected prey and no time to prepare, calmness is even more vital. Always observe your surroundings and exploit opportunities. With his thoughts racing, Lumion made his way home, ascended to the second floor and entered the bedroom. He forced himself to memorize the marks for a while before collapsing on the bed in exhaustion. The next morning, when Lumion woke up, his temples were still throbbing a bit. That was a sign his spirituality had been drained in the dream ruins. He shook his head and left the room to splash his face in the bathroom. When he went downstairs, he realized his sister had already made breakfast. Toast with jam, sliced sausages, and strong black coffee. So early? Lumion blurted out in surprise. His sister rarely woke up early. Aurore replied grumpily, realizing we're stuck in a time loop and the people around us are getting weirder and creepier. How can you sleep well? Not me. I've got no choice. Lumion comforted his sister. At least you can really sleep. I've got stuff to do in my dreams. That's true. Aurore picked up the coffee laced with half a packet of sugar and took a swig. After her brother sat down and wolfed most of the toast and sausage, she asked, What did you get out of exploring the dream ruins? Lumion recounted his run-in with the monster and said, Aurore, uh, Grand Sor, help me figure out what those three black marks mean. At the end of Lent, the priest had something similar on him, but even more.
Aurore nodded and took out a fountain pen and a note from a hidden pocket in her beige dress. Lumian began sketching, but he couldn't accurately replicate the black marks. Soon, he handed the note to his sister and introduced. I only memorized it a few times. I can't be sure if some of it's right or wrong. But some of it must be. Here, here, and here are spot on. Just replicating part of the mark had drained a lot of his spirituality. Aurora placed the note on the dining table in front of her and focused on it for a while. These words aren't any I know. The symbols that go with them are more warped than those commonly seen in mysticism, too. Lumin was a little disappointed when Aurora added, Judging by the influence of transcendent words and symbols on the surroundings and the leverage the marks have on natural power, I suspect this is the outward manifestation of a special contract. As she spoke, she tapped the note with her index finger. Contract? Lumian asked. Aurori nodded. Paired with your battle with that monster, each black mark should represent a special contract. The effect of this contract is likely helping it gain a superpower from certain spirit world creatures, creatures from other dimensions or extraterrestrial creatures. So the black mark on its left chest emits light and grants invisibility. The one below its neck corresponds to a voice that makes people frustrated, resentful, and lose their minds. The one on its right chest didn't show anything. I suspect it has something to do with its mouth orifice, tentacles, or digestion. No wonder. Lumion immediately understood some of the details of the previous battle. He then laughed and said, The Padre signed more than ten contracts with different creatures? What does this mean? Everyone can be his daddy? What a strange way to put it, Aurora muttered. From the looks of it, the priest who fought you at the end of Lent didn't even show a tenth of his strength. He probably only used one ability he got through the contract. His body and mind went out of whack for no reason, and he was at your mercy. Lumian didn't get the previous two cycles, but he clearly knew it was luck back then. He eagerly asked, Can I copy the contract obtained from the monster and contact the corresponding creature? He was very envious of that invisibility ability. A contract is a contract, and a ritual is a ritual. Do you know how to conduct a ritual? Aurora doused his enthusiasm. Even if you mastered the ritual, do you know what the price of such a special contract is? The Padre might have only completed it with the blessing of a hidden existence. Aurora paused for a second and muttered to herself, Why does the monster in your dream ruin have such a black mark? Did it also receive the blessing of that entity? As she spoke, Aurora cast her gaze at Lumion's left chest. Could it be related to the blackthorn symbol sealing your heart? The Padre had one too. Hmm. Maybe the thorn symbol represents a hidden existence that created the dream ruin. The key to breaking the cycle might be hidden there. Or maybe reality can only solve the problem by doing something simultaneously with the dream ruin. It's possible, Lumian thought, realizing that this could explain why the monster had a black mark and why the mysterious lady wanted him to explore the dream ruins. He let out an emotional sigh. Aurore, ah, uh, Grand Sur, your imagination is indeed much richer than mine. That's what an author should be like, Aurore replied with a smile. After breakfast, Aurore brought Lumian to the study to teach him Hermes. They ended the lesson around 3 or 4 in the afternoon, only stopping to grab a quick bite to eat. Alright, you can go out and drink with Pierre Barry now, Aurore said, realizing it was time and that no one would suspect them. Lumian acknowledged her instruction briefly and expressed his concern. You must be careful. Aurore was going to take the risk of coming into contact with the three sheep to gather information. Lumian arrived at the dilapidated two-story house where Shepherd Pierre Barry lived and looked around before asking the old woman, Where is Pierre? The old woman, Pierre Barry's mother, Marty, appeared to be in her early fifties but had many wrinkles due to overexertion from work. Her skin was freckled and her black hair had turned gray. She looked almost as old as Naroka. He went to the cathedral, Marty replied. Lumion was alarmed. He went to the cathedral again? Chapter 55 Persona If Lumion remembered correctly, 
Pierre Barry would undoubtedly visit the cathedral to offer his prayers past noon of March 30th. He and Raymond had crossed paths with him during the previous cycle, and Lumian had also encountered him at the village square at a similar hour. However, it was already three or four in the afternoon. When did he leave? Lumian inquired. Marty pondered for a moment and responded, Around the time taken to cover a mile. In the countryside, except for a handful of people, hardly anyone owned a timepiece. Time was generally conveyed through specific activities and indications such as grape harvesting season, the duration of a mile's walk, and so forth. Obviously, if the time frame was brief enough for people to perceive it more distinctly, a few minutes or 15 minutes would be employed in verbal expressions. A mile? That isn't too far. Lumian speculated that Pierre Barry had already gone to the cathedral around noon and had yet to return. One mile in Cordu was equivalent to one kilometer in the Antigen metric system. After bidding farewell to Pierre's mother, Marty, Lumian departed from the Barry residence and proceeded towards the village square. He was unsure whether Pierre Barry had visited the cathedral at noon and returned again in the afternoon, or if something had cropped up delaying his return. If it was the former scenario, Lumian could sense something brewing. It was highly unusual for Pierre Barry to frequently visit the cathedral to meet the Padre. Something dreadful was certainly afoot. If it was the latter scenario, it would be a massive problem. Before Lumian, who retained his memories, and Aurore, who already knew the cycle, made an attempt, the history should remain unaltered. If there were any deviations, it could indicate that the siblings had not completely comprehended the pattern of the cycles, or that there were others who could retain their memories. With this in mind, Lumin heaved a sigh and raised his hand to strike his face. He was so startled that he forgot to inquire if Pierre had visited the cathedral at noon. That was crucial. It was far too suspicious to turn back and ask now. Lumin could only obtain some information from Pierre when they drank together later. He quickly suppressed his frustration and strode towards the square. Upon entering the cathedral of the eternal blazing sun, he saw the padre, Gilum Benet, standing in front of the altar with several sunflowers. He was conversing with a few individuals seated in the front pew. As soon as Lumian entered, Gilum Benet ceased speaking and glanced over. Some plot? Lumian smiled as he approached the altar, observing the individuals listening to the padre's sermon. He spotted Shepherd Pierre Berry, the thug Pons Bennett, and a few of his henchmen. He also saw the Padre's mistress, Madonna Bennett, and Cybel Berry. He was surprised to see a man here, but also found it reasonable. Arnault Andre, Naroka's youngest son, a farmer in his forties. Hello, Pierre. Lumin greeted him with a smile, but he halted midway. The second half of his sentence was meant to be, Aren't you buying drinks? Why are you here? However, he suddenly became vigilant and remembered that this arrangement had yet to occur in this cycle. This was something that had only transpired in the previous cycle. This was the first time Lumian had encountered Shepherd Pierre Barry in this cycle. As Cordu's prankster king, Lumian's reflexes were lightning quick. He promptly altered his posture and extended his arms towards the altar. Praise the sun! Keeping up the facade, his thoughts raced as he conjured up a fresh alibi. After paying homage to the sun and receiving a response from the priest, Lumin pivoted and addressed Pierre Barry, who sat at the front row's edge, gazing at him with bewilderment. I heard you had returned to the village, so I went to your dwelling to seek you out. Lo and behold, you are here in the cathedral. He didn't specify who had informed him, knowing that Pierre Barry would have been spotted en route to the cathedral. With no witnesses to his lie, Lumin had a fallback option, Ava's father the cobbler Guillaume Lizier. Why are you looking for me? Pierre Barry rose to his feet, clad in a dark brown robe, his blue eyes brimming with gentle amusement and perplexity. Lumian had already prepared a plausible excuse. He grinned and responded, I yearn to hear your tales while tending to your flock. Diverse countries, varied hamlets, and sun-dry locales. They must be enthralling. In the past, he had frequently conversed with newly returned shepherds to enrich his knowledge. Without waiting for Pierre Barry's reply, Lumian shifted his gaze from his disheveled and greasy black hair to his brand new leather shoes. Did you make it rich? My current employer was more generous this time, and bestowed upon me quite a few things, Pierre Barry replied with a smile. 
I'll treat you to a drink later. All right. This was precisely what Lumin had been angling for. He even inquired, when will you be heading there? This displayed the panache of a regular patron of Old Tavern. He was unashamed when he came to caging a glass of wine. Pierre Barry glanced at Guillaume Bennett, the priest, and received a corresponding hint. How about after dinner, he suggested. Agreed, Lumine assented readily. Thereafter, under the scrutiny of the shepherd, priest, Pons Bennett, and company, he seated himself in the second pew closest to him. Pierre Barry was momentarily taken aback. Aren't you going back? Lumian beamed. I haven't prayed in ages. I'll seize this opportunity to pray, lest the deity thinks I'm not devout enough. Carry on, carry on. Pretend I'm not here. Saying so, he closed his eyes, lowered his head slightly, and crossed his arms over his chest. Pierre Barry, Guillaume Bennett, Pons Bennett, and the rest exchanged glances, at a loss for words. After patiently waiting for an extended period and observing Lumian still engrossed in his prayer, the priest turned to Pierre Barry, gesturing for him to inquire. Pierre Barry approached Lumian's side and patted his shoulder. How long do you intend to pray? Lumian opened his eyes and stated gravely, I plan to pray until dinner time, since there's nothing else to do. I can make a confession later. Guillaume Bennett's forehead twitched upon hearing this. Gazing at Madonna, Seibel, Pons, Arnault, and the others waiting for him, he exhaled slowly. He signaled to Pierre Barry and gestured towards the door. Pierre Barry comprehended the priest's unspoken message and hastily informed Lumian. I'm done praying. Shall we proceed to Old Tavern now? Absolutely. Lumian stood up, grinning from ear to ear. There was nary a hint of solemnity or piety in his demeanor. Previously, he had discerned that his arrival had impeded the Padre and his accomplices' machinations. In a mischievous attempt to play a prank, he feigned interest and lingered until Pierre Barry was required to depart prematurely. He surmised that the Padre saw through his act, but what use was being the prankster king of Cordu if he didn't create a bit of mischief in such circumstances? He had to maintain his persona to avoid arousing suspicion. Lumian lamented his sister's probable departure to Barry's abode, to confer with the three sheep. Had she been present, he could have dispatched white paper to the cathedral to clandestinely overhear the Padre's scheme and glean valuable information. Perhaps I can undertake this in the next cycle. But would Pierre detect our surveillance? Pierre is no simpleton. He is certainly more capable than an ordinary person like the Padre. Lumian's thoughts raced as he trailed Pierre out of the cathedral and towards the old tavern. In the sheep pen behind the Barry household, Aurore, donned in a white gown, circumnavigated the woods and vaulted the wooden fence. As an alluring woman seldom seen in the village, she had to choose this relatively secluded path, otherwise she would be subjected to small talk, or worse, suspicion. When will I learn the spells of invisibility and shadow concealment? Aurore ruminated wistfully as she advanced towards the three sheep that had huddled beside a haystack. Speaking in Highlander, she said, Do not fret. I am the adversary of Shepherd Pierre Barry. The eyes of the three sheep, whose coats were besmirched with filth, underwent a rapid transformation. Their initial vigilance and apprehension gave way to hope and perplexity. Despite their initial reservations, they did not retreat and permitted Aurore to approach. Aurore continued, I discovered your peculiarities through certain means. You were once human, were you not? The eyes of the three sheep were suddenly imbued with shock, elation, hope, and skepticism. They instinctively bleated. Aurora surveyed them. You cannot speak, but you can write, can you not? One of the sheep was stupefied for a moment before hastily inscribing on the ground. It scribbled a simple Highlander word, yes. The sheep was confirming that they were once human. What transpired? Were you transformed into sheep? Aurora pondered briefly before adding. Write the beginning, middle, and end separately to save time. The three sheep divided the task and inscribed different portions of the narrative on the surface of the soil using their hooves. Before long, they had each completed a sentence. We were caught. A ritual was conducted, swaddled in sheepskin, and metamorphosized into sheep. A ritualistic sorcery that can convert a human into a sheep using sheepskin? Hmm. <laughs> That is decidedly easier than transfiguring a person into a sheep. The only question is, 
Which deity was the ritual invoking? Aurora queried as her mind raced. Did Pierre Barry capture you? Is he alone? She wished to ascertain Pierre Barry's current strength. Yes, one of the sheep responded. The other sheep added more. He has an accomplice. They were both exceedingly formidable. Pierre Barry was already immensely powerful before his return to the village. Aurore suddenly detected something amiss. Why did Pierre Barry appear to be under the sway of Guillaume Bennett, the Padre? Guillaume Bennett was still an ordinary person. Chapter 56 Intuition The more Aurore ruminated on the matter, the more her suspicions intensified. How could the powerless Guillaume Bennett possibly subdue the mighty Pierre Barry? who possessed no less than supernatural abilities. If the Padre was indeed favored by the clandestine force to the extent that his clique considered him their leader, he should have been bestowed with a boon long ago and elevated above the common masses. Should he decline the boon, he would inevitably face ostracism. In these circumstances, his standing, authority, and machinations paled in comparison to his might or the gulf that separated him from divinity. Aurore lacked the luxury of time to ponder this and could only conceive of two plausible explanations. Either Guillaume Bennett was not the true leader of the small group and was merely exploiting his status to orchestrate and conceal the anomaly from the eternal blazing sun church in Dariaj, or he was not rejecting the boon but merely biding his time to attain greater power. Neither explanation boded well. Aurore directed her gaze at the three sheep and inquired, who was the man that accompanied Pierre Barry in his assault on you? The three sheep scribbled down their responses. Niort Best. A shepherd named Niort. He goes by the name Niort. Niort Best, too, has achieved extraordinary power. Aurore was acquainted with the individual in question. Niort was a fellow shepherd from Cordu who frequently grazed his flock alongside Pierre Barry, but he had seemingly not returned early this time. Where is Niort? I did not spot him in the village, Aurori queried. The three sheep moved a few steps away and found a new patch of unmarked soil on which to write. He's dead. I killed him. We took him out, but we were apprehended. Had he fallen victim to a counterattack? Aurori nodded pensively. Are all of you beyonders? The three sheep ceased riding Highlander with their hooves and nodded in assent. Aurori acknowledged them tersely as she raced to process the implications. Pierre Barry and Niort's best are hunting beyonders. What is their motive? And one of them is now dead. Either Niort's abilities paled in comparison to Pierre's, or they had acquired their powers through the boon and were far from proficient in wielding them. It was certain that the beyonder battles would encounter complications. Aurori glanced at the three sheep once more and asked, Do you know why Pierre captured you? The three sheep resumed writing. I have heard of him speak of God and devotion. It may be for a blood sacrifice. I suspect he wants to offer us as a sacrifice to an evil god. Indeed, Beyonders possess remarkably high spirituality and unique characteristics. They are far superior to ordinary mortals as sacrificial offerings, and they can appease malevolent gods more effectively. Pierre Barry and New York Best were using grazing sheep as a ruse to abduct Beyonders from other countries to offer them up as sacrifices. It is a scheme that can easily evade the local authorities' notice. Aurore nodded imperceptibly. She spoke solemnly. Did Pierre mention the honorific name of that god? Or rather, who were they praying to during the ritual that transformed you into sheep? The three sheep were taken aback, as if they were awash in recollections. Suddenly, they lowered their heads and extended their hooves towards the soil before them. For some inexplicable reason, Aurore felt that the temperature had plummeted and the sun had been obscured by dark clouds, as a chilly mountain breeze swept past. The three sheep began riding. Aurore's spiritual intuition sounded a powerful alarm, prompting her to bellow. Hold on! The three sheep lifted their heads and looked at her. At some point, blood-red tears had rolled up in their eyes, and their fur was stained and ghastly. In the next moment, they resumed riding. Aurore whirled around and dashed towards the fence. As she exited the pen and looked back, the three sheep were bathed in the sunlight. If not for the blood stains on their faces, everything seemed entirely ordinary. Thump, thump. Aurora's heart continued pounding. Panting heavily, she breathed a sigh of relief. If I had not learned to seal my sight and glimpse things I should not have seen, I would not have reacted in time. 
She produced a vial of iron black powder and scattered it over the sheep pen. The words etched in the soil vanished as though by an unseen hand. As for the stains on the sheep's faces, Aurora found it challenging to expunge them using spells, so she refrained from approaching them and merely washed them away with water. She feared that the three sheep were different from before and harbored latent dangers. In Old Tavern, Lumian sat at the bar, sipping on light green absinthe, his right elbow propped up casually as he surveyed the room. He searched for the mysterious lady, but she was nowhere to be seen. Nor were Ryan, Leia, and Valentine. Lumian knew not when the former would arrive, and as for the latter three, he assumed they were wandering the village, engaging in idle chatter. Pierre Barry, who had just finished his glass of absinthe, picked up a new pale green liquid and babbled. I had a chance to get married. Is that so? Lumian scoffed. Who would fancy a shepherd? Pierre sighed and replied, Most of the pastures we graze in are owned by manor owners or nearby villages. If we want to graze, we have to pay a ranch tax or marry a village girl and settle down there. Lumian smiled. That's a good thing for a shepherd. Pierre took a sip of absinthe and glanced sideways at Lumian. That girl must fancy you and not ask for dowry. At one time, a lady thought I was not bad and didn't mind that I was a pauper and a shepherd. She was willing to marry me. Was she very foolish? Yes, Lumian nodded honestly. Pierre took another sip of absinthe and was silent for a long time before saying, Later, she died. She worked in a factory in the suburbs and fell ill due to exhaustion. I went to several cathedrals, got the priests to pray for her, and found doctors to treat her but it was useless. After that day, I realized something. Lumian asked, taking a swig of absinthe. What is it? Resentment flashed across Pierre's face as he replied. Those who possess flesh and excrete from their posterior cannot absolve us of our predicament. Lumian asked, So those without flesh and those who do not excrete from their posterior are acceptable? Pierre chuckled. Those are saints and angels, but will they dine to look at us? Lumian tisked. Then why did you go to the cathedral to seek the Padre's counsel? Not only does he possess flesh and excrete from his posterior, but he also indulges in the carnal pleasures with women. Pierre turned his head towards Lumian and cast a sidelong glance. You fail to comprehend. He possesses a certain intellectuality that can redeem our souls. Intellectuality? Lumian struggled to grasp the term. Pierre took another sip of his light green absinthe, seemingly oblivious to the question. Lumian dared not press the matter further and instead inquired, I heard that you visited the cathedral at noon. Why did you return in the afternoon? Pierre's warm smile illuminated his face as he replied, In the afternoon, one can converse with like-minded individuals. He did not deny that he had visited the cathedral at noon. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that for the time being, no one else would retain their memories and disrupt the flow of history. He suspected that Pierre Barry had visited the cathedral at noon to confer with the Padre in advance of their small group discussion scheduled for the afternoon. After their libations and with the sun setting on the horizon, Lumian and Pierre Barry bid each other farewell and returned to their respective abodes. Pons Bennett, the Padre's younger brother, abruptly emerged with a few thugs and obstructed Lumian's way upon him reaching a secluded path. The brawny, raven-haired, azure-eyed Pons Bennett stared at Lumian and smirked maliciously. You were good at pranks in the afternoon, no? Wasting our time in the cathedral? If the padre wasn't there, I would have beaten you up, eh? Bastard. Come and eat Daddy Pons X. Initially taken aback by this imbecile's foolishness, Lumian was elated. His and Aurora's judgment was correct. In the previous cycle, Pons Bennett's likely hadn't acquired supernatural abilities before Naroka's funeral, and thus had no sense of danger. He had actually dared to obstruct a beyonder's path. Without hesitation, Lumian turned and bolted, with Pons and his thugs in hot pursuit. However, as soon as they exited the trail between two buildings, they lost sight of their quarry. Pons Bennett scanned his surroundings and ordered his subordinates spread out in search. He deemed it impossible for Lumian to have fled so swiftly and believed he was hiding nearby. The thugs dispersed and combed the area for any potential hideouts, 
leaving Pons Burnett alone at the trail's entrance. Lumian, who had ascended to the second floor of the adjacent building, chuckled and leapt towards Pons. Bang! Pons was sent hurtling to the ground with tremendous force, gasping for breath and momentarily incapacitated. Had Lumion not restrained himself and struck him directly, he might have broken several bones. Lumion stood up, clasped Pons' forearms, and smiled at him, saying, Come, let us become better acquainted. Before Pons could offer any resistance, Lumion pulled him into his embrace and kneed him. Pons' eyes nearly bulged out of their sockets and his face twisted in agony. Thud! Lumion released him, allowing the man to crumple to the ground like a shrimp. He then turned and darted down the trail, vanishing from sight before the thugs returned. In the kitchen, which also doubled as a part-time living and dining area, Lumion updated his sister on his situation. Pierre Barry visited the cathedral in the afternoon. It's confirmed that Pons Bennett still lacks any superpowers. Aurori nodded slightly and recounted her own experience, particularly the inexplicable danger at the end. Lumion pondered for a moment before remarking, that enigmatic lady claimed that certain entities might corrupt you merely by acknowledging their existence. Chapter 57 Arrangements Aurora recollected the situation and surmised that her brother's account was accurate. She sighed, overcome with emotion, and remarked, To think that such dreadful corruption can be brought about by that concealed entity, worshipped by Pierre Barry and his accomplices. Even the evil deities mentioned in ancient manuscripts fail to elicit such a reaction. Lumin showed no signs of surprise and said, Otherwise, why are we trapped in a time loop? The more Aurori contemplated, the more perplexed she became. She muttered, Is it possible that we have to confront the concealed entity on the twelfth night and defeat it to end a cycle? This would entail gathering ingredients, digesting the potion, and undergoing repeated cycles to become a deity. Lumion interrupted her train of thought as he realized that his sister was becoming increasingly irrational. Stop. It cannot be this extreme. Aurore acknowledged his remark tersely and nodded slightly. You are right. We have, at most, one more cycle. It is impossible for us to become deities within twenty days. She then shrugged and added, There is no hope. Let us wait for death. Even Lumion, who had an inventive mind, struggled to keep up with his sister's thoughts. Aurora exhaled and looked at her brother. All right, I am done venting. Continue. Huh? Lumion appeared puzzled and took a few seconds to understand what his sister meant by continuing. By the look of things, the three transformed sheep are to be offered as sacrifices and brought back to Cordu. It is no surprise that they do not wait until early May. The twelfth night is, in fact, the day of a grand-scale sacrifice to the concealed entity. Aurori's eyes scanned the surroundings, and she said, That was my assumption, but why did the Padre and his accomplices receive varying degrees of blessings before Lent? According to my understanding, it should have been an exchange through sacrifice. And drawing on his malicious perspective, Lumion made a bold conjecture based on the previous cycle's events. A small sacrifice and a grand ritual? At the end of the Lent celebration, the Padre who had obtained extraordinary powers, no longer concealed his abnormality. It is evident that he was planning something significant. After pondering for a moment, Aurora said, The Lent celebration could be a part of the grand ritual. Before the grand ritual, the Padre made up his mind and offered his soul to the evil deity. With a certain amount of offerings, he obtained a plethora of blessings, completely revealing his true colors. By the looks of it, Everyone in Cordu will be implicated once the Lent celebration commences. No one can escape. The siblings exchanged glances and believed that their assumption was close to the truth. However, if the abnormality erupted entirely from the Lent celebration until the twelfth night, how could they patiently wait until the final ritual to find the key to the cycle? There was a high probability that everyone in the village, apart from those who died as sacrifices, would be corrupted. I am only a sequence seven. Aurora covered her face and said, And you are only a sequence nine. They were facing such a dire situation. Based on Lumion's account of the battle at the end of the Lent celebration and Aurora's recent experience hunting black-marked monsters, she knew that she was no match for the Padre who had received the boon. 
She felt that she had to prepare in advance before she could confront Pierre Barry. Lumion had fortunately defeated the mutated Padre in a one-on-two battle. Yet, preventing the Padre and his accomplices from obtaining supernatural powers in advance could avert the Twelfth Night. The cycle would most likely restart in advance. Hell difficulty, hell difficulty, Aurora slammed the dining table with a mournful expression. Without waiting for Lumion's response, she raised her hands and tousled her blonde locks, as if releasing pent-up emotions. After a series of gestures, Aurora composed herself and calmly addressed Lumion. Seek out the trio of foreigners tomorrow morning. You may disclose the abnormality in the village to them. Concealing our status as beyonders is unnecessary. It's very dangerous, Lumion instinctively replied. Was it not natural for wild beyonders to be considered culpable when they encountered officials? Aurora let out a slow exhale and stated, In this predicament, we can't care less. Other than the enigmatic lady, the trio are likely the most reliable individuals in the village. Moreover, each of them possesses strength that is on par with mine, or even surpasses it. We are all in the same boat. Do not underestimate one another. Whether one is a wild beyonder or an official, we must band together. As for the possibility of being hunted down by officials in the future, we shall cross that bridge when we come to it. For now, we must focus on escaping this loop. Lumion had heard his sister use the phrase, all in the same boat, before. He knew it implied that everyone was in a similar predicament and facing the same problem. If something were to happen, no one could escape. They had to stand together. Very well. I will seek them out tomorrow. He assented. Aurora continued, I now suspect that someone else is behind the Padre and Pierre. He is the root of the corruption. Madame Poilise? Lumion guessed. Not only is she powerful, but she is also the Padre's mistress. She can control him in secret and use him to influence the others in the village. But she has no apparent connection to Pierre. Aurora gazed at her brother, frowning in contemplation. From the encounter with the three sheep, Pierre and Niort should have gained supernatural powers when they grazed the plains last October. At the very least, they should have acquired the corresponding knowledge. This is because they did not return midway, so it is impossible to obtain it elsewhere. This means that the abnormality in the village can be traced back to July and August of last year. Did you notice any anomalies? Lumion shook his head slowly. No. He had initially thought that he was thoroughly acquainted with Cordu, but now he realized that the undercurrents had been present for over half a year. This realization filled him with dread and made him feel like a stranger in his own home. What is the problem? Lumin felt as though he was shrouded in layers of fog. He could never discern the truth of the matter. Aurori continued, It could also be that owl. Perhaps the legendary warlock who died is not truly deceased. He may still be hiding somewhere in the village, or perhaps someone who we frequently encounter. He may have already discovered that I am a warlock and deliberately suppressed the legend from me. There are no such restrictions for ordinary individuals like you. Aurora instructed in a low voice. Notify me immediately the next time the owl pays a visit. I will get white paper to track it and determine its whereabouts. Lumion tersely acknowledged his sister's request, indicating that he too was waiting for the owl to appear. This time, I will pluck all your feathers. He cursed inwardly. Aurora pondered for a moment before issuing a third directive. Tomorrow afternoon, I shall extend an invitation to Madame Poilis. The administrator remains at his post, leaving the butler and the servants as the only occupants of the castle. You may clandestinely enter and scour for any clues. If you are successful in persuading the three foreigners in the morning to come, we can get their aid in this operation. She dared not let white paper venture to Madame Poilis's place whilst she was still present. Nevertheless, she could not afford to be distracted whilst in Madame Poilis's company. Thus, she had to rely on her brother. Lumion nodded before advancing the situation. I would advise against being alone with Madame Poilis. I fear she may seize the opportunity to deal with you. 
Shall we invite Nazeli and the others to an afternoon tea gathering? The more individuals present, the safer it would be. Indeed, Aurora deemed it a superior option. She then remarked in a tone that was equal parts apprehensive and teasing. You must exercise caution after infiltrating the castle. I do not wish to end up an aunt. Lumian dared not retort, but gave her a glance that conveyed, I am more concerned about your safety, for Madame Poilis will be with you. During supper, Aurore set white paper free to monitor the sheep pen. She discovered that the three sheep had licked the blood off their faces, preventing Shepherd Pierre from detecting any anomaly. Following that, Lumian resumed his education on mysticism until he fell asleep. He acquired mastery over many Hermes words, including me, name, summon, need, light, and sun. Light served as an incantation to activate the integrity brooch. There were three paragraphs in total. Lumian awoke in the room shrouded in a faint gray mist. He strode to the window and scrutinized the dark red peak and the dilapidated edifices that surrounded it once more. I wonder what secrets lie here, Lumian muttered. As he gazed, a thought suddenly struck him. The ruins contained too many hazardous zones that he either could not or dared not approach. For instance, the lair of the three-faced monster. However, if he could summon a spirit world creature akin to white paper and forge a pack with it, allowing it to infiltrate and observe, he ought to be able to gather more intelligence. His vision, sense of smell, and hearing were all heightened by his beyonder characteristics. In theory, they constituted a kind of supernatural power that could be conveyed upon white paper. As he ruminated, Lumian muttered to himself, The problem now is whether I can summon a spirit world creature in the dream ruins. If I cannot, can I utilize our connection to bring it into the dream after summoning and forging the pact in reality? What implications will the addition of a contracted creature have on the cycle? Can the corresponding spirit world be added to the mix? If not, once the summoning duration elapses, the contracted creature will return and the cycle will recommence. The more Lumian thought about it, the more his head throbbed. He felt a profound reverence for mysticism. He could only hope to swiftly master a few languages that would enable him to complete a summoning ritual. Without further ado, he seized his shotgun, the meager quantity of lead bullets that remained, and the sharp axe. He departed his home, traversed the wilderness, and re-entered the ruins. Chapter 58 Cherishing Talent After two nights of reconnaissance, Lumen discovered that the monsters inhabiting the outskirts of the dream ruins were fewer in number than he initially believed. Having dispatched the skinless creature, the shotgun-wheeling monstrosity, and the monster with the black mark, Lumian found little else in his search of the area. All he uncovered were a few twitching chunks of flesh. Their sole purpose seemed to be as sustenance. Yet, Lumian had long since realized that he had no need for food within the dream. Each time he entered, he felt invigorated and hunger-free. His energy would wane only after extended bouts of exploration or combat replaced by a sensation akin to hunger. But it was a mild feeling that didn't necessitate additional nourishment. Once the hunger became unbearable, Lumian's spiritual reserves and stamina would be all but depleted. Physically and mentally drained, he'd be forced to exit the dream. After consuming a meal and recovering in the real world, he would return to the dreamscape, his vigor restored and hunger vanquished. As he delved deeper, Lumian surveyed his surroundings for any signs of collapsed structures. He discovered a smattering of coins, but their combined value amounted to little more than a louis d'or. He found merely a few Le Ver Bleu inscribed with words. Left with no alternative, Lumian decided to venture further into the ruins. He cautiously navigated through the faint gray fog and oppressive darkness, weaving between the ruins standing and fallen walls. Suddenly, he stumbled upon a series of shallow, bizarre footprints. It was difficult to classify them as footprints. The left one appeared ordinary, but the right seemed more akin to a palm imprint. Another monster? Lumian stealthily trailed the footprints, all the while scrutinizing his environment and envisioning the ideal battlefield for various scenarios. 
Eventually, he detected movement, prompting him to halt. He skirted around the area and scaled a toppled building, using the scattered hefty rubble as cover. Peering out cautiously, Lumian surveyed the source of the noise. There, in the center of an uncluttered wasteland, stood a figure that could scarcely be described as human. While vaguely humanoid in shape, closer inspection revealed a host of incongruities. Two eyes occupied the space where a nose should have been, above them a mouth, and below them a pair of ears. The nose was nestled near the temples, while a leg and an arm replaced each shoulder. The lower half of the figure consisted of another leg and arm. The entire form seemed to have been haphazardly assembled from mismatched human components. This revelation instantly clarified the nature of the peculiar tracks Lumion had been following. The creature was garbed in a brown short-sleeved shirt and dark blue trousers, typical attire for lower-class antigens. It paced the barren landscape, shoeless and hatless. Lumion refrained from attacking, opting instead to observe patiently. Before long, the monster raised an arm and contorted its body backward, its head making contact with the ground. It's incredibly flexible. It would make a great dancer, Lumion mused sardonically. As if on cue, the creature launched into a dance. Its movements alternated between bold and graceful, sometimes bizarre and comical, yet always rhythmic. More notably, the creature seemed to possess no skeletal structure. Its limbs twisted and folded behind its back, and its legs and arms intertwined with ease. As the prankster king of Kordu village, Lumion quickly devised a fitting moniker for his newfound quarry. Noodle Man! Drawing on his observations, he began to formulate a strategy for the impending confrontation. I mustn't assume that I can evade its attack simply by maneuvering behind it. Noodle Man is capable of treating its front and back interchangeably. I must be wary of its potential to constrict me like a serpent. Though its vital points remain uncertain, it does have a head. I'll start by chopping off that. As Lumian's thoughts raced, the monster's dance grew increasingly frenetic. It leaped skyward, limbs splayed as if attempting to embrace the heavens. Lumian found himself somewhat entranced, an urge to sway his body in sync with the creature's movements taking hold. He couldn't help but recall a melody his sister often played, the beat echoing through his mind. Dump tsh, dump tsh. Suddenly, a warmth spread across his left peck as a whisper seemed to reverberate in his skull. His scalp prickled and body shuddered, as though the phantom voice that had once pushed him to the brink of madness was about to speak again. Uh, Lumion hastily undid the buttons of his leather coat and gray shirt with his left hand and gazed at his bare chest. The inky thorn mark over his heart had returned. The bluish-black symbol consisting of an eye and writhing worms materialized and bore down on the former. Lumion froze in shock as his mind raced. I haven't even entered cogitation, let alone held it for a few seconds. Did Noodle Man's dance somehow trigger this? Is there something related to mysticism about that dance? Some hidden magic? Luckily, when the mark activates like this, the horrific whispers are nearly mute. It won't drive me to death's door or strip me of all restraint, but I'll suffer a skull-splitting migraine uncontrollable tremors, and disorientation. Since becoming a hunter, Lumion had avoided entering that cogitation state to tap into his special trait. The danger seemed far greater now. Before, he had flirted with death and emerged unscathed, but now, hovering at death's door might cause him to lose all self-control, with irreparable consequences. Worse, excessive exposure to that ghastly whisper might drive him irreparably insane even if he survived and retained control. He dared not take that risk again unless it was a last resort. After two or three seconds, Lumion was no longer astonished by the thorn symbol being stimulated by Noodle Man's dance. An indescribable joy welled up in his heart. He could endure such a negative state completely. So, is there a chance that by learning Noodle Man's dance, I can dance it ahead of time to activate, uh partially activate the special trait of my dream when hunting powerful monsters? Then, I'll charge at the stunned target and finish it off in a few moves. Even if I can't fully trigger my special trait by dancing, it should be useful. 
I don't expect the target to give up resisting like the shotgun monster. It's enough to weaken them greatly. Lumion's thoughts raced. The more he watched the dancing noodle man, the more he found it pleasing. The eyes on the nose, the mouth on the forehead, and the arm that acted as a leg. How could any of that be as beautiful as the magical dance? In the blink of an eye, Lumion felt a strong sense of cherishing such talent, allowing him to find a reason. Aurori said that we can't select talents with a uniform standard, so why must it be a human and not a monster? He decided not to hunt the noodle man before mastering the dance. He would come and observe it a few times every night to try to master it as soon as possible. Of course, he planned to experiment with the other party first. He wanted to see how the incomplete special trait would affect the monster. Lumion quickly made up his mind. He didn't button his clothes and bared his left chest. He circled around the cover and jumped from the collapsed house to the wasteland. Noodle Man's dance abruptly halted. It began to tremble. It turned to Lumion, prostrated itself, and lay on the ground. Lumion stopped and didn't approach further, maintaining a safe distance. Noodle Man didn't move. Lumion nodded imperceptibly and muttered to himself, Even when facing my special trait that hasn't been fully activated, such a low-level monster will give up resisting and express its submission. I wonder, what will happen to those at a higher level or those with Beyonder characteristics? What I can be sure of is that the effect won't be as good. Lumion looked at Noodle Man and smiled. Come on, dance again. Noodle Man didn't dare look up. It was unknown if it understood what Lumion was saying. Seeing that his sincere words were ineffective, Lumion emphasized. Quick, dance for your papa again. Noodle Man's body trembled as it continued to prostrate. How can I communicate with it if monsters can't understand human language? Lumion felt a little helpless. He immediately put his newly acquired Hermes vocabulary to use and said, I need. Lumion didn't say another word and began to dance with his body movements. The monster didn't even acknowledge him as it pressed its face against the soil of the wasteland. Are you an imbecile? Lumion couldn't help but curse. He felt his scolding was unjustified. After all, which monster he had encountered was not stupid. Even the most intelligent shotgun monster was subdued by human intelligence. At that moment, Lumion felt the warmth in his chest dissipate. He instinctively lowered his head and noticed the thorn symbol and the bluish-black symbol vanish simultaneously. Lumion quickly shifted his gaze towards Noodle Man. Noodle Man happened to raise its head and looked at Lumion with its nose-located eyes. The man and monster stared at each other, stunned for a second. Thud, thud, thud. Lumion turned around and ran away. Noodle Man leapt up and chased him ferociously. Lumion was well acquainted with the area. His running speed was faster than the uncoordinated monster, so he easily shook it off and circled back to the wasteland to hide in his original location. He didn't flee because he was afraid of the other party, but he was concerned that he might not be able to control himself if they really fought. He didn't know if he could find another dancing noodle man in the dream ruins. Before learning that mysterious dance, he had no intention of hunting this strange monster. After waiting for a while, Lumion saw Noodle Man return to the area. He nodded and muttered to himself. As expected, monsters have their own territory. They are accustomed to moving around or patrolling a certain route. This is very similar to wild beasts. Next, Lumion patiently waited for the dance that might not happen. After nearly two hours, he had expended quite a bit of his spirituality and felt a little hungry. Noodle Man, who had rested for a long time, walked to the center of the wasteland, and raised its arm and leg. Chapter 59 Again Noodle Man danced once more, and Lumion confirmed that the mysterious dance could prevent the blackthorn symbol on his chest from activating fully. It produced no terrifying sound, only an illusory whisper. This was highly advantageous for Lumion's special trait in the dreamscape. However, he discovered two problems. Firstly, Noodle Man's dance moves were extremely difficult and violated the human body's structure. Only a monster with exaggerated flexibility like Noodle Man could complete them. Although Lumion was a beyonder and a hunter with a greatly enhanced body, he had no confidence in replicating them himself. He feared that dancing even once would result in ligament tears, 
muscle strains, or worse, fractures. Secondly, the dance stirred the surrounding powers of nature and depleted Lumion's spirituality considerably. After watching it for the third time, Lumion sighed silently, realizing he needed rest. I have to go back and rest after watching this. A hunter's spirituality is really useless. He was almost certain that the hidden existence corresponding to the thorn symbol was closely related to this dream ruin. The Padre had a black mark on his body, and there was a dancing monster that could activate the thorn symbol. It would be surprising to say that it had nothing to do with the hidden existence. Lumion believed Aurora's guess even more, thinking of the similar symbol on the Padre's chest and the dream ruins rebooting along with reality. The key to resolving the loop might be hidden in the depths of this place, playing a vital role. Is that why the mysterious lady kept hinting at me to unravel the secret of the dream ruins? The more Lumion thought about it, the more frustrated he became. He raised his left hand, which wasn't holding an axe, and made obscene gestures at the black thorn symbol on his chest. Ignoring the question of whether the hidden existence could sense or see him, Lumion felt that the problem wouldn't deteriorate any further, given that he had already fallen into a time loop thanks to him, and the people around him were becoming stranger and more dangerous. After watching the dance for the third time, Lumion rubbed his somewhat empty head and left the ruins to return to his home on the other side of the wilderness, enduring the slight warmth in his chest. Before leaving the dream, he attempted to consolidate the dance movements he had memorized and almost sprained his back, broke his knee ligaments, and tore his calf muscles. Dog shit. This isn't something an ordinary human can do. Lumion cursed and lay on the bed. As his spirituality was greatly drained, he quickly fell asleep. As Lumion awoke, the sky was just beginning to lighten. The sun had yet to rise, and the crimson moon had lost its luster. He sat up slowly, feeling the satisfaction of a deep sleep. His exhausted spirituality had been perfectly replenished. Walking to the window, Lumion drew back the curtains, allowing the light of dawn to flood the room. In the next moment, his eyes were fixed on the figure larger than an ordinary owl, perched on an elm tree not far away, staring down at him. Lumion quickly snapped out of his daze and opened his mouth. Aurore! Aurore! The suspect is here! Quick, follow it! Upon hearing the shout, the owl unfurled its wings and soared towards the edge of the village. It gradually descended and vanished into the forest bordering Cordu village. Aurore, dressed in a white silk nightgown, entered Lumion's bedroom seconds later, her face contorted in irritation. Is it that owl again? Lumion gazed out of the window and replied, Yes. Did White Paper manage to follow it? Aurore pulled at her long blonde tresses and spat. Why does it always appear at such ungodly hours? I was sound asleep when you woke me up. By the time I could release White Paper, it had flown away. Lumion shot back, but you said you couldn't sleep well with something on your mind. Aurore rolled her eyes at him and sneered. Humans tend to feel nervous, uneasy, and fearful at the beginning. Once they get used to it, they become numb to it. Only by sleeping well can they remain alert and rational. If you don't sleep well, it will affect your mental state and signs of losing control will surface. Lumen's expression was remorseful as he said, We can only wait for the next time. After a moment of contemplation, Aurore suggested, Let's try to identify a pattern in its appearances. We can't keep waiting around all the time. We need to rest and cannot be on guard constantly. Lumion reminisced about the first few sightings. It's always in the latter half of the night and early morning hours. Why only during that period? Aurore inquired further. It seems more like an act than a pattern. Think carefully. Did you do anything or repeat the same actions on the corresponding nights when it appeared in the first half of the night? I was exploring the dream ruins, Lumion admitted to his sister as he began to recall. Before it first appeared, I killed the first monster in the dream. Before it appeared the second time, I activated this symbol on my chest through cogitation and discovered what was special about me. The third time, I consumed the potion in the dream and became a hunter. The fourth time, which is today, I discovered a way to activate my specialness in the dream to a certain extent while incurring less damage. How did you do it? Aurori asked eagerly. Lumion recounted Noodle Man's dance in his attempt. As Aurore listened, she thought about the owl. 
After her brother finished speaking, she deliberated and said, The owl's visits seem to be related to significant progress in your exploration of the dream. Ah, Lumian thought for a moment before his eyes lit up. Indeed. The first time I killed a monster. The first time I displayed my specialness. The first time I consumed a potion and stepped onto the Beyonder path. The first time I found a way to make use of that specialness. Similar major developments also have a certain reaction in reality. That owl sensed it and came over to observe. Heh, <laughs> it smelled something. Aurori tersely acknowledged. In the future, we can deliberately create a similar opportunity to see if we can wait for the owl. I believe the next time it appears is after I master the mysterious dance and can truly use the specialness brought about by the symbol on my chest in my dream. Lumion pondered, revealing a malicious smile. When the time comes, I'll inform you before entering the dream. Be prepared. Aurori thought for a moment and nodded. I hope to figure out who the owl is related to and what role it plays in Kordu's abnormality. Lumion seized the opportunity to inquire. Aurori, uh, Grand Sur, do you possess any knowledge about that particular dance? As you are aware, my understanding of mysticism is still rudimentary. Aurori dragged a chair in front of Lumion's wooden table and settled in. After pondering for a moment, she responded, Several notebooks have alluded to the existence of large-scale ritualistic magic during the early 5th epoch and throughout the 4th epoch. Those rituals entailed not only numerous sacrifices, but also a multitude of participants. They employed specific dances to appease their desired entities in exchange for a response. In essence, it was a form of sacrificial ritual and magic. Dancing from the outset, was believed to influence nature and facilitate communication with deities. Its effects resemble those of beyonder language and the combination of herbs, essential oils, and other ingredients. In Aurore and Lumion's world, history was divided into five epochs. The first epoch was the Chaos Epoch, followed by the Dark Epoch, and then the Cataclysm Epoch. However, Aurori had heard from a pen pal that the Cataclysm Epoch was also known as the Glorious Epoch. The fourth epoch was the Age of the Gods, or the Epoch of the Gods. The fifth epoch was the present day, which began 1,358 years ago and was referred to as the Iron Age. Of the five epochs, the history of the first three remained unverifiable, with only myths and legends surviving. The fourth epoch occasionally yielded documents, information, notebooks, ruins, mausoleums, ancient cities, and so on. Nevertheless, history seemed shrouded in a thick fog, with only a faint outline discernible. The theological texts of the seven churches often recounted stories from the fourth epoch, which served as the only source of illumination. After listening to his sister's explanation, Lumian hazarded a guess. That noodle man employs dance to appease the hidden entity that corresponds to the thorn symbol. Is it hoping to elicit a response or a boon? Perhaps a significant portion of its ritual is absent, resulting in an extremely weak effect. Or is the problem with the dream ruins causing a failure that can only trigger a tiny fraction of the power contained in the symbol within my body? Hehe, <laughs> it's as if I'm a god, having witnessed noodle man's dance and being pleased by it. I decided to highlight the symbol and offer a certain response. However, Lumion had no control over this. It was an automatic reaction of the thorn symbol. Aurori smiled and replied, You're more like a carrier of that symbol, a tool in a sense. She paused thoughtfully and said, I suspect that the dance was specifically invented to please or communicate with the hidden entity that corresponds to the thorn symbol. Otherwise, it wouldn't have elicited a reaction from the symbol. Furthermore, based on your description, this is not something an ordinary person can accomplish. Only Beyonders with special enhancements can do so. Although I am familiar with the names of the corresponding Sequence 9 and Sequence 8 pathways, I have a certain level of understanding of them. None of them can execute that kind of dance, and Noodle Man's performance does not seem like that of a higher sequence. Otherwise, you would not have been able to escape. Perhaps it is not from the 22 pathways, but rather a boon from a hidden entity. Lumin recalled the mysterious lady's words. Aurora looked out the window and pursed her lips. 
I wonder if this has anything to do with the circle inhabitant or a power equivalent to sequence 9 or sequence 8. Probably. Lumion suddenly laughed. Let me name it. Noodle Man. Circle inhabitants corresponding sequence 9. Aurori couldn't help but look up at the ceiling. The siblings chatted for a while before heading downstairs for breakfast. After studying Hermes until past 10, Lumion departed with important items. Chapter 60 Dancer Lumion was in no rush to track down Ryan, Leia, and Valentine. Instead, he headed straight for the old tavern, hoping to get lucky. If that enigmatic woman showed up, he had a slew of questions for her. Accepting her gift had bound him to some future cost. He might as well seize the chance to gain more benefits, as Aurora had advised. The instant Lumion stepped into the old tavern, his eyes sparkled. The mysterious woman sat in her usual corner seat, two glasses of emerald absinthe before her. Two glasses? She knew I'd come? Lumion approached her with a smile and greeted her. Good morning. She wore a white blouse with vine leaf patterns at the collar and a beige ankle length dress, a light red beret beside her. Lumion, no stranger to his sister's fashion magazines, recognized this as Treyarch's latest trend. She glanced up at him. It's getting late, almost noon. This is to fit your schedule, isn't it? Lumion thought, annoyed. But seeing the enigmatic woman brought him a strange sense of calm. He sat and cut to the chase. I've been through a lot lately. She slid a glass of absinthe his way. The swirling green liquid was like a beacon of joy. She neither invited him to speak nor silenced him. Lumion sipped the absinthe, finding it rich and invigorating with a subtle, bitter note. It tasted different from any absence he had before. What's this? he asked, puzzled. Another kind of absinthe. Quite popular in Treyarch these days. To differentiate it from the original, people call it absinthe fennel. Authors, painters, and poets are particularly fond of it. She took a small sip. The green liquid in the clear glass seemed to possess a hypnotic hue. Absinthe's main ingredients were wormwood, fennel, and anise. Different producers used slightly varied recipes, some even adding lemon essential oils. Lumion didn't understand her motives. Had she traveled to Treyarch just to bring back absinthe fennel? He didn't ask. Instead, he recounted recent events, both real and dreamed. She sipped from her small cup of absinthe fennel, listening quietly to Lumion's account. That's about it. Can I learn that mysterious dance as quickly as possible? He asked bluntly. He didn't bother inquiring about the loop's key or the dream secret. Experience told him he wouldn't get a straight answer. The woman swirled her emerald liquid and smiled. Without a significant boost in flexibility, you'll never master it. You could force yourself through a portion, but you'd risk ligaments and muscle tears. How would you hunt monsters then? Lumion was attuned to the subtext in others' words. Is there a way to greatly increase my flexibility? She chuckled. That's for you to figure out. Lumion was stumped by her cryptic hint. If she were a less mysterious acquaintance, he'd demand, Explain yourself. Don't make me kneel and beg. As if reading his mind, she smiled and added, The solution to your flexibility lies within you. Huh? Lumion looked perplexed. She sipped her absinthe fennel and sighed. Didn't your sister teach you ritualistic magic? Lumion noticed a strange emotion flicker in her eyes once again. She did. His heart quickened. Pray to myself? She assessed him and laughed. Who do you think you are? What good would praying to you do? You can only summon the weakest creatures from the spirit world. Your spiritual perception improves with your body. Danger intuition, for example? Lumion grasped the gist of her words. Though Hunter's spirituality was enhanced, it focused on spiritual perception and fell short in ritualistic magic and other mystical matters. So what do I need to do? Lumion pressed. The lady sighed warily. You've studied dualistic ritual law, haven't you? Yes, Lumion nodded. The lady sighed again. Luckily, you have a sister. Otherwise, I have to teach you all this mystic mumbo-jumbo. Too tiresome. You mean you didn't tell me about ritual magic, cogitation, spirit vision, 
contracted creatures, or magic languages because it was too much hassle? You just showed up after Aurora finished teaching me? Lumion felt rage bubbling up inside him. He took a couple of deep breaths and said, Dualistic rituals require items closely tied to deities or supernatural beings, but I don't have any. His voice trailed off as a thought struck him. The lady smirked and said, Oh yes, you do. Don't you remember? Lumin jabbed a finger at his chest. The thorn symbol and the bluish-black symbol? The lady nodded before reminding. Forget the bluish-black symbol. The key to a dualistic ritual is channeling the divine power in the object. If its power decreases, the balance in your body will be disrupted. And when that happens... She left the sentence hanging, but her expression told Lumion all he needed to know. In Aurora's usual grim words, No hope, just wait for death. Is the bluish-black symbol protecting me from corruption? Lumion knew enough about the mysticism to recognize his current state as corruption. It's the great existence I mentioned protecting you, the woman said solemnly. Once you solve the seeker of the dream ruins, I'll tell you his honorific name. You can pray to him directly. Did this great existence seal the corruption symbolized by the thorn in my heart, preventing it from corrupting me completely? Lumion didn't know if this great existence was good or evil, or had sinister intentions, but he felt an odd affinity with him on this. He thought for a moment and guessed. Use a dualistic ritual to steal the power of the thorn symbol? If its power decreases, the corruption will weaken and the seal strengthen? How can you call it stealing? The lady retorted. This is appealing to an entity for a boon. It just so happens he has some of his power nearby. The response follows the law of proximity. Thanks to the seal from the great existence and barriers attenuating it, the entity's true form won't sense it. Only mystics like you who speak in riddles understand how to sugarcoat it. What's the difference between this and stealing? Lumion thought sourly. From the lady's explanation of divine boon and abnormal pathways, he asked shrewdly, Through the dualistic ritual, can I appeal to the power behind the thorn symbol and ask it to grant me the ability to greatly increase my flexibility? Something like that, the lady said. To be precise, ask it to grant you the power of dancer. Dancer? Lumion thought of Noodle Man's performance. The lady took a sip of absinthe and said, For beyond our pathways beyond the standard 22, we classify them into sequence 9 to sequence 0 for convenience. In a way, this sequence division follows the rules of this world. Does Dancer correspond to sequence 9 of the thorn symbol, just as Circle Inhabitant corresponds to its sequence 4? Lumion fired off. Can it boost my flexibility and improve my mystic skills? allowing me to easily grasp that mysterious dance? The lady smiled in relief. As expected, with a foundation in mysticism, communication is much easier. No need for me to explain further. Lumion asked eagerly, Then what are sequences 8, 7, 6, and 5 of the thorn symbol? Sequence 8 is alms monk, and sequence 7 is contractee. Gosh, why do you want to know so much? Master the ritual first and strive to become a dancer as soon as possible. The woman was losing patience. Alms Monk. Contracti. These names instantly clicked for Lumion. Alms Monk referred to certain members of the various churches in reality. The eternal Blazing Sun Church was rife with factions, each with their own beliefs. Two main groups stood out, the Order of Preachers and the Brotherhood Minor, also known as the Alms Monk Brotherhood. The former was made up of clergymen and the purifiers of the Inquisition who were dedicated to the cruel persecution and purification of heretics, cultists, and wild beyonders, all in the name of promoting the orthodox teachings of the eternal blazing sun. The latter, however, were mainly concentrated in the cloisters, with a few clergymen among their ranks. They espoused temperance, begging for food and ascetic training, preaching in various poor places, all with the aim of spreading the faith of the eternal blazing sun. At the mention of the alms monk, Lumion immediately thought of missionaries, asceticism, and special ritualistic magic. 
As for contractee, the first thing that came to mind was the black mark on the Padre and the mouth orifice monster. Aurora explained that it might be a mark left behind by a special contract. Wait, the monster I killed was a contractee? Lumion asked in surprise. I actually killed a monster equivalent to a sequence 7? The lady nodded slightly and said, Yes, contractees use special contracts and godhood provided by that existence as witnesses to obtain different powers from various creatures. One contract corresponds to one ability. Whether they're powerful or not depends on the abilities they obtain and how many they have. It's not impossible for ordinary people to kill them if they take the wrong path. In fact, similar situations occur in the Beyonder domain. It's common for Beyonders who aren't skilled in combat to be killed by those of an inferior sequence. Ability is important, as is intelligence. Preparation in advance is equally significant. Chapter 61 Description The more Lumion listened to the lady in front of him, the more he concurred. He was uncertain about what would happen at a higher sequence. Among the few Beyonder creatures he had interacted with, the threat posed by the fellow with the vortex-shaped proboscis was far inferior to the monster carrying a shotgun. Although he had become a Beyonder, significantly improving his close combat ability and exploitation of the environment, the problem primarily lay with the Contract D monster. Firstly, it did not display a relatively strong pursuit ability. Secondly, it lacked long-range attacks. Thirdly, its invisibility ability was not ridiculous. It was completely countered by a hunter's grasp of the surrounding environment in minute traces. Moreover, it had the common problem of monsters. It did not have high intelligence and was not as combat intelligent as the shotgun monster. It had easily stepped into the enemy's trap. With all of this combined, the final outcome was obvious. Lumion just never expected it to be equivalent to a sequence 7. He didn't even compare it to the shotgun monster. Recognizing the vast difference between the two, the shotgun monster was a force to be reckoned with, while the mouth orifice monster was weak. Ability, intelligence, preparation, improvisation, environmental factors, there are too many variables that can affect the outcome of a battle. Lumion concluded inwardly and asked without much hope, Can I directly pray for contractee powers? The lady chuckled. That's a good way to kill yourself. She casually explained, in theory, it's possible. After all, the power sealed in your body isn't limited to the Sequence 7 equivalent. But can your body withstand such a tremendous boon? Or rather, corruption? If you don't mind turning into a monster, a puppet of that existence, or transforming into another creature, then go ahead. Then it won't be long before I see you personally turning your sister into a sacrifice. Lumin's hair stood on end from the woman's words, and a chill ran down his spine realizing that he wasn't ready to advance beyond his current level. He cautiously asked, So the most significant boon I can handle right now is a dancer? Yes, that's why I waited for you to become a Beyonder and digest some of it before telling you about it. The woman explained, taking another sip of her green liquid. Only when your mind, spirituality, and body have improved significantly will you have a chance of resisting the corruption attached to the boon. Then you can slowly control the power. As your soul body and body of heart and mind strengthen, and your body adapts to the slight changes brought about by the power of the boon, you can consider Alm's monk. For Lumion, the most crucial thing was to learn the mysterious dance. Initiating the incomplete activation of the thorn symbol would significantly improve his ability to explore the dream ruins. Therefore, he nodded slightly, no longer thinking about Alm's monk and contractee. How should I pray? He had already learned the duality ritual, but he didn't know the target's honorific name, domain, and corresponding ingredients. Ahem, <clears throat> the lady coughed. Then she spoke solemnly. What I'm about to say shall leave my mouth and enter your ears. You must not tell anyone, or you'll harm them. Leave my mouth and enter your ears? This is a sentence Aurora likes to write. Has this lady read one of her novels? Lumion thought. I understand. He thought for a moment and asked, Will anything go wrong from hearing it? The lady took a sip of absinthe fennel and smiled. When did you have the illusion that there's nothing wrong with you? Lumion was stunned for a moment before looking down at his left peck. 
The lady scoffed. You belong to the group of individuals who are on the brink of being corrupted. Luckily, the mark left by that great existence was activated, and the corresponding power descended upon you, sealing the source of corruption and establishing balance. Next, you will perform a ritual to confront the power within the seal and pray for the corresponding blessings. It is akin to proactively withstanding a certain level of corruption. So, why should you be afraid of minor issues that you hear? The more I hear, the more I feel that there is a huge problem. Lumion wasn't too confident. The lady shook her head and smiled. Do not fret. When I review the corresponding words, I will provide you with a sufficiently concealed environment and secure protection. In the future, it would be best to perform the ritual in the ruins, where there is gray fog and the protection of the great existence. It will not directly draw the attention of that entity. Furthermore, before the ritual, scramble every segment and description. Attempt not to piece them together and analyze them in a complete manner. Otherwise, <laughs> she chuckled and did not elaborate on the outcome. But Lumion could imagine what would occur. Observing that he did not inquire further, the woman nodded slightly. Let us commence. The first part is the power of inevitability. Using it is sufficient. It corresponds with your black thorn symbol. The complete name of that being is not something you can comprehend at the moment. Even I must provide some concealment before daring to contemplate it. For some reason, Lumion felt the light around him diminish slightly, but he was unsure. At that moment, the woman controlled her expression and said solemnly, The second part is, You are the past, the present, and the future. You are the reason, the result, and the process. As the lady enunciated each word with precision, Lumion felt his senses spin. He realized that a vortex of dark wind was enveloping him. The table on which his absence fennel rested writhed as if imbued with a life force of its own. Suddenly, a sharp sound echoed. An ebony worm, as long as an adult's index finger, slithered out of the wooden board, and an ominous aura spread instantaneously. Before Lumion could observe the worm's features, the woman sitting across from him lowered her cup filled with the green liquid and slammed it onto the grotesque creature reducing it to a pulpy mess. Next, the woman produced a patterned napkin, wiped the glass's base clean, and wrapped the worm's remains in it. She took another sip of the absence fennel, as if nothing untoward had occurred, and emphasized, Remember, the first and second parts must be recited in ancient Hermes. Jotun, Dragonese, and Elvish are acceptable as well. Similar to how the initial I in the rite that worships oneself cannot be in Hermes, Lumion nodded to indicate his comprehension. Although he had always been audacious, he felt slightly discomfited and uneasy when confronted with the strange phenomena that kept manifesting during their conversation. His heart raced, but the enigmatic woman acted as if she had merely detected some impurities in their meal. She continued, The third part can be spoken in Hermes. The text is as follows. I implore you. I beseech your benediction. I plead with you to grant me the power of dancer. Remember, the three sentences are progressive. These words did not elicit a new environmental shift. The anomalies that had caused Lumion's unease and trepidation gradually subsided. Lumion committed them to memory earnestly and followed the woman's instructions to scramble the words to prevent any potential issues. The woman savored the remaining absinthe fennel with satisfaction. The rest of the ritual is similar to common ritualistic magic. The corresponding ingredients are gray amber, tulips, cloves, and deer musk. Choose any two to make candles. The remaining two can be used as herbs, essential oil, and extract during the ritual. Lumion furrowed his brow as he recalled the dualistic ritual he had learned. The spot representing the deity should have an item that's closely related to the deity. But my thorn symbol is on my chest. I can't skin it, right? Besides, I doubt it's even useful if I skin it. The power was sealed in his heart and spirit body. The woman nodded slightly. Didn't I tell you to make candles? When making the candle, take five milliliters of blood from your chest. It doesn't matter if it's more or less. In any case, fuse it into the material and let it become a part of the candle. In the ritual, the candle is placed in the deity's location. There's only one candle. Because of your blood... The candle was awakened by ancient Hermes. 
after becoming a symbol, it will point directly at you. Then, with the subsequent description, it will activate the power sealed in you to a certain extent. It feels like a special variant of the dualistic ritual. Aurori didn't mention that it could be done like this, so not many people know about it. Lumion thought for a moment and asked, Can I use perfume with grey amber? He remembered that his sister had it, and she liked to call grey amber, ambergris. The woman nodded. Sure, use it like an essential oil. I possess the grey amber in that case. I have some clothes at home. Lumion pondered where he could acquire tulips and deer musk. After much contemplation, he could only come up with three possibilities. Firstly, Aurora, being a warlock, might have already prepared the required materials. Secondly, the materials could be found at the administrator's residence. Thirdly, the Padre's house could be a potential source. Lumion decided to inform his sister about the ritual and break down the instructions into individual words. He planned to learn the corresponding ancient Hermes and Hermes words from her, and inquire about the availability of the materials. If she didn't have them, he would explore other options. As the lady was about to depart, Lumion hastily questioned, What was that lizard that crawled out of the deputy padre's mouth? The lady smiled and replied, I cannot explain it to you. Lumion struggled to maintain his composure and thought, Why not just say you don't want to tell me? After the lady left, Lumion retrieved the pen and paper he had brought and jotted down the ritual instructions in a disordered manner. He then numbered them in the correct sequence. Upon leaving Old Tavern, Lumion scoured the village for the trio of foreigners. It didn't take long before he heard a faint tinkling sound. Lumion's lips curved into a smile as he quickened his pace. As expected, Leia wore two bells on her veil and boots, Ryan donned a dark bowler hat, and Valentine had sprinkled powder on his head. Lumion had an urge to open his arms and exclaim, My cabbages, I miss you so much but he quickly remembered that he had not interacted with the foreigners in this cycle. He needed his face to appear more serious and strode towards Ryan and the others. As he brushed past them, he lowered his voice and said, I know who you're searching for. Ryan, Leia, and Valentine gaped at him in astonishment. Lumion didn't pause. He continued walking forward. The three foreigners exchanged glances, suppressed their peculiar expressions, and followed behind Lumion as if nothing had happened. Chapter 62 Date Lumion halted at the forest's edge, a short distance from his house, and glanced back at Leia and the others. The spot was quite secluded, with no villagers passing through. The forest was thinly populated, making it easy to spot anyone hiding nearby. As the tinkling sounds drew nearer, Leia asked with a smile, How do you know we're looking for someone? Lumion remained silent. He pulled out the essential item he had brought with him, the Levar Blue from home. He lifted the item and showed Ryan and the others the pages where some words had been cut out. Without hesitation, Ryan nodded and said, So you wrote the letter for help. They had never mentioned a help letter in Cordu, let alone detailed that the letter was assembled from words cut from a Levar Blue. Unless the other party had a key informant in Bigor, it had to be the letter writer. Leia instinctively looked around. The two small silver bells hanging from the veil above her head oddly didn't make a sound. Valentine was about to ask what was weird about the people around him when Ryan asked, puzzled, How can you be sure that we're here because of that letter? You told me yourself, Lumion smiled. There are very few foreigners who come to Cordu to begin with. Even fewer who don't buy wool, cheese, and lambs, and only wander around the village to chat with people. Besides, I didn't say anything. I just showed you this Levar Blue. Realization hit Leia and she laughed. So it's just a test. That's a brilliant idea. Those who don't know the letter won't understand your intentions, so they won't be too suspicious. At most, they'll think it's a prank, and you're the prankster king of Cordu. Ryan nodded slightly. This seemingly innocent line revealed that the trio had gleaned something from chatting in Cordu over the past few days. At the very least, they had identified the more prominent villagers and taken appropriate measures. Lumion immediately flashed a teasing smile. You believed it? You seriously believed it? Seeing Ryan and the other's astonishment, he added, I was just joking, 
Let me tell you the real reason later. Leia gritted her teeth, as expected of the prankster king of Cordu. Aren't you afraid that we won't believe what you're about to say? You can choose not to believe it. Lumin wore an indifferent expression. Or you can verify it yourself. Valentine, visibly dissatisfied, asked anxiously. In your letter, you mentioned that the people around you are getting weirder. What's so weird about them? Lumin exclaimed and cracked his knuckles. There's plenty. To be precise, the Padre believing in an evil god. Shepherd Pierre Barry turning people into sheep and herding them back to Cordu. Madame Poilis rides a demon-drawn carriage through the wilderness. When the deputy Padre sleeps, a translucent, lizard-like creature crawls out of his mouth. Naroka is clearly not dead, but she wants to go to Paramita. Louis Lund, the administrator's male butler, has just given birth to a baby. The owl from the warlock legends flies back to the village from time to time. Ryan, Leia, and Valentine grew increasingly shocked as they listened. They didn't want to believe it, but they felt that the kid before them couldn't invent so many absurd stories. They were all seasoned official investigators who had dealt with numerous beyonder incidents, many involving evil gods and mystic arts. However, none were as ludicrous or exaggerated as what they were hearing now. Only the Padre believing in evil gods sounded normal. More importantly, most of the incidents they had previously handled stood independently. At most, two or three would occur simultaneously. Moreover, they were closely related to each other. But Cordu had too many horrifying abnormalities. What kind of place is this? Almost instantly, similar thoughts raced through Leia, Ryan, and Valentine's minds. They suspected they had inadvertently entered the legendary abyss or hell. When Lumion stopped, Leia couldn't help but ask, you're not joking, are you? Was there anyone normal in this village? Lumian smiled. I haven't finished speaking. There's another abnormality. This is the third or fourth time I've talked to you about something like this. Ryan, Leia, Valentine, my cabbages. Ryan, Leia, and Valentine weren't surprised that Lumian knew their names. It was inevitable when they had been chatting in the village. They were even more astonished and puzzled by the first half of the sentence. What do you mean? Valentine asked with a frown. What I mean is that we've been repeatedly experiencing the past few days. In other words, we've fallen into a time loop. Lumin didn't let the three foreigners guess and provided a standard answer. Without waiting for Ryan and the others to question him, he briefly mentioned what they had experienced together and finally said, Think back carefully. Was it really March 29th when you entered the village? Leia and the others racked their brains. After more than 10 seconds, Valentine revealed a pained expression. My sense of time is hazy. I can't remember the exact date of the previous two months, but I remember. I remember celebrating my youngest son's birthday before I set off. His birthday is... Valentine raised his head and blurted out in shock. April 10th! In other words, the actual date now is mid to late April? Judging from the looks of it, the number of cycles I went through before I had my memories wiped can be more than a couple. It can even be more than once. Yes, that was the first cycle. The loop hadn't even begun, so I could send a letter without the river's help. When the loop happened and time rewound, the corresponding memories would be replaced. But material objects beyond the range wouldn't be able to turn back. Lumian had a new theory about the letter. He nodded imperceptibly and said to Ryan and Leia, You can also wire the outside world and get the current date in a way that won't raise any red flags. When the time comes, you'll believe me. Yes, yes, send a telegram. Valentine snapped out of his stupor, asked the higher-ups for help. Lumian looked at him as if he were a fool. Ask for help? In the face of such a bizarre time loop, what do you officials usually do? Ryan fell silent for a moment before saying, Stamp it out directly to prevent the corruption from spreading. Therefore, asking for help now is as good as suicide. Lumian smiled and shrugged. Valentine replied fervently. According to the rules, we have to report back ASAP. I'm willing to sacrifice myself for this. Lumian was stunned. Such people exist? No, I have to get rid of this guy immediately, or everyone will die together. Fortunately... Leia and Ryan clearly felt that they could still be saved. They exchanged a glance and nodded. 
Ryan patted Valentine's shoulder and said, Stay calm. We still don't know what's going on. Perhaps there's a better solution. If we really can't save ourselves, we'll report it to the higher-ups. That's right, Lumian hurriedly added. He recounted the discoveries and speculations minus the symbol on his chest, the dream ruins, the mysterious lady, and the curly-haired baboon's research society. Finally, he said, the key to the problem most likely happens on the twelfth night. We have to survive until then. Only then can we truly resolve the issue in the next cycle. Seeing that he had revealed so many details and that they could verify them all, Ryan and the others were completely inclined to believe him. Valentine calmed down and remembered his wife and children. Leia exhaled. No wonder you know us and know we're looking for someone. It turned out that they had communicated in a previous cycle. She subconsciously touched the silver bell above her head, wanting to do a divination, but she held back when she recalled the abnormalities Lumion had described. She didn't want to blow up because of a divination that shouldn't be done before the real investigation began. Ryan thought for a moment and said to Lumion, You're telling us this because you want us to cooperate with you and your sister? Very astute, my cabbage. Lumion laughed and said seriously, First, why are the outside world saying that your investigation has made some progress? The Padre seems to have a certain issue. Then ask what the lizard-like thing that crawls out of a mouth is. This is the least likely to cause a destructive blowout of all the abnormalities. Alright, confirm the real date and be careful in how it's done. Don't let anyone outside suspect anything. Secondly, my sister will invite Madame Poilis to my house for afternoon tea this afternoon. I hope that you can sneak into the administrator's mansion with me and do a search. As for the future, it depends on the information we obtain today. Ryan, Leia, and Valentine looked at each other and felt that Lumion's request wasn't too unreasonable. This was what they would have done. The four of them arrived at the village square. Ryan went to wire the outside world while Leia, Valentine, and Lumion waited under the elm tree outside. After calming down, Leia glanced at Lumion and asked curiously, you're beyond her, and so is your sister? Yes, Lumion didn't hide it. Leia laughed. Aren't you afraid of being arrested by us? We're in the same boat now. In the face of an emergency where the boat is about to sink, we can only help each other, Lumion shrugged. As for the future, we'll talk about it later. It's still unknown if we can escape this loop. That's true. Leia turned her head and looked at Valentine. The reason why she brought up this topic was to let her companion understand this and not do anything stupid. Valentine's expression remained cold as he nodded imperceptibly. Leia then asked about something she was more concerned about. Why can you keep the memories from before? I'm not telling you, Lumian laughed. Without waiting for Leia's response, he spread his hands and said, I'm just joking. Actually, I'm not sure either. I somehow retained my memories, and it's only from the last two cycles. Thinking back to what happened back then, perhaps this is very important, Leia said after some thought. Lumian said sincerely, I've been thinking, but I haven't figured out anything. Perhaps I'll only suddenly realize when I encounter something. Leia was about to help analyze the situation when Ryan, who had received the reply, walked out of the administration building. Chapter 63 Shocking News Leia and Valentine asked Ryan in unison, How is it? Although they had already believed Lumion's words, it was inevitable for people to hope for luck. They still held on to the hope that perhaps the problem wasn't that serious, because the kid wasn't knowledgeable enough to exaggerate. Ryan looked around and saw that there was no one else around the elm tree. He spoke in a low voice. I was afraid to ask too directly. I only know that the real date is already late April. I don't know the exact date. Leia and Valentine fell silent. They had indeed fallen into a strange time loop. Judging from the various files and information, this was definitely not something the three of them should face or deal with. They were seasoned Beyonders who had handled many Beyonder incidents. It was the first time they had encountered such a serious and abnormal situation. Leia couldn't help but turn to look at Lumion. What kind of places cord you? There were abnormalities everywhere, each more exaggerated than the last. I don't know either. Lumion had an innocent expression. Before the loop, this place was beautiful, and the people were simple. Everyone was normal and hospitable. 
He didn't tell the three foreigners that the person standing before them was also one of the abnormalities. Ryan sighed and said, I've never encountered so many abnormalities at once, and every one of them is serious. This is the most dangerous situation I've ever faced, echoed Valentine. Lumin was already a little numb to this. He sneered and said, It's normal that you haven't encountered it before, because those who have encountered one are dead. Leia looked at him with a smile. Don't say anything if you can't say something nice. People like you won't survive past childhood elsewhere. Killed in the cradle? Lumion mocked himself and asked Ryan, Did you get an answer about the deputy padre? Ryan nodded. In the past few years, similar legends have emerged in various places across the northern and southern continents. Legend has it that heaven banished a group of sinful elves to the ground. They can only reside within human bodies, hoping to redeem their sins and gain absolution before returning to heaven. In some versions of the legend, these elves appear as translucent lizards. However, the elf I'm referring to is not the ancient elf race. It is more akin to a mixture of fairies and various spirits. Again in recent years? Lumion recalled that the legend of Madame Knight had only surfaced recently. What was wrong with this world? He pondered for a moment before asking, Did they specify which deity's heaven it is? Ryan shook his head. What's remarkable is that every person who claims to have seen an elf believes it is from the kingdom of their local deity. The local deity referred to the orthodox gods of the local faith. Heavens of different deities? Lumion gazed up at the azure sky. Did that lizard-like elf come from the sky? However, according to Aurori, beyond the sky lay the cosmos. Each star represented a world. So, were these extraterrestrial beings? Or were they from a natural plane beyond mysticism? As Lumion's thoughts raced, he asked curiously, In some versions of the legend, these elves appear as translucent lizards. What about the other details? Ryan shook his head once more. That's all they could uncover in a short period. They may need to communicate with headquarters for more information. Leia pondered and spoke, I am familiar with the legend of elves. I once met a native of Lenberg who shared that farmers in many regions of the south-central zone have reported mischievous fairies in recent years. These creatures known as Alps would vandalize their homes and fields or play pranks on them. The south-central zone referred to the area where Lenberg, Mason, Sagar, and other small countries were located. It also included a few areas in the Intus Republic, the Lowen Kingdom, and the Fena Potter Kingdom. Most of them were located in the highlands, mountains, forests, areas filled with ruins and legends. Lumion listened attentively and concluded, This is not an isolated phenomenon. Each elf seems to have their unique way of causing trouble, Ryan mused, and the lizards that inhabit human bodies are perhaps the most malevolent. It is uncertain if they are the most dangerous. With so many abnormalities in Kordu, the parasitic elf shouldn't be an isolated phenomenon. Perhaps someone wants to use it to control the deputy padre. Very clear line of thinking. Lumion looked at the villagers who were returning home after finishing their work and said to Leia and the others, Meet me behind the hill where the administrator's castle is at 3.30pm. Will you join me to search for clues? Of course, Ryan agreed. Leia, however, called out to Lumion before he left. Is that all? You should brief us on the situation in the castle its inhabitants, and Madame Poilis' abnormality. We cannot explore and search without preparation. Lumion did not want to recall Madame Poilis' matters, but he had to admit that Leia's request made sense. He had to endure the discomfort and tell them the entire story. Ryan and the others were mentally prepared, but they still looked a little dull upon hearing the tale. Leia lightened the mood with her tinkling laughter. It does not matter to me. I might experience such a thing in the future. This is an opportunity that most men never encounter. You should cherish it. However, Valentine ignored her joke and whispered with a cold expression. All of this needs to be purified. Purified! Lumion did not want to provoke Valentine and waved his hand. See you in the afternoon. After taking a few steps, Lumion turned around to look at Ryan warily and asked, Did Bertrand have any knowledge of the contents of your telegram? Bertrand was responsible for the telegraph, and if he knew about the date and the legend of the elves, it meant that the administrator knew as well, 
And if the administrator knew, Madame Paulice would know too. Don't worry, Ryan said reassuringly. We have a secret code. He won't be able to decipher it. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief only then, and left the village square, heading back to his building. As he walked a distance away, he spotted Ava Lazier herding a flock of white geese back home. Hey there, isn't this our spring elf? Lumian tried to push the bloody and cruel scenes from the Lent celebration out of his mind and greeted Ava with his usual quip. Ava seemed a little embarrassed. I haven't been chosen yet. Her exquisite facial features made her grayish-white dress look less rustic. That won't be a problem, Lumian said with a smile. Raymond and I will help you campaign for votes. Ava looked surprised. You don't know? What don't I know? Lumian's heart skipped a beat. Had something happened in the village that wasn't a part of the historical process? Ava observed his expression and suspected that he was teasing her. After a few seconds, the girl frowned in concern and said, Raymond's missing. You didn't know? Huh? Lumion was so shocked that he couldn't hide his expression as usual. In the previous, previous cycle, he and Raymond Gregg had met almost every day from the second day of March 30th until April 5th, Lent. Back then, they had followed the waterside ritual procedure to lift Raymond, who had thrown the last offering, and throw him into the river. Like the others in the past, Raymond swam further away and could only return home after leaving the ritual site. He wouldn't leave the house until night. In the two cycles that followed, Lumian had too much to do and didn't have time to find Raymond. But now, Ava was telling him that Raymond was missing today. This was something that had never happened in the previous, previous cycle. Upon seeing Lumian's expression, Ava's aqua blue eyes cleared of confusion. You really have no idea. Raymond's father may come to you today to ask where Raymond has gone. Lumian suppressed the tumultuous waves in his heart and asked, When did Raymond disappear? Could it be that something happened because I didn't follow the historical process of finding him? Two days ago, Ava recalled. It said that he didn't return after leaving the house in the afternoon of the 29th. His family assumed he was at Old Tavern, or chatting with the Green Watchers. They only began searching for him last night. They should be asking you today. She paused and lowered her voice. They suspect Raymond of sneaking away because he didn't want to learn how to shepherd. They think I instigated him and are questioning me later? Lumian roughly understood what had happened. The afternoon of the 29th reminded him of the beginning of the cycle. The last two cycles had started on the afternoon of the 29th. In other words, Raymond disappeared from the beginning of the cycle? This means that perhaps no one deliberately changed the course of history because it was too late. Then why is there such an anomaly and difference? Lumian fell into deep thought. Ava glanced at him and asked softly, Do you know where Raymond went? I haven't seen him in the past few days, Lumian said truthfully. He began to suspect that Raymond's disappearance had something to do with being thrown into the river during the previous, previous cycle. However, it was impossible for Raymond to leave Cordu because of this. That would trigger the loop. After bidding farewell to Ava, Lumian forced himself to remain calm and return home. He couldn't be bothered to discuss anything else. Initially, he divulged Raymond's disappearance to Aurore. Aurore's countenance turned solemn as she furrowed her brows and whispered, If you hadn't mentioned it, I would have completely forgotten about this person. She donned a simple rose-red dress and paced back and forth. Lumian began to contemplate potential reasons. After a while, Aurore gazed at her brother and uttered solemnly, I recollect that the crux of the Lent waterside ritual is to offer sacrifices to the concept of a water source symbolized by the river. Is it probable that Raymond, who was thrown into the water, was also regarded as a sacrifice and was taken away by a certain entity? Subsequently, as there was no corresponding tangible reward, the cycle portrayed his absence as a disappearance. Lumian shook his head. That would trigger the cycle. Humans departing Cordu and the surrounding vicinity acted as a trigger. Aurore asked in a profound voice, What if it's in the form of a corpse? Chapter 64 Weapon In the form of a corpse? Lumian's heart sank upon hearing that. If Raymond's body had left the loop due to the sacrifice, he wouldn't be able to revive through the loop. Once the abnormality in Cordu was resolved, he would truly be dead and not just missing. 
although Lumion wasn't willing to admit that a foolish chap like Raymond was his friend. They had known each other for almost five years. They had played together, pranked together, and experienced many things together. Regardless, he couldn't treat him as a stranger. Recalling the past, he realized that other than Aurore, Raymond was probably the person he interacted with the most. Didn't Aurore often say that the fools are the lucky ones? Why is this happening? Lumion couldn't help but retort. Even if he became a corpse, there will still be a spirit. It will trigger the cycle. Aurore sighed softly. Perhaps the entity receiving the sacrifice isn't interested in spirits and only wants flesh and blood. Perhaps he didn't want to trigger the loop and only wanted flesh and blood instead of Raymond's spirit, leaving him in Cordu or directly destroying him. In that case, Raymond's corpse was equivalent to pure matter without any spirituality. It could leave the loop without triggering a reboot. Upon hearing his sister's retort, Lumian's mind instantly replayed what might have happened. After everyone left the water, Raymond swam further away. Suddenly, an invisible force grabbed his legs, covered his mouth, and dragged him to the depths of the river, where he drowned. After that, his spirit would remain at the bottom of the river or be destroyed. His corpse would drift to an unknown place and become a sacrifice. At this thought, Lumian suddenly became inspired. Regardless of whether Raymond's spirit was left behind or destroyed, once the cycle restarts, he should appear in the form of a ghost. Logically speaking, that's correct. Aurore nodded thoughtfully. After dark, I'll hold a psychic ritual and see if I can find Raymond's spirit. Yes, it's best if we have something he often uses as a medium. Lumion replied without hesitation. After exploring the castle in the afternoon, I'll go to Raymond's place. His parents are looking for me to ask about his whereabouts anyway. When the time came, with his hunter skills and Lumion's vigilance, it wouldn't be difficult for him to obtain an item that Raymond had used. Okay, Aurore didn't object. Lumion exhaled and asked, Aurore, uh, Grand Soa, are you capable of channeling spirits? As a mystery prior, I possess knowledge on various subjects. Aurore chuckled in self-deprecation. How did your conversation with the three foreigners go? Lumion quickly recounted his discussion with the enigmatic lady and his conversation with Brian, Leia, and Valentine, but he avoided mentioning the entity's prayer. Aurore listened attentively and let out a sigh. It's perilous to actively resist corruption, but it's the only way to explore the dream ruins, uncover their secrets, and find the key to break the cycle. It'll be a difficult journey for you. What's so terrible about it? Lumion patted his chest. I'm saving myself. Aurore nodded slightly. You can use my gray amber perfume. We have lilac at home, and I also have deer musk and candle making ingredients. Only tulips need to be acquired elsewhere. I remember Madame Police has a garden, but I don't know if it's blooming. It has bloomed, Lumion affirmed with certainty. During the last cycle, when he and Aurore visited the castle to borrow the carriage, they noticed that many flowers in the garden had already bloomed, which was unusual for early spring in the mountains. Aurore acknowledged tersely. Regardless, you must explore the castle in the afternoon. You can pick a few flowers while you're at it. Will that woman send those items into the dream ruins for you? Yes, Lumion replied, feeling confident in his assumption. Aurore pondered for a moment before saying, I'll give you the integrity brooch before you depart this afternoon. Madame Poilis' castle is filthy, and it might involve the undead. It could be very useful. It's not necessary. Keep it with you to protect yourself from Madame Police, Lumion insisted, anticipating his sister's objections. Valentine is a fanatical believer of the eternal blazing sun. According to you, as a beyonder, he should have chosen the sun pathway. He would be more useful than the integrity brooch. Based on Aurori's observations over the past few years, fanatical believers of the eternal blazing sun typically chose the sun pathway. This also made sense. Eternal Blazing Sun believers who chose the Sun Pathway tended to become more and more fanatical unless they didn't believe in this true god from the beginning. That's true, Aurora conceded. You can practice the simplest way to activate spirit vision. Afterward, take a nap at noon to replenish your energy. I'll teach you the ancient Hermes and Hermes words required for the ritual tonight. Upon hearing his sister's words, Lumion suddenly recalled something she often said when she was rushing her manuscripts. The schedule is tight, and the task is enormous. At 3.20pm, 
Lumion stood on the hillside overlooking the administrator's castle when he spotted Madame Poilis approaching the village with her lady's maid, Kathy. Madame Poilis wore a stunning grayish-blue dress that had a slight fluffiness to it, and her hair was tied back in an elegant bun. As soon as they were out of sight, Lumion hurried to the back of the hill where Ryan, Leia, and Valentine were already waiting. They appeared to be in their original clothes, having made no preparations for what was to come. Lumion was surprised to see that they were unarmed and asked, You're not carrying any weapons? Ryan, who was only slightly taller than 1.7 meters, smiled and replied, I don't need to carry a weapon with me. Valentine, dressed in a white vest and a thin blue tweed coat, echoed Ryan's sentiment. I don't need a weapon. Leia, on the other hand, pulled out a small, exquisite silver revolver from her Mersalian boots. This is my weapon. She flipped open the barrel to reveal different colored bullets engraved with various patterns and symbols. They have different beyonder effects. Pa! Leia snapped the barrel shut and asked Lumion with a smile, What weapon did you bring? One of you doesn't need a weapon. The other doesn't need to carry a weapon with him. And one has such a good-looking and powerful revolver. It makes me look silly. He lifted the dark jacket on his back to reveal an iron-black axe tucked into his belt. Without waiting for Ryan and the others to speak, he sighed and said, You all look like Beyonders, and I'm like a gangster preparing for a fight. Leia chuckled, her bells tinkling along. You have a talent for self-deprecation. It's better than being mocked by others. Lumion pointed to the steep hill behind them. Let's climb up now. We can't waste any more time. All right. Leia in her tight dress was the first to climb. She moved with agility and her balance was exceptional. Using the grooves in the terrain, she ascended the hill with ease. What was even more remarkable was that the four silver bells in her person remained motionless and silent. Lumion followed closely behind, using the hunter potion to strengthen his body and scaling the previously unclimbable hill with the help of rocks and tree roots, although he wasn't as carefree and nimble as his companion. After regaining his balance, he glanced back and witnessed Ryan seizing Valentine's shoulder and hoisting him up. In a swift motion, Ryan vaulted onto a jutting boulder amidst the hill. Without hesitation, he sprang forward once more, delivering Valentine to Lumion and Leia's vicinity. Throughout the entire endeavor, his physique appeared to have expanded in size. This left Lumion in awe. Although the hill wasn't high, it was still too exaggerated to be scaled with just two jumps. Hunters definitely couldn't do it. After snapping out of his daze, Lumion looked at the castle-shaped building with two towers and the surrounding garden. He suggested to the three foreigners, We'll go around to the back door. Wait a moment. Ryan stopped him and glanced at Leia. Leia remained silent and strode two steps towards the rear entrance of the castle-like structure. Her lips moved soundlessly, muttering something under her breath. In the next instant, the four small silver bells attached to her veil and boots jingled. The sound was not deafening, but it was urgent and intense. Leia pivoted and addressed Lumion and the rest. It's a treacherous path. A grave problem indeed. With that, she took two steps towards the front entrance. Ding, ding, ding. The bells continued to ring, growing even more insistent and pressing. We'll likely encounter significant trouble if we attempt to enter through the front. Leia's tone was severe, but there was a hint of a smile on her face. What if we climb in through a window? Ryan inquired. Leia nodded and altered course, making her way towards the garden. This time, although the bells rang, they were faint and slow. Leia grinned and exhaled. This route is safe. Lumion, who had observed the entire process, felt bewildered. He couldn't fathom what the three foreigners were up to. Is this how Beyonders operate? He recollected his sister's teachings and queried, divining the danger? Indeed, Leia nodded and turned to Valentine. I'll scout ahead. Be prepared. Understood, Valentine responded gravely. What preparations? Lumion asked, confused. Leia chuckled, prepare to cast divine spells and conjure flames. Then what's the purpose of creating flames? Before Lumion could ask, Leia had strolled into the garden and headed towards the castle. She arrived at a window and signaled that everything was clear. Let's go. Ryan informed the group as he hastened towards Leia. Valentine and Lumion followed closely behind. 
As they passed the bed of tulips, Lumion reached out to pluck one, but Ryan stopped him with his forearm. He didn't ask Lumion why he was doing this and only said gently, There's no hurry. We can pick flowers later. If picking it causes some incident, our mission will be compromised. That's true. Lumion fully drew upon this experience. Soon, they arrived at a row of windows on the side of the castle. Chapter 65 Third Floor The administrator's official residence was originally the castle of the Dariej nobles, with defense being the top priority. The windows were narrow and high up, making the lighting poor even during the day. However, to make it suitable for living, the owner had installed many new glass windows on the ground floor later on. Lumion peered through the patterned glass and saw that the banquet hall was empty and deserted. There are very few servants, Leia sighed softly. With many open windows during the day, fresh air mixed with the fragrance of flowers flowed in, creating excellent conditions for Lumion and the others to infiltrate. Taking advantage of the lack of servants on the first floor, the four of them climbed into the hall one after another. However, they didn't rush to go deeper and instead found a hiding spot nearby. Leia turned her head towards Valentine, who was clinging close behind an ornamental pillar, and said, I'll scout ahead, make preparations. Okay, Valentine nodded coldly. Lumion was squatting behind a stone platform with a porcelain vase. When he heard this, he stuck his head out and reminded them, There's no need to explore the first floor. It's often used to entertain guests, so there's nothing unusual. Ever since Administrator Beos and Madame Poilis moved in, his sister Aurore would visit the castle occasionally as a guest or borrow a pony. A few times, Lumion took the opportunity to follow her and freeload on cakes, bread, and drinks. When the Administrator and Madame Poilis were out, he would occasionally look for Louis Lund, the butler, and tour the first floor with him. I'll head straight to the stairs, Leia said, understanding. She didn't attempt to walk in a straight line through the empty banquet hall. Instead, she hugged the wall and circled around towards the stairs. The four silver bells remained eerily silent. As she passed by one of the rooms, she suddenly heard footsteps approaching from very close to the door. Lumion, in a prime position, even caught a glimpse of a male servant in a red shirt and white pants, about to collide head-on with Leia. She had no cover in sight. Leia didn't panic. She turned around, placed her hand on the wall, and scaled the oil painting hanging two meters above the ground. Then, she stood on her tiptoes and stepped onto the frame. She stood firmly with her back against the wall without letting the oil painting drop. Lumion wanted to applaud because it reminded him of an acrobatic performance he had seen in Dariej last year at a circus. The male servant left the room and instinctively looked around before walking towards the kitchen. Just as he took a few steps forward, Leia slid soundlessly to the ground against the oil painting. Then, she rolled twice and hid behind a pillar. After the male servant disappeared from the banquet hall, she leaned against the wall again. Finally, she arrived at the staircase and confirmed that everything was clear. Upon seeing this, Lumion darted out of the stone platform and ran over in a straight line. He was so fast that he reached Leia in less than three seconds. However, he wasn't the fastest. Ryan completed the journey in just the time it took to take one breath. Valentine wasn't slow either. His physique was clearly stronger than ordinary people. Without another word, Leia took the lead and the four of them hurriedly entered the stairs, arriving at the second floor of the residence. There were closed rooms on both sides of the corridor, with two rooms having light shine in through the windows at the end of the corridor. The overall environment was abnormally dark. Ryan suggested, surveying their surroundings. Let us split up and search different rooms. This will save time and make it easier to hide. However, we must remain no more than one room apart from each other, in case something happens and we cannot save each other in time. Leia and the others nodded in agreement. Lumion promptly approached the nearest room, pressing his ear to the door to listen for any movement inside. After a moment, he deftly turned the handle and slipped inside. The room belonged to a maid. He searched for a while but found no clues. He moved on to the next room. In this way, 
The four of them carefully avoided the servants and explored most of the second floor. Towards the end of their search, Lumion arrived at the door of the room that had traumatized him, Louis Lund's bedroom. According to the historical sequence of events, this butler should have given birth yesterday. His stomach had been torn open, and even with sutures, he would not recover quickly. He must be recuperating in bed, Lumion thought to himself, contemplating whether to push the door open and have a chat with Louis Lund. As someone who had personally experienced bizarre phenomena, this male butler undoubtedly knew a great deal. However, this would contradict their principle of observation and exploration. Lumian couldn't guarantee that Louis Lund wouldn't reveal his presence to Madame Poilis. The fact that he had given birth to the other party's child meant there were no secrets between them. Silencing him would only confirm Madame Poilis's suspicions. What a pity. If only I knew something about hypnosis. Lumian sighed inwardly. He habitually pressed his ear to the door, listening for any sound. Nothing. As a hunter, Lumian's hearing was acute enough to detect breathing from two to three meters away, even with a barrier in between. No one? Louis Lund has just given birth. Where can he go? Lumian turned the doorknob and slowly pushed the door open, peering inside. The room was clean and free of the bloodstains he had seen before. Louis Lund was nowhere to be found. Lumian furrowed his brow and stepped inside. The signs of a recent human presence were evident. A blanket rumpled on the bed, a cigarette butt on the nightstand, a black coat hung on the chair, and faint footsteps on the floor. In addition, there were bloodstains on the edge of the bed that had not been cleaned. Apart from this, Lumian also saw some bloodstains that hadn't been wiped off from the edge of the bed. Lumian nodded to himself. He had indeed given birth here yesterday. Suddenly, faint voices outside the window caught his attention. He hurried to the glass window, turned his body, and peered out. In the stables, Louis Lund, black-haired, blue-eyed, and dressed in a white shirt, black suit, dark pants, and leather shoes, conversed with the carriage driver, Sewell, who had sent the siblings to Paramita. Lumin was taken aback by Louis Lund's healthy and steady appearance. Is this the person who had just given birth yesterday? And it was a C-section. Lumian suppressed the shock in his heart and listened carefully to what Louis Lund and Siwa were saying. Unexpectedly, these two fellows were only exchanging experiences in gardening. What's the matter? With Lumian inside the room for so long, Ryan, donning a dark bowler hat, pushed open the door and entered the room, followed by Leia and Valentine. Lumian quickly filled them in on Louis Lund's situation. Ryan pondered for a moment before asking, Have you heard of Earth Mother? The Dariesh region had a border with the Fena Potter Kingdom. Shepherds often went there. Coupled with his sister's basic education, Lumion was no stranger to this. Yes, the deity that Fena Potter believes in. Ryan nodded and said, Earth Mother is associated with fertility, healing, and life. These domains are reflected in the beyonder powers of the corresponding pathway. While I'm not saying that Louis Lund's situation is related to the Earth Mother, it's possible that his ability to give birth and quick recovery are linked to these domains. Is that so? Lumian found this plausible after some thought. After all, men were already capable of giving birth. What was so strange about them being out and about after a C-section? Did you find anything? Lumian asked Ryan and the others. Ryan shook his head. They were all normal servants' quarters. We may have to check the third floor. Lumian felt a sense of unease wash over him. Madame Poilis and Administrator Baos' quarters comprised a bedroom, study, solarium, and activity room, all located on the third floor. This posed a significant risk. Very well, Ryan replied without hesitation. The four of them proceeded to sneak up to the third floor. Many of the doors were ajar, and the corridor was brightly lit. Lumian made a beeline for the bedroom, which was adorned with a light-colored velvet blanket on the bed, a small bookshelf stocked with bedtime reading materials, a capacious cloakroom brimming with a variety of clothes, a safe containing precious collections, a set of plush beige sofas, a table displaying five photo frames and documents, and a fluffy white carpet covering the entire room. 
Lumian and company surveyed the room and simultaneously headed towards the table. The books on the table were mostly popular novels, including Forrest Wall's masterpiece, The Adventurer V, Vice Admiral Ailment, and Aurore's latest work, The Substitute Detective. The documents pertained mainly to various matters in the Dariage area. As for the five photos displayed in the frames, four were of Madame Poilice, and one belonged to a man Lumian did not recognize. No photo of the administrator? He exclaimed, surprised. Madame Poilice was the sole subject of the four photos, each depicting her in different clothing and poses. The male photo was not of Administrator Bayos, who, after all, was the male owner of the house. Wasn't this peculiar? Leia nodded thoughtfully. Perhaps the administrator's status in this family is akin to that of a butler. Have you ever seen a butler's photograph displayed in someone's home? Then who is this man? Lumion inquired, pointing to the photo frame on the side. The frame contained a color photograph of a man in his late twenties. He was wearing a red shirt, a black velvet coat, and dark pants with tassels. He sported a pair of short lace-up boots and was dressed very fashionably. He bore a striking resemblance to Madame Poilis, with light eyebrows, bright brown eyes, and brown hair parted in an exaggerated 7-3 style. His lips were curled up, giving him the air of a hooligan who frequented high society. All in all, this man's facial features were not extraordinary, but they were pleasing to the eye. Madame Poilis's brother? Lumian hazarded a guess based on his appearance. Chapter 66 Crib Leia gazed at the man in the photo, lost in thought. After receiving the request for help, we set off two days later to gather relevant information, she said. Madame Poilis's full name is Poilis de Roquefort, isn't it? She paused for a moment before continuing. We investigated the Roquefort family in Dariage and found no trace of Poilis. In Intis, a woman could choose to keep her maiden name after getting married. If there was a de in her name, it meant that she was once a noble. The intus meaning of de was from, and the surname behind it was the fiefdom of the time. None? Lumin was surprised. He knew something was wrong with Madame Poilis, but he didn't expect her identity to be fake. In Dariage, Roquefort is a large family with many members, including a provincial senator. We were in a hurry and didn't have time to conduct a more detailed investigation. We could only confirm that there was no such person as Poilis, but a man named Poulet had been missing for over a year. Poulet? Lumian asked. What's his relationship with Madame Poilis? They look alike. Ryan shook his head. Without enough information, it's impossible to make a guess. What we do know is that Poulet de Roquefort was a popular dandy in Treyarch and he had many illegitimate children. Many people hated and detested him. Perhaps this is why he had no choice but to leave, or was forced to leave Dariage. Dandyism? Lumion was unfamiliar with the term. Aurore subscribed to magazines and newspapers targeted towards women or focused on national affairs. There were some materials on the supernatural, but none involved male matters. Leia chuckled. To put it simply, it's a Casanova who dresses fashionably, speaks elegantly, and acts freely. Lumian sighed and mocked. The people of Treyar sure know how to live life. They packaged their affairs as a thought, a doctrine, and a trend. When it came to cheating, Treyars were at the forefront. The Padre, in front of the Treyars, he was still a child. In the past year, Treyar has constructed numerous arcades. Aurore remarked while sipping her Marquis black tea, regaling Madame Poilis, Nazelli, and the others with the latest trends from her two-story subterranean abode. What's an arcade? It's a covered street with glass roofing and marble flooring. Elegant and stunning shops line both sides. During the day, light filters in from above, and at night, gas lamps illuminate the area. Carriages are prohibited from entering. The most renowned arcade is called the Opera House Arcade. Madame Poilis, holding a white porcelain cup filled with black tea, watched Aurore with her bright brown eyes, 
listening intently with a smile. That sounds like something I must see, Nazeli sighed, imagining the elegance, fashion, cleanliness, and brightness of the arcade. Aurore's knowledge of the latest Intis trends was the primary reason why they had accepted the afternoon tea invitation. After chatting for a while, the discussion turned to Aurore's work and relationships. Love is just so unfathomable and elusive, Madame Poilis mused aloud. So this is why you fall in love with so many men at the same time? Aurore couldn't help but inwardly criticize. Madame Poilis gazed at her with a faint smile and sighed. Sometimes I get so angry because of his mistakes. I wish I could kill him and send him to his death. But when he's actually facing death, I can't help but save him and refuse to tell him. Perhaps this is love. In the master's bedroom of the administrator's residence, Madame Poilis may have once fallen in love with Poulet, a believer of dandyism, and engaged in a forbidden relationship resulting in her disavowal by her family. She then had to marry someone and use her family's connections to secure the administrative position in Cordu for him. Lumian deduced this based on the stories and troops written by his sister. This explained why Administrator Bayos' standing in the family was relatively low. Perhaps, Ryan replied simply, keep searching, but don't attempt to open the safe or anything that may trigger an alarm. Lumian and his companions dispersed immediately and searched elsewhere. Despite the hunter's ability to observe subtle traces, Lumian still found nothing. The same was true for Leia and the others. They had no choice but to move to the study and search patiently. As time passed, the four of them arrived at the end of the corridor, where a closed room stood opposite an open solarium. Beside it was a staircase leading to one of the towers. Ryan, who had finished searching the solarium, turned to Leia. Leia touched the small silver bell hanging from her veil, mumbling to herself as she walked towards the tightly shut wooden door. This time, the four bells did not ring. Leia heaved a sigh of relief and gently pushed the wooden door open. It was an empty room with a rocking crib in the middle. The crib was made of brown wood and installed inside a wooden frame. It was covered in clean but slightly worn cotton swaddling cloth that showed its age. The crib was empty. This was the nursery where Madame Poilis' two children had once slept. Apart from the bed, there were no toys in the room. Scattered on the ground were wheat, barley, rice, rye, and other plants, making it look rather strange. Furthermore, these plants were well preserved, as if they had only been brought in a few days ago. Valentin's body glowed as he entered the room and circled around. Soon, he returned to the door and shook his head at Ryan and Leia. There's no evil aura. All right. Leia looked at Lumian. Shall we head to the tower next? Lumian had always been curious about the castle's two towers. He never expected to have a chance to visit them today. Valentin left the strange nursery. Ryan grabbed the handle and planned to close the wooden door and restore it to its original state. At this moment, Lumian's gaze drifted inside. The brown wooden crib swayed gently, yet the tightly shut windows of the room in the solarium opposite, with their floor-to-ceiling panes, allowed no breeze to enter the corridor. What? Lumian's pupils dilated. Leia noticed his distress and turned to look. The crib continued to sway, as though an invisible baby lay within its swaddling cloths. Leia raised her hand to her glabella, as if trying to ease her tired eyes. She readied herself to activate her spirit vision and see what lay inside the crib. Suddenly, the four small silver bells in her veil and boots jingled, as if they were about to burst. Ryan's face froze as he yelled, Get out of here! With that, he dashed into the solarium, crashing through the floor-to-ceiling windows in an attempt to create a path of escape from the castle. Bang! A loud thud echoed throughout the room as Ryan hit the windows, yet there was no sound of glass shattering. The transparent faces of young children appeared on the row of windows, some of them mere infants with pale, inexplicably terrifying faces. As Ryan bumped into them, they opened their mouths in unison and let out a haunting wail. Their cries echoed throughout the third floor of the castle, casting an eerie gloom over the entire area. The walls and glass were adorned with the translucent faces of children, some wailing while others stared blankly at Lumian, Leia, Valentine, and Ryan. Lumian shuddered with fear as he felt their cold gazes upon him. Suddenly, 
Valentine's body was engulfed in a dark golden light, which quickly spread to envelop Lumion, Leia, and himself. A warm sensation spread throughout Lumion's body, dispelling his fear and filling him with courage. He drew his iron black axe with newfound confidence. Meanwhile, Ryan seemed to grow taller and more imposing. Dawn-like rays of light surrounded him, coalescing into a silver-white full-body armor and a massive broadsword of light. With a mighty swing, Ryan cleaved at the floor-to-ceiling windows, dispersing the pale white faces of the children into smoke as they screamed. But the glass didn't break, and more faces appeared, their shrill cries tormenting Lumion and his companions. Who dares to trespass the castle? A woman's voice boomed, echoing through the halls. Almost immediately, Lumion spotted a figure on the other side of the corridor, standing on the second floor. She was a middle-aged woman with brown hair and eyes. She was rather good-looking without any wrinkles. She was the midwife who had helped Louis Lund's delivery. In her hand, she held a pair of enormous scissors that could decapitate a human while donning a grayish-white gown. It was as if she had just returned from pruning a branch in the garden. She glared at Lumion and his companions and spoke in a deep, threatening voice. You deserve to die. In the subterranean two-story abode, Madame Poilis jolted suddenly, and her countenance altered. She delicately placed the porcelain teacup on the table and smiled at Aurore. My apologies. I've just recollected an urgent matter that requires my immediate attention at home. Huh? Aurore was shocked. Poilis rose from her seat her expression filled with regret. I had intended to stay and discuss your work and its beautiful and poignant portrayal of love. Aurora responded quickly, Please, you're more than welcome. I cannot, unfortunately. Madame Poilis shook her head. It concerns my children. Chapter 67 Evil Spells Valentine caught sight of the woman in the grayish-white dress. His eyes burned with hatred as he stretched his arms out as if embracing the sun. A blinding pillar of light descended from the sky and struck the target clutching the enormous scissors. The surroundings burst into light in an instant. The transparent faces on the walls and glass vanished before they could even scream. The woman's body had clearly caught fire and was evaporating, but then it suddenly vanished. Lumion found this scene eerily familiar. The mouth orifice monster had displayed similar behavior when he was hunting it invisibility. The woman might not have concealed herself, but she certainly wasn't dead. Thus, Lumion didn't feel any relief. Instead, he approached Ryan, who now towered over him. Ryan, covered in silver armor and wielding a broadsword of light, was the person Lumion trusted the most among those present. It was evident that Ryan excelled at combat. Leia stood there when suddenly, the face of a pale child emerged on the wall behind her, transforming into the woman in the grayish-white dress. The woman's enormous scissors clamped down on Leia's neck. Crack! Leia's head drooped, but no blood spurted forth. Her body and head swiftly shriveled and thinned, transforming into a ragged paper effigy that softly settled onto the ground. Not far away, her silhouette donning a pleated cashmere dress outlined itself. With a clang, Ryan, his face concealed by a silver visor, hoisted the Sword of Dawn and strode towards the spot where Leia had stood, sweeping the weapon diagonally at the woman. The woman brandished her scissors in an attempt to block the attack, but was pushed back into the wall by the force of the blow. Her form vanished once again. As Valentine, clad in a thin blue tweed jacket, stood with his back turned, the woman suddenly replaced the swollen and pallid visage. She leaned out and struck the nape of Valentine's neck. Look out! Leia cried out as soon as she spotted the woman, alerting her companion. Valentine snorted and crossed his arms. Golden illusory flames burst forth from the void surrounding him, intertwining and transforming the corridor into an ocean pulsating with the radiance of the sun. The woman winced in agony as her body was consumed by the intense flames. She retreated back into the interior of the walls, reverting to the swollen, pallid face. The translucent face melted instantly into wisps of black gas within the golden illusory flames before dissipating. Clang! Ryan's sword of dawn struck the same spot again, causing the entire castle to tremble. Despite his efforts, he was still a step too late to stop the woman. Lumion quickly grasped the gravity of the situation. 
The woman who had delivered Lewis London was linked to the transparent faces of children on the wall and glass. Not only could she transform into one of them, but she could also transform into a ghost form, evading attacks and deflecting damage. In other words, she could attack from any wall or glass on the third floor of the castle at any given time, and Ryan and the others' counterattacks were ineffective. With this realization, Lumion immediately distanced himself from the floor-to-ceiling windows and the surrounding walls, and walked to the middle of the solarium. At that moment, ghostly faces appeared on the ground and ceiling. The woman suddenly emerged from behind Lumion's feet and quickly reached for his thigh with a pair of scissors. Lumion's heart raced with a sense of danger. Without bothering to confirm where the attack was coming from, he jumped into the air and dodged to the side. Despite his efforts, he was still half a beat too slow. A deep gash was left on the lower part of his thigh, and blood instantly gushed out. As soon as the drops of blood landed on the ground, the woman, who had switched spots, pointed at them and they condensed into a thin blood-colored figure. Without any hesitation, the blood-colored figure turned to Lumion, who had rolled to the recliner and pounced at him, feeding on his blood and growing stronger with each drop. At the same time, Lumion endured intense pain and felt his blood running out of control. Almost instantly, Ryan jumped in. In midair, he raised the broadsword of light high and slashed at the blood-colored figure, pinning it to the ground and shattering it with the transparent faces around him. Leia had somersaulted to Lumion's side and pressed her right hand on his thigh wound. To Lumion's surprise, the wound magically moved along with Leia's right palm, all the way down to the side of his calf which wasn't rich in blood vessels. The bleeding immediately decreased. The woman suddenly appeared from the ceiling. Her brown eyes burned with a blazing life. The blood dripping from Lumion's calf was ignited, producing a bright flame that resembled the spring sun. It quickly spread deep into the wound and into the blood vessels in his body. At that moment, Lumion felt his life rapidly draining away. With a pop, Ryan stabbed the two-handed broadsword condensed from light into the ground. Around him in the area where Lumion and Leia were, rays of dawn-like light appeared, filling all space. In the morning light, the remaining blood-colored figures quickly melted, and the bright and beautiful flames on Lumion's calf quickly extinguished. The second of burning had sealed his wounds together, stopping the bleeding. Ryan pulled out his broadsword and bellowed in a deep, commanding voice, This environment is unsuitable. We must depart at once. What he really meant was that the woman was not as powerful as she appeared. She was almost invincible and impossible to target due to the unique conditions of the third floor of the castle that greatly enhanced her abilities. Without waiting for his companions to react, Ryan charged after the woman. Although he was still slightly slower than his opponent, who could move with the aid of translucent faces, he spared no effort and attacked with powerful slashes, diagonal cuts, and stabs. He forced his adversary into a constant state of motion, forcing her to constantly shift positions after each attack. Together with the holy light summoned by Valentine and the golden flames he conjured, the two of them managed to temporarily subdue the woman, thus preventing Leia and Lumion from being harmed. Taking advantage of this opportunity, Leia leapt onto the armchair and dashed back and forth across the sofa, tables, recliners, and ornaments, making sure to avoid touching the ground. Throughout this process, the silver bells in her veil and boots chimed incessantly, sometimes melodious and sometimes grating. Lumion no longer felt safe on the ground. He climbed onto the table and scanned the ceiling above and the floor below, analyzing Leia's movements. Drawing from his previous experience, he deduced the route the woman was attempting to use to escape. Soon, Leia ceased her acrobatic maneuvers. To the tower, quickly! Just as she finished speaking, the woman thrust her head out of the ceiling and barked in a stern voice. You damned bastards! Each word was enunciated with precision, causing Lumion and his companion's hearts to race, their heads to spin, and their vision to blur. It was a thoroughly unpleasant experience. Valentine endured the discomfort and stretched his arms out once more. A brilliant and pristine light flooded the ceiling. Let's move, Ryan commanded. Lumion immediately leaped off the table, enduring the pain in his calf. Stepping on the transparent faces, he raced towards the tower, with Leia and Valentine close behind. Only Ryan, covered in silver armor, was in a rush to escape. He lifted the Sword of Dawn and sliced the woman who had poked her head out, preventing her from stopping his companions from fleeing. After Leia and the others ascended the stairs leading to the tower, 
He turned around and gave chase with a leap. A woman emerged from a transparent face on the side wall and let out a piercing scream. Accompanied by the scream, a layer of black malevolent flames ignited on the surface of Ryan's silver armor. Ryan immediately felt his stamina rapidly depleting. Without hesitation, he deactivated the dawn armor. Spots of light resembling the morning sun scattered in all directions, along with the black flames and dissipated into the air. Holding the broadsword of light, Ryan took the opportunity to leap and depart from the castle's third floor, entering the stairs. At this moment, Lumion, aware that he was a little weak and unable to make use of the environment, ran in second place. Ahead of him was Leia, whose silver bell was ringing softly. Leia suddenly came to a halt. Lumion hastily slowed down as he heard chattering. He then looked ahead and was taken aback. The tower was not large and he could even be considered small. There were stairs leading to various firing ports. The walls were densely packed with children. They were dressed in different clothes. Some appeared to have just been born, while others were three or four years old. Their limbs resembled bird claws with unnaturally sharp tips. Using their bird claws, these children were like birds in a forest, perching on the wall and occupying most of the area. Lumion's scalp tingled as he saw over a hundred human children's faces, bodies, and wicked sharp bird claws combined with an abnormal perching method. He once again felt as though his mind, eyes, and soul had been corrupted, just as when he had witnessed Louis Lund give birth. The children had not yet noticed the intrusion. A small number of them were happily discussing different topics. The sky is so blue out there. I want to go outside. No way. Mummy said we have to be able to retract our claws and be like normal humans before we can go out. At that moment, Ryan caught up to the three of them and said urgently, Stay away! He then turned around and barricaded the entrance of the tower like a giant, holding the Sword of Dawn in his hand. Leia and Valentine didn't inquire why. They ran frantically and found stairs and other obstacles to hide behind. Although Lumion didn't comprehend, his survival instincts told him to follow orders. All of you, come down here! The woman's sharp voice reverberated. Each word drilled into Lumion and his companion's ears, weakening them simultaneously. Immediately afterwards, the woman in the grayish-white dress appeared at the corner of the staircase. The entire tower was filled with the aura of life, and no pale faces were visible. Chapter 68 Purification Upon seeing that Ryan was blocking the entrance of the tower with the Sword of Dawn, the woman in the grayish-white dress felt a sense of foreboding. She swiftly turned the enormous scissors around, clamped them around her neck, and pulled gently. A vivid red stream of blood gushed out immediately, accompanied by her sharp cry. The blood flowed in every direction as if it had a life of its own, enveloping her entire body. It was as though the lady had adorned herself with blood-colored full-body armor. Meanwhile, Ryan held the Sword of Dawn in reverse with both hands and genuflected. With a pop, he stabbed the two-handed broadsword, which had condensed from light, into the stone floor in front of him. The broadsword disintegrated, transforming into specks of light that resembled the morning sun. They were densely packed and innumerable, forming a flickering and violent hurricane that swept forward. Wherever the hurricane of light passed, the stone floor was shaved thin. Some of the steps were flattened and exaggerated cracks appeared. The woman was completely engulfed before she could dodge. The blood-colored armor on her body lasted for a second before completely shattering and melting into the light. This time, she had left a special environment on the third floor and was in a place filled with life force. She could no longer use the pale and transparent faces to shift position. She could only watch as tiny blood-colored cracks appeared on her body. The cracks expanded rapidly and instantly turned into a hideous wound that cut through the woman. As her screams reverberated, her body crumbled into pieces of flesh. The pieces of flesh in her spirit were still being ravaged by the storm of light until the hurricane subsided. The flesh was ground and the spirit dissipated. Although Ryan tried his best to prevent the hurricane of light from implicating the others, he was still too weak to control it. He destroyed a large swath of the walls on the side and the stairs behind him. If Lumion, Leia, and Valentine hadn't found cover in advance, they would have more or less been injured. Wah! 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 The bird-clawed children who were climbing the wall were frightened and cried out. Lumion and the others' ears buzzed as if they had suffered a noise attack. Let's go! Ryan turned around and slammed into the most damaged wall nearby. Crash! The wall shattered and a large number of rocks fell. 
A huge hole that humans could crawl through appeared. When Valentin and Lumion ran over, Ryan grabbed each of them with one hand and jumped from a height of more than 10 meters to a tree outside the castle. BAM! In midair, he kicked the tree and flew diagonally away from the castle. Leia descended on her own, using the protrusion of the castle's outer walls to descend rapidly, landing on the ground in a breath or two. Ryan, Lumion, and Valentine waited for Leia for a few seconds as the trees shook violently. After meeting up with her, they ran to the back of the hill and left before the other servants caught up. In less than a minute, Madame Poilly stood expressionless beside the ruptured hole at the entrance of the tower, wearing a grayish-blue fluffy dress. The children crawling on the walls quickly accused the outsiders of being barbaric and cruel, calling out for their mother. Madame Poilis, with an ashen face, remained silent. In the forest beside Cordu village, Lumion and his companions stopped and looked back at the castle. Leia was about to speak when she frowned and said, I hear a baby crying. It's very close. She turned to Ryan and the others and asked, Can you hear it? Lumion was startled and listened carefully vaguely hearing the sound of a baby crying, but it was not as close as Leia had described. In fact, it sounded distant. I can hear it a little, Ryan answered truthfully. Valentine's expression changed as if he had thought of something. At the same time, Leia's face twisted in pain and she instinctively pressed a hand to her abdomen, where there was a distinct swelling and squirming. Valentine quickly went over to Leia and placed his hand on her head, saying a word in ancient Hermes that Lumion had just learned. Sun! Golden translucent liquid drops condensed out of thin air and sprinkled over Leia's body. Illusory black smoke immediately rose from Leia's body, and her expression alternated between distortion and normalcy. Finally, her abdomen returned to its original state and stopped squirming. Phew! Leia breathed a sigh of relief. I narrowly avoided becoming a monster's mother. Luckily, we took care of it in time before it could take root. She wore a smile on her face, unfazed by the bizarre and terrifying experience. Leia turned to Lumion, Ryan, and Valentine. Would you like to purify yourselves with holy water? I worry that you may unknowingly become mothers. Yes, Lumion agreed immediately. But Valentine approached Ryan first. Placing his hand on Ryan's head, he uttered the ancient Hermes word, Son. Holy water formed and sprinkled down, but nothing unusual happened to Ryan. Valentine purified himself next, and no black smoke appeared. He then walked over to Lumion and placed his hand on the hunter's head. Sun, he repeated, and droplets of translucent liquid fell. Lumion suddenly felt a sharp pain in his heart, as if a snake were burrowing inside. Each time it moved, Lumion's heart raced or slowed down, causing extreme discomfort. In the next moment, Lumion heard the mysterious voice that seemed to come from an infinite distance, but also sounded close by. It wasn't as clear as in his dream, so it prevented him from entering a near-death state. Just as Lumion couldn't take it anymore, Valentine stopped the purification and nodded coldly. There's nothing wrong with you either. <sighs> Lumion breathed a silent sigh of relief, feeling as though he had been pulled back from the brink of death. At that moment, he roughly understood what had just happened. According to the mysterious lady, he was severely corrupted by a certain hidden evil god. He could only maintain his normal state by relying on the timely seal of that great existence. Accepting the purification of holy water was like a devil embracing holy light. He was bound to experience problems. In other words, he was an evil god pollutant that needed to be purified. Thankfully, thankfully. If Valentine had kept going, or had been a little stronger... I would have exposed my abnormality even with the seal of that great existence. I can't undergo purification in the future. I won't even be able to find someone to exercise the evil. I'm the evil that needs to be exercised. Lumion rejoiced and didn't let the remnant pain appear on his face. Upon realizing that his companions had been cleansed and all risks had been eliminated, Ryan promptly suggested, If we make our way to the edge of the village now, we'll activate the loop. In the event that Madame Paulice discovers a clue and catches up with us, we can attempt to flee and restart the cycle. Noticing Valentine's perplexed expression, Ryan added, I'm concerned that if we die once during a cycle, there may be repercussions once the loop is lifted. Therefore, it's best not to perish at this moment. Understood, 
Leia agreed before Valentin could interject with any radical ideas. Observing that his two companions had arrived at the same conclusion, Valentin simply nodded. At that moment, Lumian glanced at them before waving his hand and declaring, You guys go on ahead. I'm going home. Ryan furrowed his brow in confusion and asked, Aren't you worried that Madame Police might come after you? Lumian grinned and replied, I'm not like you. As soon as I entered the tower, I was attempting to avoid the monster children's gaze. They didn't spot me, and the midwife who saw me was killed by you. It seems that even channeling spirits is ineffective. How could Madame Police have suspected that a powerful infiltration team like yours had an ordinary person like me with them? Think about it. Prior to your arrival in Cordu, no one had attempted to infiltrate the castle. The moment you arrived, something immediately occurred. Who else could be suspected but you guys? If I escape with you, I'll be dragged down with you. Ryan, Leia, and Valentin were left speechless. This was clearly an operation concocted by Lumian. Why did it appear as though he had nothing to do with it in the end? Were they going to shoulder all the blame? Goodbye. If Madame Police doesn't dare to confront official beyonders like you and the cycle isn't restarted, I'll see you at Old Tavern tomorrow. Lumian waved his hand and dashed towards the edge of the forest, reminding them, Take care, my cabbages. Once he exited the forest, Lumian's expression became serious. The explanation he provided for not escaping with Ryan and the others wasn't the only reason. It was more of an excuse. His primary objective was to return home immediately and rendezvous with Aurore. As soon as Aurore invited Madame Police for afternoon tea, someone snuck into the castle. And they were the prime suspects. Lumian had to inform his sister that if Madame Police came to interrogate and silence her, she should sell out the three foreigners and agree to Madame Police's imprisonment. She could discover and dangle valuable secrets to delay Madame Police for a while, preventing her from executing anyone on the spot. Only by staying alive would there be a chance. Even in the loop, Lumian couldn't afford to die easily in case something catastrophic occurred once the loop ended. Furthermore, once Madame Police caught up with Leia and the others, if she emerged victorious, one of Ryan and the other two would trigger the loop and erase their memories. If she lost, what was there to be concerned about? Lumian gritted his teeth and ran home through the village road, enduring the pain in his calf. Upon seeing Aurore standing at the door, appearing completely unharmed, he breathed a sigh of relief. Is everything all right? The siblings both inquired simultaneously. Chapter 69 Him? In response to his sister's concern, Lumian shook his head and declared, I'm fine. He surveyed his surroundings and suggested, Let us talk inside. Upon reaching the stove, he briefly narrated his expedition with Ryan and the others. Lumian then advised his sister that if Madame Poilis were to attack them, she must surrender and betray the three foreigners without hesitation. Considering the phenomena he had encountered in the castle, Lumian believed that the siblings could not defeat Madame Poilis. They were not even capable of handling the midwife. Aurore listened attentively and couldn't help but chuckle. From a logical standpoint, your tactics are indeed the best. But why do I find it peculiar? It is as though I have become the villain in a story. Furthermore, I am not the principal antagonist, the charismatic kind. What is important is the consequence, Lumian stressed to his sister. In your own words, one must endure the humiliation, bear the heavy burden, preserve the useful body, and wait for it to prove its worth in the future. Aurore couldn't help but rub her forehead. Have I taught you too many strange things? Yes, Lumian earnestly nodded. Aurore rolled her eyes. Okay, I understand. I will not confront Madame Poilis until the most crucial moment. When Madame Poilis noticed that the alarm had been triggered and attempted to leave, I did not stop her. I merely expressed reluctance and conversed with her for an additional minute. Right. Please elaborate on the specifics of your exploration. She seated herself at the dining table and listened intently, just in case Madame Poilis were to interrogate her in anger. Lumian pulled out a chair on the opposite side of the dining table and expounded on the expedition's accomplishments and battle process. As Aurore listened, her expression gradually became somewhat peculiar. What is the matter? Lumian noticed his sister's abnormality. After considerable deliberation, 
Aurora inquired with a strange expression. There is a portrait of a man in Madame Poilice's bedroom, and he resembles her. It's suspected that he is her brother. Yes, the three foreigners speculated that he might be a missing member of the rock fort named Pouli. Lumian recounted Ryan and the others' statements, including dandyism and the vast number of illegitimate children. He added, According to the three foreigners' investigation, there is no such person as Poilice in the Rockfort family. Aurore nodded and exhaled. Then I am quite sure that my guess is correct. Her expression remained peculiar, only growing more pronounced. What guess? Lumian asked, perplexed. Aurore gave him a sidelong glance before replying. Perhaps Madame Poilice is actually Poulet. What? That's absurd, Lumian exclaimed. One is a man and the other a woman. And Madame Poilice had two children. Who's to say she gave birth to them herself? Maybe the administrator did it for her, Aurore countered, a sneer curling her lip. And even if they are Madame Poilice's children, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. In the world of mysticism, anything is possible. Consider this. If Louis Lunn can give birth to a man, then why can't Poulet become a woman? That may be true, but... Lumian was still unconvinced. Aurora gave him a sly smile. The reason I dare to make such a guess, unlike the three foreigners, is because I've heard something. Or rather, I've witnessed something. Do you remember which pathway neighbors the hunter pathway? Assassin, Lumian replied without hesitation. He had been drawn to the name which was undoubtedly cooler than Hunter. In our organization, um, uh, the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, there was a man who was fascinated by the idea of an assassin and chose that pathway. Aurora explained, her expression growing stranger by the moment. At a gathering, he confided in us with a melancholy and troubled air that the potion an assassin needs to consume after reaching sequence 7 is called Witch. Witch? Lumian had a sinking feeling the moment he heard the potion's name. Yes, witch. In the world of mysticism, warlocks and witches are two entirely different concepts. You used to get them mixed up and call me a witch from time to time. It was rather unsettling, Aurora said, taking the opportunity to enlighten him. Drinking the witch potion would turn you into a witch. Acting as a witch causes your body to undergo a complete transformation, turning you into a woman. Lumian took a deep breath. Relieved that his first obtained characteristic was that of a hunter. Had he obtained something related to the assassin pathway, he might very well have been lost to it due to his eagerness. What happened to the man who was considering it? Did he drink it? Lumian asked, unable to resist. Aurora replied with a smile. He agonized over it for a long time. He didn't want to become a woman, but he also didn't want to stay at sequence 8. Eventually, someone persuaded him. Life is short. Why not give it a try? After that, I met him again at a gathering. No, he was already a her by then. She was already a woman by then. A beautiful and charming one at that. Lumian was momentarily speechless. Aurora grinned at him and added, clearly enjoying herself. In the future, should you reach sequence 5 and find yourself unable to obtain the sequence 4 materials for the hunter pathway, you might consider the demoness pathway instead. The assassin pathway is also known as the demoness pathway. Demoness? Lumian found the name assassin bewildering. The mysticism world was fraught with dangers. He deftly steered the conversation back on track. So Madame Poilice is truly Poulet, the Casanova. Even an assassin could transform into a demoness. A path that enabled a man to bear children was likely to transform a man into a woman. Aurore nodded warily and gazed out of the window. I suspect that Madame Poilice transitioned to a woman only after reaching a specific sequence. She had to disappear to avoid discovery by the authorities. According to the mysterious lady, the power of a deity's boon can also be divided into sequences. Her abnormal pathway would also include the ability to promote fertility, manipulate life, and control the undead. Aurora deduced that she could manipulate life and control the undead from Lumian's battle with the midwife. That was the same performance Madame Knight, who looked like Madame Poilice, had showcased in Paramita 
with the undead chasing after her. Aurora suddenly exclaimed, What's the matter? Lumion asked cautiously. Did his sister uncover another ominous truth? Aurora scowled at her brother and replied, At the afternoon tea, Madame Poilis said that love is unfathomable. She wished he would perish for his mistake, but when he faced death, she saved him and refused to tell the other party. I didn't comprehend it then, and I didn't dwell on it. Now, I wonder if she had an ulterior motive for saying that. Lumion was equally puzzled. She saved someone? When did she do that? Suddenly, he halted and stared at Aurora. The siblings remembered that Madame Knight had saved them by distracting the undead and Paramita. But that was from the preceding cycle. Lumion was about to reject it, but he couldn't. He and Aurora exchanged a look and realized their eyes were filled with shock and dread. If Madame Poilis was referring to that incident, it meant she retained some of her memories from the loop. It's impossible, Aurora muttered to herself. Never mind. Let's assume it's true. I'd rather overestimate our foe than underestimate them. Lumion concurred. Then he had a thought. Aurora, uh, Grand Soeur. Considering that Madame Poilis might have been a man, did she fall in love with you? I didn't do anything wrong. You were the one who spied on Louis Lund giving birth. Poilis is infatuated with you. Aurora reposed. Lumion muttered under his breath. Perhaps she believes that you instigated me. I don't usually associate with her, but I did once bring some people to see her having an affair with the Padre. She teased me for it. You, on the other hand, discuss literature and trends with her occasionally. You even go to her house to borrow a pony. Huh. Aurora's voice rose in disgust. Then why was she trying to set me up with those awful men you told me about? Lumion paused before responding. Maybe she's trying to discourage your interest in men and lead you to her instead. What kind of strange things have you been reading? Aurora glared at her brother. Not only could Lumion provide a rational answer, but he did it with forceful verb. Your novels. You wrote something similar in one of them. Is that so? Aurora fell into deep thought. After a moment, she looked out the window and said, It's been a while, but Madame Poilis hasn't come after us. The cycle hasn't started again. Perhaps she doesn't want to kill the foreigners. If an investigator sent by the officials were to be killed, it would cause even greater trouble, Lumion speculated. And she doesn't suspect me, so she doesn't suspect you either. The witness was dead, and no one else had seen him. Aurora nodded and said self-deprecatingly, I don't even feel like eating dinner. Suddenly, Lumion had an idea. What if we go to the castle? Is the perpetrator returning to the scene of the crime? Aurora laughed. Lumion nodded. I want to investigate the castle. Madame Poilis doesn't suspect me, so I can go unnoticed. Oh, and I haven't picked any tulips yet. I can ask for a few under the guise of making fragrances. Since Aurora and Madame Poilis appeared to be friends, there was no issue with Lumion's actions. Aurora thought for a moment before saying, We can try, but we can't be sure that Madame Poilis won't cause trouble. Yes, if you don't return in half an hour, I'll go to the edge of the village and trigger the cycle to start again. All right, Lumion agreed. As Lumion arrived at the administrator's castle once again, the sun had already set behind the mountain, painting the horizon with a red hue. Passing through the garden, Lumion reached the open main entrance and approached a male servant. Excuse me, my grand soeur Aurore is creating a fragrance. Could I please borrow some tulips from Madame Poilis? The male servant, dressed in a red shirt and white pants, responded without any hint of suspicion. I'll inquire with Madame. He quickly disappeared into the castle. Shortly after, he reappeared. Madame says you may go straight to the garden to pluck them. She really doesn't suspect me? Besides, it's as if nothing happened. Nevertheless, he refrained from entering the castle and headed towards the garden to search for the tulips. It was there that Lumion spotted the flowers and a lady's maid pruning a flowering tree in the shadows. As he casually sized her up, his gaze suddenly froze. The lady's maid was in her forties, with brown hair, brown eyes, and a pretty face devoid of wrinkles. 
She was none other than the midwife who had fought Valentine and the others and was eventually killed by Ryan. Yet here she stood, seemingly unscathed, her face shrouded in a shadow cast by the flowers and trees. Chapter 70 Spirit Channeling The instant he laid eyes on the midwife, Lumian's heart seemed to cease beating. She's still alive? I clearly saw her killed by Ryan, and her spirit was destroyed. Lumian remembered vividly how the midwife had eventually been reduced to tiny pieces of flesh, scattered on the ground. Some parts couldn't even be found. This must be a freaking ghost encounter. No, wait. There's the sound of breathing. Lumian thought of some scenes from his sister's novels, and his heart went from stillness to rapid beating. If it weren't for the midwife not looking at him, preoccupied with trimming the branches of the flowering tree, he would have reacted to the stress. Kcha, kcha. Tiny tree branches that grew haphazardly fell to the ground, snapping the stunned Lumian out of his daze. He subconsciously took a step forward, walking towards the place where the tulips bloomed. The midwife didn't stop him or even turn around. Lumian couldn't help but steal another glance at her. She was focused on pruning the branches. The shadows cast by the flowers and trees made her profile look dark and gloomy. Not daring to linger, Lumian plucked a few tulips and left the administrator's castle. His heart was still pounding even when he returned to the village. After calming himself down, Lumian walked towards Raymond Gregg's house. It was still too early for Aurora to trigger the cycle. It was also a two-story building, but compared to Lumian and Aurora's house, it was clearly older, more dilapidated, and narrower. The outer wall revealed the gray color of stone amidst the many green plants creeping over it. At that moment, the Greg's door was wide open, allowing one to see the stove on the left, the table on the right, and the wooden buckets behind. Lumian recalled that the wooden barrels were used for storage. There were two simple wooden beds in the space they isolated. They belonged to Raymond and his sister. Lumian didn't knock and walked straight into the Greg's house as usual. Raymond's elder and younger sisters were helping their mother prepare dinner. Raymond's father, Pierre Greg, was sitting on a chair at the wooden table, drinking cheap wine with a gloomy expression. I heard that Raymond is missing? Lumian asked Pierre Greg with a concerned look. Pierre Greg seemed to have aged significantly, and the few wrinkles on his face were even more pronounced. He looked up at Lumian and asked in confusion and surprise. You don't know? At this moment, Raymond's mother and two sisters stopped what they were doing and turned to look at Lumian. Lumian couldn't be any more honest. I've been busy with my own matters. I haven't seen Raymond for days. Pierre Gregg had already inquired and knew that Lumian was telling the truth. Otherwise, suspecting that this rascal had instigated Raymond to run away from home, he would have gone questioning him that afternoon. Two afternoons ago, they said it was the 29th. Raymond didn't return after he left. Pierre Gregg said with a gloomy expression. We've been looking for him. His two brothers are still out searching. Where do you think he'd have gone? Lumian hesitated before responding. He usually says that he doesn't want to learn shepherding, but he doesn't have much money on him. It's impossible for him to leave on his own. Let me see if he left anything behind. As he spoke, he walked naturally to the wooden barrels at the back of the first floor and passed through them to reach Raymond's bed. The bed was very simple, as if pieced together with a few planks of wood. However, the grayish-blue bedsheets, the pillow stuffed with straw, and the quilts with traces of mending were all clean. It was evident that they were often washed. This was because Aurora loved cleanliness and didn't allow lice to appear at home or on her body. Even Lumian had developed this habit. Therefore, when he interacted with his playmates, he would consciously urge them to maintain personal hygiene. He didn't allow those fellows to be dirty and live with lice and fleas all day. If Raymond and the others slacked off at some point and were discovered by him to have lice, they would definitely be pranked. They might even be pushed into the river and made to wash up even if they refused to. After a few years of oppression, Raymond habitually helped clean up the environment when he returned home. We didn't find any message, Pierre Gregg said with a worried expression as he followed him to the bed. Lumian sat by Raymond's bed and reached under the pillow. He found two items. 
a cracked dark red fountain pen, and an exercise book filled with handwriting. Raymond was hungry for knowledge, but had little chance to receive an education. In Emperor Rozelle's time, villages like Cordu had mandatory township schools, housed in the same building as the administrator's office. The building also contained an army recruitment center, a recruit physical examination committee, and other institutions. But ultimately, there were only a few staff members. In recent decades, many villages had lost their schools. The church provided Sunday school for larger populations, but Cordu had to rely on educated elders to teach the children sporadically. Over time, some young people became illiterate again. When Lumion was in a good mood, he would claim he needed money for drinks, so he sold his old fountain pens and workbooks to Raymond, Ava, and others at a low price, teaching them some words in the process. Raymond took every lesson as seriously as he did combat training and helping shepherds make cheese in the mountains to earn money. He was determined to change his fate. Lumen removed the fountain pen and exercise book, staring at them for a long time. I asked the padre. He said these are just simple words that don't form a sentence. Pierre Gregg sighed. Lumian flipped through the exercise book, noting how the handwriting had improved from messy and ugly to something acceptable. True, there's no message. He agreed with Pierre Gregg before adding, but I wonder if it's a code that can be deciphered into a sentence. You've heard a similar story, right? Aurore told it to many village children. Did they mention it at home? This included Raymond's younger brother and sister. Yes, they did, Pierre Gregg nodded. Cordu villagers would often gather in the kitchen at night for conversation, laughter, and storytelling when they couldn't afford the tavern. First-time guests had to follow into social norms and bring a bottle of wine, even a cheap one. Pierre Gregg had heard a similar story from his youngest son during such a gathering. Lumion held up the exercise book confidently. I'll take it back to Aurore for her to examine and see if she can find anything. All right, Pierre Gregg didn't think it was anything valuable. After leaving the area surrounded by wooden barrels, Lumion walked toward the door and Pierre Gregg sat down again. A few steps later, Lumion heard Pierre Gregg sigh and mutter. If he didn't want to learn shepherding, he could have told me. Why did he just leave? Our family will soon be wealthy. He won't need to learn shepherding anymore. Wealthy? Lumian's heart raced as he turned around, feigning curiosity. What's this chance for wealth? Pierre Gregg didn't look up, keeping his head lowered as he said despondently. Our family's horoscope is about to change. Our luck will improve. What? Lumian felt a chill down his spine. Who told you this? He asked. Pierre Gregg didn't answer, continuing to lament. Upon returning home, Lumian immediately informed his sister that the midwife was still alive. Aurora frowned her blonde brows. She's not necessarily a living person. Huh? Lumian was taken aback. Aurora pondered and said, Didn't we discuss this before? Madame Poilice's pathway might have the power to control the undead. That might be a zombie. Impossible. Lumian said. I saw her without activating my spirit vision. Besides, there were no signs of stitching on her body. Back then, she was diced into many small pieces by Ryan. Lumian recalled and said, Also, I heard her breathing. At this point, Lumian paused. However, she was indeed a little sluggish. Her expression was gloomy, and her eyes weren't lively enough. She looked almost exactly like Naroka. The one I saw on the night of the previous previous loop when Naroka took the initiative to enter Paramita. Naroka, whose face was pale and eyes were blank. Of course, the midwife obviously resembled a living person more. Aurora nodded and said, A special state that's closer to the undead? Unable to deduce an answer, she gestured for Lumian to say something else. Lumian recounted everything that had happened in Raymond's father's words in detail as if nothing had happened in the castle. Aurore listened quietly and nodded. Madame Poilice doesn't seem to want to pursue the matter of the castle. I wonder what she's holding back. Also, your discovery proves that a portion of the abnormality in the village is related to her. 
but she doesn't seem to be involved in the cycle. What she meant was that Madame Poilice's involvement in the abnormality was mainly the fertility, death, soul, and parameter. Nothing to do with the time loop. I think so too. Lumion had such an inkling during his explorations. It seems that the person behind the Padre and company is most likely not Madame Poilice. Referring to Raymond's father's words, he guessed, The one who spread the news that doing something can affect the horoscope and obtain good luck? Aurore acknowledged tersely. We'll investigate tomorrow, and see if we can channel Raymond's spirit tonight. After dinner, Aurore saw that it was about time and began to set up the altar. She was praying to herself, so she only placed a single candle, but the candle was replaced by another one made of slumber flowers and other materials. Aurore sanctified a silver dagger and created a wall of spirituality. Then, she dripped the extract made of night vanilla and moonflowers onto the orange flames, stirring up a misty fog. Seeing that the preparations were complete, Aurore glanced at the workbook on the altar and took a step back. She said in ancient Hermes, I. As she uttered the word, her eyes darkened, as if an invisible wind was swirling around her. I summon in my name. This was the second sentence she said, and she changed it to Hermes. As she didn't know where Raymond's spirit was, she couldn't directly communicate with it. She could only try summoning it. As a wild beyonder, she didn't dare pray to the Evernight goddess, who was in charge of this domain. She could only rely on herself. The chances of success weren't high, unless Raymond's spirit was indeed somewhere in Cordu and was very close. Aurora continued to recite, The spirit lingering in Cordu village, the man named Raymond Gregg, the owner of this exercise book. The orange candle flames suddenly swayed, absorbing the surrounding fog and becoming slightly larger. Its light rippled and was dyed with a deep blue color. Beads of sweat appeared on Aurora's forehead as she began to borrow strength from various materials. Amidst the howling wind, a figure appeared above the blue flames. Having already activated his spirit vision, Lumion saw a translucent figure. He had brown hair and eyes, looking rather ordinary. It was Raymond Gregg. He was indeed still in the village. Raymond's body was bloated, his face pale, and blood-colored tears were dripping from the corners of his eyes. What? Aurora was clearly stunned. After the cycle was restarted, Raymond had only gone missing and hadn't drowned. How did his spirit end up like this? That's right. If he hadn't drowned, how could he have become a spirit? They were self-contradictory. Amidst her confusion, Aurora asked, Raymond Gregg, why did you disappear? Raymond's expression suddenly turned ferocious as he shouted sharply, They drowned me! Chapter 71 Underground they? Lumion couldn't hide his surprise at Raymond's response. He had assumed that Raymond had drowned in the river of his own accord, becoming a sacrifice to some unknown entity. But now, it seemed there were others involved. It wasn't just an unseen force that had pulled Raymond into the depths. Who are they? Aurora demanded. Raymond's face contorted with pain and fury. His eyes burned with hatred. He spat the words. Pawns Bennett. Pons Bennett and his men, they held me down in the water. After Ava and the others had left the riverbank, Pons Bennett and his thugs appeared where Raymond had washed ashore. They forced him back into the water, drowning him and turning him to a sacrifice. Lumion pieced together this scenario from Raymond's words. The entire Lent celebration had been twisted into a dark sacrificial ritual. Aurora pressed for more information, but Raymond only repeated the same few phrases as if they were all that remained of his memory. Damn, we missed the best time for spirit channeling. All we have left is this lingering obsession. Aurora thought for a moment, formulating a question that Raymond might or might not recall. Did they sacrifice you to a specific being? What's so special about him? Where is he? This time, Aurora was more cautious. She didn't ask for the full name, only seeking indirect information to aid her judgment. She believed that if Raymond's spirit had sensed anything during the sacrifice, it would have left a strong impression. 
Otherwise, it wouldn't. Raymond hesitated, tears welling up in his ghostly eyes, turning the corners red. Lumion's expression darkened. Unconsciously, he began clenching his fists. Suddenly, Raymond cried out, Underground! Beneath the cathedral! What? Aurori could hardly believe her ears. Based on her question, Raymond was implying that the secret entity he had been sacrificed to resided beneath the cathedral. That's impossible. It's the fifth epoch. How can a god walk the land? Aurori composed herself, considering that Raymond's spirit retained only a fragment of his obsession and some spirituality. His answers were disjointed and fixated on certain points. In other words, his testimony might not actually confirm the being's location beneath the cathedral. It could simply be a reaction to her prompting. But regardless of whether Raymond's answer was true or a reflection of his obsession, something was amiss beneath the cathedral. It held the key to the sacrificial ritual. Aurora could only hope that the secrets hidden there wouldn't prove too horrifying or outlandish. She tried asking about other matters, but Raymond's spirit could only repeat phrases like they drown me, Pons Bennett, and beneath the cathedral. Seeing no further gains, Aurora ended the spirit channeling and watched as Raymond's form vanished above the candle flame. The blue hue that had stained the altar swiftly receded. After dispelling the wall of spirituality, she noticed Lumion lost in thought, silent. What, what are you thinking about? Aurora waved her hand in front of her brother's eyes. The corners of Lumion's mouth curled up as he forced a smile. I regret not hitting Pons Bennett harder yesterday. He had need Pons Bennett, causing him considerable pain. But he had held back, not wanting to escalate the conflict with the Padre and his allies before the twelfth night. He had rationally restrained himself, not crippling Pons Bennett outright. There'll be a chance. Aurora reassured him. Lumion nodded and chuckled. Actually, we've been overlooking something. Before Lent, we're not the only ones afraid of escalating the conflict. The Padre and his goons are too. They're not ready, and they haven't started the ritual. In other words, if Lumion had truly wanted Pons Bennett to suffer irreversible harm, the Padre would likely only feign retribution and avoid any real action. They would bide their time until Lent regardless of whether Lumion had offended them or not. Once the Lent celebration began, everyone in the village would be in their sights. Aurora understood Lumion's point and nodded slightly. You can decide how to exact revenge on Pons Bennett. What we need to focus on now is how we can survive until the twelfth night after the Padre and his cronies gain immense power during Lent. Lumion immediately sank into deep contemplation. Aurora shared her thoughts. We have two options. We either join forces with the three foreigners, or we find a way to strengthen ourselves. She hesitated for a moment before continuing. If we can confirm that Madame Poilis has no connection to the loop and is trapped here like us, we might even cooperate with her. Huh? Lumine was taken aback. Madame Poilis was a terrifying and malevolent beyonder. Aurora sighed and said, a philosopher from my homeland once said that balance is needed between principal and secondary contradictions. We must unite all possible forces. Yes, there's definitely something off about the cathedrals underground. It might hold crucial clues. We have to investigate it before Lent, as we may not get another opportunity. From Aurora's knowledge, most of the cathedrals in this world had underground chambers. Some stored sealed artifacts, while others served as burial sites for important figures. Although Cordu's Cathedral didn't contain sealed artifacts or notable people to be buried, it still featured a large basement when constructed. All right, Lumion agreed. I'll talk to the three foreigners tomorrow. He then brought up Raymond's condition. Why can he only say those few words? Was the spirit not summoned properly? Aurora sighed again. There is a critical period for mediumship, within an hour of death. After an hour, the spirit of the deceased rapidly dissipates, losing their original memories. All that remains are some thoughts, emotions, and images they can't let go. In the technical terms of our homeland, it's called obsession. 
Lumia nodded slightly. When the next cycle starts, we'll summon Raymond from the beginning. Does that count as an hour of death? But wait, why does Raymond remember the last, last cycle? Only then did he recognize the issue. After the cycle reset, shouldn't Raymond forget about the drowning? Aurori was stumped. Combining her thoughts from the ritual, she pondered and said, I believe it counts. It's not Lent yet. According to the timeline, Raymond hasn't drowned, so he shouldn't know the murderer's identity. However, because he lost his body, he can only exist as a spirit. It's similar to death. There will be lingering obsessions. Thus, the person we summoned just now remembers certain events from the previous, previous cycle. In simpler terms, Raymond's state has become unique due to his body's loss. He retains a certain amount of memories when the cycle resets. Heh, <laughs> it's like a glitch. The loop created a tiny error because Raymond's body was sacrificed? Lumion roughly understood his sister's explanation. Aurora chuckled and added, It seems that the power allowing us to loop is very mechanical and rigid. It probably isn't under the original owner's control and operates autonomously. Otherwise, it could easily target Raymond's spirit. At this point, she appeared to relax somewhat. <laughs> In that case, we still have a chance to break the cycle. Influenced by his sister's emotions, Lumion's somber mood lifted slightly. After all their efforts, they finally saw a glimmer of hope. The two of them cleaned up the altar and moved to the second floor study. Aurore taught Lumion Hermes and ancient Hermes, word by word, based on the disordered and incorrect ritual he had written. Lumion had already learned some words, so his progress was promising. Under the bright electric lamp, Aurore explained the pronunciation and structure of the words to her brother. While he revised, she used musk, cloves, blood, and other materials to create candles. As Lumion studied intently, he occasionally glanced at his sister working beside him, feeling as if he had returned to their warm life, free from loops or malevolent gods. Outside the window, the night was tranquil. Lumion woke up to find himself in his misty room. As he got out of bed, he walked over to the table and grabbed a pen and paper. He then wrote down the ancient Hermes and Hermes words, but in the wrong order. He then corrected them by labeling each with a number. After finishing, Lumion let out a sigh of relief and looked over to the table. There were four items there. The two grayish-white musk candles made by Aurore, one with Lumion's blood and the other without. The bottle of gray amber perfume, the metal bottle containing tulip powder, and the silver dagger provided by Aurore. That lady really sent them in. Lumion's heart calmed down when he saw the items. Lumion grabbed the items and looked for Aurore's homemade incense. When he found it, he went downstairs and placed everything on the dining table. Then, he went to the kitchen to grab a glass of water and a pile of coarse salt. The materials for the ritual were now prepared. Before falling asleep, Aurore was worried that Lumion didn't have the corresponding symbol to pray for the boon. This would prevent him from burning the items on the replica goatskin to inform the target deity of his desires. However, since the mysterious lady didn't mention it, there was probably no need for it. After all, it was essentially praying to the power in Lumion's body. It could hear all the prayers without any additional paperwork. Lumion took a deep breath and slowly exhaled as he looked at the items on the dining table. Without wasting a moment, Lumion placed one of the grayish-white musk candles, the one with his own blood, at the top of the altar, representing the deity. He placed the other candle in front of him. Following the order of God before man, Lumion lit the candle by sparking his spirituality. He wasn't an expert at sanctifying the ritual silver dagger or creating a wall of spirituality. As Lumion's spirituality flowed out from the tip of the silver dagger and connected with the air around him, he felt a mystical sensation that he couldn't explain. Soon, the wall of spirituality was complete and Lumion's own spirituality was significantly depleted. He cleared his mind using Aurore's homemade incense and cogitation, allowing him to enter a state where he could perform the ritualistic magic. With a sizzling sound, 
Lumion dripped the gray amber perfume and tulip powder onto the candle that represented the deity. A strange fragrance filled the air, and Lumion felt a magical energy pulsing around him. Lumion took a step back, glancing at the small notebook beside the altar. He looked at the burning candle and shouted in ancient Hermes, Power of Inevitability! Chapter 72 Sacrificial Dance Power of Inevitability As Lumion uttered the words in ancient Hermes, the light above the altar dimmed ominously. The orange candle flame flickered wildly, as if buffeted by an unseen wind, compressing to the size of a peppercorn. Simultaneously, heat bloomed in his chest and his head spun. His ears buzzed as if once again on the verge of hearing that terrifying voice emanating from an infinite distance, yet remaining unnervingly close. Lumion steadied himself and had a sudden realization. The corruption within him had been sealed by the master of the bluish-black symbol. Even if he delved into deep cogitation, he could only summon the thorn symbol and release a meager aura. He couldn't harness its true power. Could this ritual bypass the seal and absorb the boon? Only if the owner of the bluish-black symbol, that great existence, had tacitly granted permission. Remembering the enigmatic lady's self-assured demeanor, Lumion felt a surge of confidence. He even suspected that the ritual itself contained a component for seeking the Great Presence's approval. As for which part, his knowledge of mysticism was too limited to speculate. In the throes of the ritual, Lumion dared not delay. With a focused mind, he began reciting the subsequent incantations in ancient Hermes. You are the past, the present, and the future. You are the cause, the effect, and the process. These words resonated within the sealed altar. The floor and artifacts seemed to writhe, as if innumerable bizarre entities were about to burst forth and invade the dream ruins. Ooh. A black wind materialized out of nowhere, encircling Lumion. The candle flame, previously shrunk to a peppercorn size, swelled, suffused with a silvery hue and a touch of black. Lumion heard the voice that had always pushed him to the brink of death once more, but at some point, a faint gray fog had emerged from the altar, coalescing around him. The sensation left him suspended between deep cogitation and witnessing the noodle man's dance. He wasn't on the edge of death, but he wasn't comfortable either. It felt like severe tinnitus, dizzy, nauseous, and agitated to a degree, his mind a swirling mess. Before maintaining control, Lumion continued the ritual. I implore you. I beseech your benediction. I plead with you to grant me the power of dancer. Tulip, an herb that belongs to inevitability. Please pass your powers to my incantation. Gray Amber, an herb that belongs to inevitability. Please pass your powers to my incantation. As the ritual progressed, Lumion's tinnitus and dizziness intensified. It felt as if countless maggots writhed beneath his skin. Finally, he completed the incantation. Almost instantaneously, the silver-black candle flame condensed, transforming into a pillar of light that illuminated his left pectoral. Silver-black phantom liquid poured forth, swiftly enveloping Lumion, rendering him sinister and fearsome. It felt as if his skin was pierced by a thousand needles, his muscles and ligaments torn asunder. The mysterious voice became deafening, reverberating within his mind. Lumion was consumed by excruciating pain, his mind teetering on the edge of madness, his blood vessels seared as if incinerated from within. This torment far exceeded the near-death state induced by deep cogitation. All he could do was clench his teeth and endure, desperately clinging to his fraying sanity. As for everything else... It didn't matter. Amid the tempestuous onslaught, he was adrift. Time became an enigma. At last, the agonizing pain abated. Lumion felt as if he had been unburdened or had emerged from drowning, a sudden sense of relief washing over him. He swiftly collected his thoughts and looked up. The candle flame had returned to its original size, but retained its silver and black hues. 
Regaining his senses, Lumian took two hasty steps forward and snuffed out the candle representing him to avert any mishaps. Next was the candle symbolizing the deity. He meticulously followed the procedure, completing the ritual step by step. As he dissolved the wall of spirituality, he felt mentally drained and his body sore, as if he had battled a formidable beast. Before long, the dining table was cleared. Lumion began to assess his condition and discovered a wealth of knowledge had materialized in his mind. There were three primary parts to this. First, it involved harnessing the power of dance, rhythm, and spirituality to tap into the forces of nature and communicate with unknown entities. This was the essence of being a dancer. With this knowledge, Lumion could not only beseech inevitability, but also craft new sacrificial dances tailored to various situations in order to appease other beings. The second and third parts were applications of the first. What Lumion desired most was the enigmatic dance performed by Noodle Man. The knowledge was directly implanted into his mind, enabling him to comprehend it instantly. All that remained was to practice. With this arcane sacrificial dance, Lumion could activate the Blackthorn symbol on his chest while exploring the Dream Ruins, suppressing or weakening the formidable monsters therein. The third segment involved another bizarre dance. It didn't resemble a traditional sacrificial rite, but rather a blend of sacrifice and summoning. By executing this dance, Lumion could attract nearby objects, and at the cost of his own blood, bond one of them to himself thereby gaining access to one of its abilities or traits. Of course, Lumion would first need to endure such possession. Some attachments could inflict significant adverse effects on humans, while others might prove reluctant to depart, creating complications. Lumion felt it was crucial to understand the summoned entities fully. It would be far too hazardous to experiment without anticipating potential issues. The value of mystical knowledge was apparent in such a situation. Lumion desperately required resources like mysterious creatures illustrated, or spirit world creatures illustrated, but even a warlock, renowned for their extensive knowledge, could not possess such information. Moments later, Lumion stretched and discovered that his flexibility had indeed improved dramatically. Although not quite on par with Noodle Man, a mutated monster with reassembled organs. He now surpassed nearly all ordinary humans, enabling him to execute the enigmatic sacrificial dance. Lumion effortlessly kicked backward, touching the back of his head and nodded contently, murmuring, That's right. I can perform many actions that were once impossible. My hunter combat skills have also greatly improved. Lumion practiced the mysterious dance to familiarize his body with the corresponding movements, aiming to reduce the time needed to complete the routine. Sometimes his movements were forceful and resonant, as if in combat, while other times they were gentle and unhurried, as if conveying a message, yet always rhythmic. As Lumion danced, his spiritual energy radiated outward, merging with the ambient natural forces. Gradually, his thoughts concentrated, his mind quieted, and he entered a transcendent mystical state. This allowed him to perceive various subtle phenomena surrounding him, as if his spirit vision had been activated. Simultaneously, he seemed to connect with the unseen power within him. His chest warmed once more, and a faint horrifying voice echoed, but without consequence. <sighs> Lumion ceased dancing unfastened his clothing and inspected his chest. The blackthorn symbol re-emerged, accompanied by the bluish-black one. Lumion's thoughts briefly scattered but quickly returned to normal. He had achieved the desired effect perfectly. He then calculated the precise duration from the emergence of the blackthorn symbol to its disappearance. It lasted approximately one minute. Lumion fastened his clothes and prepared to try the other bizarre dance. It was crazy and warped, and he couldn't describe it properly. As he danced, his spirituality spread out again, blending with the natural forces surrounding him. In the last third of the dance, he sensed something strange approaching. Three figures appeared on the first floor window, 
but they were blurry and transparent. Lumion recognized them as the skinless monster, the shotgun monster, and the mouth orifice monster with the black mark. He muttered in amusement. Is this a victim's complaints meeting? Lumion could make out. Lumion could make one of the monsters attached to him and borrow their abilities by taking out a ritual silver dagger and making a cut on his body to release some blood. He craved the mouth orifice monster's invisibility, but resisted the urge, lest something happen via allowing a monster he murdered to possess him, and finished the dance. As Lumion danced the last few moves, he heard weak and soft voices. It sounded like many people were communicating, but it was unclear where the voices came from. Lumion analyzed it and realized the voices seemed to come from his body, from the corruption that had been sealed. After the last move, Lumion stood there and muttered to himself, What did I hear? Lumion was only semi-literate in the field of mysticism and couldn't identify the source of the soft sounds he heard. He had no choice but to give up, as it wasn't more terrifying than the corruption itself. After the sound subsided, and him finishing the two mysterious dances, Lumion confirmed that the dancer had enhanced his spirituality. Although he knew he was most likely inferior to Sequence Nines who excelled in spirituality, he had escaped the shackles of being a hunter. He felt he was above average. My shortcomings have been compensated for. Lumion was very happy about this. Lumion didn't dwell on what would happen to his body after enduring the dancer's power and the corresponding corruption. He couldn't stop it, so he decided not to think about it. He rubbed his tired head and made up his mind to rest for the night, returning to the real world to wait for the owl.